Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. You may have noticed as we've been developing our JavaScript programs and doing things like installing NPM packages into our projects or doing things like running servers using the node daemon package, you may have noticed that the console output of many of these operations isn't just plain black and white, but rather it has colors added to the things that are logged out to the console. All right, so, you know, if there's a success message, it's usually going to be written in green, let's say, or if there's an error message, it's usually going to be printed out in red. So the ability to print out things to the console with different colors is a really important skill when you're developing command line utilities with Node.js, and it can really help add that professional edge to the programs you create uh, if you're planning on other developers or end users using those. So what we're going to be taking a look at here today is how colors work in the console, right, just in general, independent of Node.js or JavaScript or anything like that. And then we're going to be seeing how to create some nice command line utilities for ourselves that will actually print things out in color. So without further ado, let's jump right in and start adding colors to the things we log out. All right, so the first thing that you're probably wondering here is how do we actually communicate to the console in the first place that we want to add color? Well, if you're like me, then your first guess was probably something along these lines. My first guess was that there would be some kind of method on nodes console object here where we could call something like console.setColor and, you know, we would be able to set the color to maybe some kind of hex color or something like that. Well, as it happens, that's absolutely not the case. What we need to do instead when we want to add color to a piece of text that we're printing out to the console is we use some special escape sequences. So you may recall that escape sequences are basically just series of characters in strings that start with the backslash character, right? So for instance, backslash n gives us a new line, right? And it tells, uh, basically tells the console that we want the next thing in the text to start on the next line in the console, right? And we also saw that escape sequences could be used to add double quotes into a double quote string, right? So if you have double quotes for the string and you want to have a double quotation mark actually part of that string, then the way that you need to do that, as we've seen elsewhere, is by adding a backslash before your quotation mark uh, so that JavaScript doesn't interpret this thing as, uh, you know, the ending of the string. So anyway, in order to add color to strings in JavaScript, there's, there's a very specific sequence that we have to follow. And once you get familiar with the sequence, it's not going to seem so strange. But admittedly, when you first see it, it's probably going to uh, be a little bit unnerving for you. So first of all, the specific escape character that we're going to use when we want to add color to a given piece of text is going to be backslash x1b, okay? So this is the escape sequence here that's going to alert the console that we want to add some kind of styling to the text that comes after it. Now, this isn't all we need in order to make that happen. As a matter of fact, this escape sequence is going to be part of a somewhat larger uh, escape phrase, so to speak, where we'll actually be able to specify what color we want to add to a given piece of text. Now, before I tell you what that full sequence of characters is, in order to add color to a piece of text. What we really need to do first is discuss some of the different color schemes that your terminal will support. Now, one thing that I just want to caution you of is that depending on the terminal that you're using, right? So I'm using the IDE's built-in terminal in Visual Studio Code on a Mac. If you're using some other kind of operating system or some other kind of terminal, then the results might vary, right? Terminals vary quite a bit in terms of how they actually go about displaying the colors and styles that we tell them to display. All right, so with that warning out of the way, um, you know, just something to keep in mind, let's move on. So the way that terminal colors work, there are actually several different color schemes that we can choose from. Now, first of all, we have a two-bit color scheme and that's what the terminal already displays, right? It's basically just black and white and gray and, and, you know, there's really only two bits worth of colors to choose from. So that's what the terminal is already going to be displaying. Now, the next step up from this is going to be 
4-bit colors. Now, 4-bit colors, the way that these work is basically you're going to have a choice of eight basic colors for the foreground, right? That is the actual text here. So if you're just uh, displaying the character A, let's say, that's the foreground. And then you have the background as well, which is the color that gets displayed behind your letters, right? So we can actually control both of those by specifying different sort of arguments to our escape sequence, as we'll see. All right, so with 4-bit colors, the way that it works is this. As I said, you have a choice of eight basic colors for the foreground, and those are going to be represented by the numbers 30 through 37. All right, and there's not really too much logic behind this. Basically, uh, you just have one color assigned to each number, sort of arbitrarily, I suppose. So 30, for example, is black. Right, so that's going to set the foreground color to black. Now, 31 is going to be red and you know that's just kind of how it works right so usually when i'm really interested in creating some kind of colorful console display i'll just have a chart up next to me with all of these colors on it so that i don't have to really remember it uh 32 is going to be green and let's see moving on 33 is going to be yellow i'll just write y 34 is going to be blue which I'll write out all the way since it's only four letters. 35 is going to be magenta. All right. Uh, and then we have, let's see, what else? 36 is going to be cyan. I believe that's how you say that word. I actually, that's not a word that I normally use in everyday conversation. And 37 is going to be white. Okay. So those are the eight colors that you have to choose from when you're working with a 4-bit color scheme, and 4-bit colors are usually the most reliable, right? Like if you don't know where your console program is going to be printing to, right? If it's something that's used by a lot of people in a lot of different terminals, you'll probably want to stick to 4-bit coloring and stick to using these main colors, right? You'll just have to pick from these things for uh, whatever purpose you're trying to do. Now, the reason that I took the time to write all of these out uh, is because 30 through 37 is the foreground colors, so I'll just write foreground at the top. But basically the same order and scheme applies to the background as well, all right? So here's a handy formula for you. In order to figure out the corresponding background color for black, red, green, etc., all you need to do is take the number for the foreground and add 10 to it. Okay, so uh, for the background colors, these same colors are going to be, as soon as I finish writing background there, the same colors are going to be, uh, for black, we're going to have 40. For red, we're going to have 41. For green, we're going to have 42. For yellow, we're going to have 43. Blues, 44. And then 45 for magenta, 46 for cyan, and 47 for white. Okay, so as you can see, really all you need to worry about for remembering all of these colors is the you know the last digit here and then you just need to know that three is for foreground four is for background okay so those are the main colors that you're going to be working with uh 30 through 37 and 40 through 47 for the foreground and the background respectively but with four bit colors there's also actually a bright version of all of these colors all right so you know there's a bright red color bright green color bright yellow color there's even a bright black color which is just gray and there's also a bright white color and if you're wondering how that works uh white right the regular white color that you get with these numbers is actually more of a light gray so bright white is actually white white all right now the way that you get the bright colors is you're going to use the same final number here so zero for black one for red two for green etc but the difference is going to be that for the bright foreground colors, you're, you're going to use 9 as the starting digit, right? So uh, for the bright foreground colors, this would be 90 for bright black, which again is just kind of a sort of medium gray color. 91 would be bright red, 92 would be bright green, 93 would be bright yellow, and so on and so forth, right? You get the idea. All right, now for the bright background colors, it's going to go from 100 to 107. So you'd have 100 for the bright black background, which, again, just medium gray. Uh, you'd have 101 for the bright red background, 102 for the bright green background, and you get the idea. Okay, 
So that's the basics of 4-bit colors. So now that we know that, now that we're familiar with how these colors work uh, just in the console, we can actually start to display these and take a look at the escape sequence for adding color to pieces of text. All right, so the first thing that I'm gonna do here is show you the full escape sequence that you'll need to know in order to add color to a piece of text. All right, so um, just for starters, let's add a line here that says console.log and inside here, we'll just have a message that says, hello, colors. All right, so this is obviously just gonna be a plain string. If we run this code right now, if we say node index.js, we'll see that that just prints out your basic white color. So adding color to this string here, assuming that we wanna add color to the entire string is gonna look like this. First of all, we're gonna surround the entire string with that backslash x1b thing that I showed you before, right? And depending on your syntax highlighting settings, you might even see that your IDE highlights that as a slightly different color from the rest of the string, which is nice. And after that, what we're gonna do is add an opening square bracket and here's where the color code that we wanna to add to the string goes. All right, so let's say that we wanna make this bright red. Well, you may or may not remember this, I don't expect you to, but the number for that is going to be 91 if we want that to be the foreground. So what we would do is we would say 91 after that opening square bracket. And then after that, right, after we've completed the color code, we need to put the letter M. All right, now it's important not to forget this letter M. A lot of people think it's a typo, but it's actually not. You need that because basically what this does is it tells the console that you're done specifying color codes, right? You can actually specify multiple color codes, which is something that I'll show you how to do in just a minute here. So now that we've done that, let's save our code and try running it. And what we'll see is that our code is now in the so-called bright red color. To me, it doesn't look that bright, but apparently that's bright red. All right, so if you want, what you can try doing is changing this color code, right? Let's see what it would look like if it was a bright uh, green background, which would be 102. Let's save that and hit enter and run it. And sure enough, that is definitely a bright green background. And what else can we do? Let's take a look and see what the bright white background would look like if we were to do 108. Okay, let's save that and run our code again. And it doesn't look like that added anything. Oh, that's because it's 107. Duh, uh, sorry, I got mixed up. I did an inadvertent off by one error there. So let's try this again and run it. And sure enough, that is the bright white background. And as we can see, the terminal in some cases automatically adjusts the color of the foreground to match the background so that we can actually read it, right? It's, right, it's gonna try and pick uh, a fairly readable color for the foreground for us, whether that's a gray color or a white color or whatever. All right, so feel free to play around with that a little bit. But one thing that I wanna show you first is a little problem that comes up when you start adding colors to different pieces of text. Let's say that we want to log out another message down here and say something like another message, all right? Something like that. Well, what we're gonna see if we run our code is that not only is this hello colors string gonna be colorized, but our another message string is also going to have that same background. So in other words, when you use this uh, escape sequence along with a color and M to add color to the terminal, the terminal isn't going to stop applying that color until we tell it to, all right? So in other words, we need to tell the terminal to stop at the end of this string if we don't want all of the rest of the things that we print out to have the same color. Now, in order to do that, there's a special escape sequence as well. It's going to start off with the same slash x1b thing here as we used to apply the initial color. All right, so you can see that this is the escape sequence for basically formatting terminal output. So let's say x1b, and in order to reset to the terminal default, what we're gonna do is put an opening square bracket and zero M, all right, so as you can see, we're using basically the same sequence here that we used at the beginning, but what this zero number does is it tells the terminal that we want to reset it back to whatever the default is, all right? So by putting this at the end of our colorized string, everything after this that we print to the console is going to be the default color. So let's try this again. We're gonna run it, and sure enough, we'll see that hello colors has that background and another message does not, right? It's just printed out using the default color scheme. 
All right, now another thing that I wanna show you here is how we can go about adding multiple colors to our text, right? So when I say multiple colors, I'm referring to just using a foreground color and a background color at the same time. Well, in order to do that, all you need to do is add two numbers after the square bracket, and you're going to separate those using a semicolon. So let's say that we want red text, so that would be 31, on a green background, which would be 42. And then the M, as we saw, uh, will tell the terminal that that's the end. So, you know, this is gonna be the start of the actual text that we want to print after that M. And that should do it. So let's try running this. And what we're gonna see is that sure enough, it's going to be red text on a green background. It's actually quite ugly, but you know, it works. And we can now add both a foreground color and a background color to our text. So anyway, just to review here, the basic syntax for adding colors, and I'm just gonna zoom in once or twice here so that we can see this. The basic syntax for adding colors to a string is gonna to be to start off with this backslash x1b prefix. All right, we'll just call this the, I don't know, format prefix or something like that. Um, and then after that, of course, we're going to have the opening square bracket. And notice that there's no closing square bracket. That's just a little syntax oddity there. And this is gonna be followed by the colors here separated by uh, semicolons, right? So you can combine foreground colors and background colors. And as we'll see later on, there's also some other formatting things that you can do. Additionally, it is possible, uh, and we're gonna see how to do this later on as well, to specify RGB colors for our strings. And it's going to follow a very similar syntax as you'll see. So anyway, this is just a bunch of numbers separated by semicolons. That's all you really need to know for now. And it's followed by this M, all right? So do not forget this M because it's very important and it just won't really work without it, okay? Now, after that M, you can write whatever kind of string you want, and whatever color and formatting uh, specifications you had before that will be applied to that string. Now, at this point, you're pretty much done, but if you don't want that formatting to apply to the rest of the things that you log out to the console, which will almost always be the case, then what you're gonna to wanna to do is add this other thing after that, right? This is the specific escape sequence, which follows the same format, by the way, right? We have the format prefix, we have the opening square bracket, we have the zero, which is the number, and then we have M, and this just tells the terminal to reset back to the default colors. All right, so almost always, this is gonna be the sequence that you'll use whenever you want to uh, add color to a string and print it to the console. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen the syntax for displaying 4-bit colors and applying those to strings that we're logging out to the console, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at is the syntax for 8-bit and RGB colors. All right, so 8-bit colors are obviously gonna give us quite a few more options than we had with basic 4-bit colors, and they're really gonna have a very similar syntax to what we saw up here, right? So we're gonna have the same backslash x1b, we're gonna have the same uh, opening square bracket, we're, we're gonna have numbers separated by semicolons, and then we're gonna have this same m here and string and this uh, sequence that tells the terminal to stop applying that color. Now the main difference here is going to be in the exact numbers that we use. Okay, so the way that this works is when we want to use 8-bit colors in our string, right? When we want to apply an 8-bit color to our string instead of, you know, a 4-bit color, which as we saw for 4-bit colors, we can just use the numbers directly. What we're gonna have to do is write a specific sequence of numbers here before we write the actual 8-bit color number that we wanna display. So that sounds a little bit confusing. Let me just show you what that looks like. Now, first of all, in order to display an 8-bit color, the two numbers that we're gonna have to display first are gonna be 38 and five. Now, I personally have no idea why they chose those exact numbers for this. I'm sure that there is a reason, but that just never came up in my research. But uh, after this, we're gonna put another semicolon, and here's where we'll actually specify the number of the 8-bit color that we wanna display. All right, so uh, let's say that we want to display, I don't know, sort of a 
sky blue kind of color. And I'm just looking at a chart here on my other monitor, so this might end up being a slightly different color. But let's say that we want to display color number 39, whatever that ends up looking like. Well, all we would have to do in this case is say 38 semicolon 5, semicolon, and 39. Here is the actual 8-bit number that we want to select. So essentially, in this case, what the 38 and 5 are doing is telling the console that we want to apply an 8-bit foreground color. This 3 here indicates that it's a foreground color. So you might be able to guess what the background color equivalent of this would be. It would be 48 semicolon 5. Okay, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. But this is just telling the terminal that we want to display it. 8-bit color and that it's going to come after, right? This is the actual color code that we're displaying. All right, so let's run this now and see what it looks like. We should get another color that wasn't available to us before when we were just uh, using the 4-bit colors. So let's run it. And oops, I didn't actually save this, so let's try that again. And sure enough, there we go. We get this nice sort of light blue color uh, applied to the foreground of our text. Okay, so the background, as I said already, is just going to be the same kind of sequence, but with 48.5 instead of 38.5. So if we leave the number the same and run this again, we'll see that that applies that same color to the background here, and the foreground is just automatically set to white in this case. Okay, so the good news here, as you've probably seen, is that uh, applying 8-bit colors is almost as easy as applying 4-bit colors. We really just need this prefix before it, right? 38.5 or 48.5. But you might be wondering, how do we go about applying both a foreground and background 8-bit color? Well, in order to do that, all you need to do, it's just going to be a lot of numbers. You're going to need 38 semicolon 5, and then another semicolon, and you'll have the foreground color. So let's say that we want the foreground color to be on a, sort of a light yellow color, which uh, we'll pick 226 for that. And the background, which again is prefixed with 48.5, is going to be that same light blue color. So this might be kind of a bright message that we're printing out here. But let's give it a try. We're going to run our code. And that looks an awful lot like a white foreground to me, but I believe that this is just a case of my terminal not being able to display that color. And many terminals are not going to be able to display certain colors. Um, a lot of terminals probably won't be able to display a lot of different colors. All right, so let's pick a different color. Let's just try, I don't know, something like uh, nine, all right? Nine should be a reddish color, and if we hit enter, we'll see that sure enough, that gives us a reddish uh, foreground color. Now again, the colors are actually gonna be a little bit strange, so uh, what you'll see is if you remove the background color, that's actually going to give us quite a different foreground color, unless that's just an optical illusion here. But you know, many terminals, as I've said already, uh, kind of struggle to display all these different colors. All right, now one thing that you might be wondering here, now that I've just been throwing around some of these background and foreground numbers, is how are 8-bit numbers actually structured behind the scenes, right? We saw that uh, for 4-bit numbers, we just had 30 to 37 were the regular foreground colors, 40 to 47 were the regular background colors, and then we had the bright colors, which were 90 to 97 for the foreground, and uh, 100 to 107 for the bright background. Okay, so that's the 4-bit organization there. The 8-bit way of doing things is actually pretty similar, but there's a big chunk of other colors in the middle that we're able to use, all right? So with 8-bit, here's how it's gonna work. We're gonna start at zero, and from zero to seven is going to be the regular colors, right? So that would be what 30 and 37 were, uh, is going to be zero through seven in 8-bit. The bright colors for 8-bit are gonna be 8 through 15. All right, so we have 8 through 15 for the bright colors. Again, those are gonna be what uh, you know 90 through 97 were. And by the way, these both apply to the background as well, since as we saw, specifying the background or foreground with 8-bit colors isn't done with the number itself, it's actually done with this prefix here, 38.5 or 48.5. So both of these are going to be the colors for both the foreground and the background. These are just gonna be the regular, and these are going to be the bright colors. Okay, but you know those are colors that you can get in 4-bit coloring. From the number 16 all the way to the number 231, 
All right, 231. So these are all of the, um, let's call them more advanced colors, right? The brighter ones are sort of like pastel colors, I suppose. Um, but these are the, uh, we'll just call them special colors, okay? These are the colors that you can't get with 4-bit that you can get with 8-bit. And after that, from 231 all the way to 255, these are the grayscale colors, and they go all the way from black. Oh, and actually this starts at 232, not 231. 231 is where the special colors end. From 232, which is black, all the way to 255, which is almost white. 15 is the true white, because that's bright white, same as uh, 97 here. Um, but this is a very light gray color. This is basically a black color, I believe. And uh, everything in between is just the grayscale. So we'll just write gray next to that. And that's how the 8-bit colors are organized. So I highly recommend taking a screenshot of this here since, um, you know, this will really help jog your memory. Or you could always look up a color code chart online. Just Google something like 8-bit terminal color uh, chart, something like that, and you'll see that it will have something a lot like this there. Okay, so that's how 8-bit colors work. Pretty straightforward. The next thing that I want to look at is how RGB colors work. RGB colors work in a very similar way to 8-bit colors, except, obviously, instead of having to select from a specific palette here, as we've been doing, we can actually dial in different amounts of red, green, and blue to create our own colors. Now, again, terminals are going to be a little bit finicky with this, so what looks great on your terminal might look terrible on someone else's terminal, and vice versa, so... You know, you'll, you'll want to be careful with the RGB colors, uh, and, you know, you'll want to check them across many different terminals if you're going to be publishing some kind of advanced application that relies on those colors to work. But, um, anyway, here's the syntax for specifying RGB colors. It's going to be very similar, as I said, to 8-bit colors in that we start off with a prefix of two numbers. The difference, though, is going to be instead of 38.5 and 48.5, we use 38 2 and 48.2 for the foreground and background, respectively. So 38.2, and then what comes after this is going to be the red, green, and blue components themselves separated by semicolons. So as you can imagine, if you have an RGB foreground and an RGB background, it can get a little bit uh, difficult to tell where one begins and where one ends, which is something that we'll uh, see how to deal with later on. Okay, so um, let's say that we want to print out something that's uh, just a bright red color. What that would look like is we would set the R component to 255, right? Because the RGB values go from 0 to 255. And for green and blue, we would just say 0 and 0, okay? And that would give us a bright red text set using RGB. So let's run this again. And sure enough, we'll see that that is a bright red color with red all the way up and green and blue all the way down. Um, if you wanted to play with the color a little bit and maybe dial in a little bit of green there, which would give you kind of an orangish color, you could do that. And then if we run it, we see that sure enough, it gives us a nice orange foreground color. Now, the background, as I already mentioned, is just going to be specified using 48.2 instead of 38.2. So let's try that again. And what we're going to do is run this, and we'll see that, sure enough, we end up with a bright orange background. So feel free to play around with those. The last thing that I just wanted to show you here is uh, if we have both the foreground RGB and the background RGB, it's going to look like this. Let's say that we want a bright red background with a bright green foreground awful color combination, but let's just, uh, let's just do it for fun. Well, in that case, we would want the background here to be 48.2, which is the prefix, and then 255 for red and zero for green and blue. And then for the foreground here, we'll say 38.2, and then it's going to be zero. And for bright green, we want 255 for the green component, and then zero for the blue component. Okay, so again, as you can see, this is quite a long series of numbers that we're looking at here, just to specify the foreground and background with RGB. But fortunately, this isn't something that you'll normally want to do anyway, just because you're generally not going to want to specify the foreground and background color in RGB at the same time uh, in many situations. So anyway, though, let's see what this looks like. Let's run our code. And what we're going to see is that actually it looks like my terminal can't quite handle that color combination. Uh, so it's just displaying as white. And actually, if you highlight this thing, you can actually see that it shows the bright green foreground color there. 
But anyway, I suppose that's just the way it goes. So what we've seen here again is how to set 8-bit colors. And to do that, we prefix with 38.5 and 48.5 and then choose a number from 0 to 255. Again, you're going to want to look up a chart. And for RGB colors, we use a similar prefix with 38.2 for the foreground and 48.2 for the background. And then we specify the RGB components after that. So at this point, we're able to apply pretty much any kind of color that we want to our strings that we're printing out to the console, which is pretty cool. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to do all of the different color schemes in Node.js uh, that can be applied to the console, the next thing that we're going to take a look at are a few other decorations that you can add to fonts besides color. All right, so uh, an example of this would be if you wanted to add an underline to the text, or if you wanted to make the text bold, or if you wanted to uh, put a strike through in the text, perhaps. Those are all things that you can do using the same strategy that we've been using so far to add color to our strings in the console. So really all you need to know about this is that in order to add decorations like bold or italic or underline or whatever, all you need to do is the same thing that you did with 4-bit colors, but with different numbers, all right? So we saw that the 4-bit colors were 30 through 37, uh, 40 through 47, 90 through 97, and 100 through 107. But that actually leaves out a lot of other numbers that we can use for these different kinds of decorations. So what I'm going to do here is just show you some of the most commonly used uh, text decorations and their numbers. So the first one that we're going to take a look at here is zero. And this is going to look very familiar to you because we used it over here at the end of our string. So the number zero, as we've already seen, just tells the console to go back to normal. So what I'll do is I'll just write zero. Uh, we'll say clear format. All right. So the next one that we're going to take a look at is the number one. And what the number one does is it makes the text bold. Okay. So uh, if we run this now, we'll see that hello colors now is a little bit bolder than our other message here that doesn't have that styling. Now, again, some of these things you may not see in your own terminal if you're using a different terminal or operating system. So, you know, this is a good way for you to figure out which ones work and which ones don't. Okay, uh, so that's bold. We'll write that in our notes here. Uh, we'll say that one is bold. The next one, which is two, is sort of the opposite of bold. What it does is it makes the text faint. Uh, so I'll just say faint here. Um, and if we change this here to two as the number, what we're going to see if we run our code again is that hello color is sort of a darker gray color, right? It's a little bit harder to see. You can probably picture using this for uh, bits of information that aren't really very important. Okay, so that's two. The next one that we're going to take a look at is three, which makes a piece of text italic. So we'll say three italic. And by the way, these two here, faint and italic, aren't really supported by very many terminals. It just so happens that the VS Code one supports it. But, you know, if you're running this on a different operating system or a different terminal, as I've said, you might find that these don't work. And that's going to be true of a lot of these stylings uh, that we'll look at here. So three is italic. Let's just take a look and see what that looks like here. If we run our code again, we'll see that sure enough, it says hello colors all in italics. And actually, if you highlight it, you can see that it takes away the italicness, italicism. I'm not quite sure what that word would be, but it converts the uh, text to not italics. And, and again, that's just an example of some of the weirdness of terminal colors and stylings. They don't all work 100% of the time, which is a little bit unfortunate. Okay. So anyway, we have up to three. The next one is going to be underline, and that is four. So let's type four there and run this. And sure enough, we see that that adds a nice little underline underneath our hello colors string. So let's write that in as well. Uh, we'll say that four is underline. 
And there's not really too much logic to the organization of this, I suppose. I mean, but really just like with, uh, you know, the regular colors, the four bit colors, you just kind of have to memorize these things if you want, or better yet, just make some helper functions that make it so that you don't have to remember these in the first place. And that's something that we'll see how to do a little bit later as well. All right, so let's see. The only other one that I really wanted to show you was the strike through one, and that is going to be nine. So. Uh, the things in between the numbers that we've already looked at, so from 5 through 8, are things that I personally didn't find worked in my terminal, so I'm just going to skip over those. But 9 should be a strike through, so let's run our code again, and we'll see that sure enough that has a line through it. So we'll write that in our terminal here. We'll say that 9 is a strike through. I think that's two words, it might be one word, whatever, doesn't matter. And that's pretty much all the ones that I wanted to mention here. So there are other ones, but again, none of them really work on my terminal, so it's not really worth showing. Um, what I would do if I were you is just look up terminal font effects or something like that, and that should take you to a chart that will show you all of the different numbers and what they're all supposed to do. Okay, so anyway, we have this little chart here. I highly recommend that you just take a screenshot of that for future reference. Or as I said, you could always look up the uh, font effect chart and just uh, you know print that out or something like that if you want to. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so at this point we've seen pretty much all of the important stylings that we can apply to fonts when we're printing them out to the console, but one thing that's probably been bothering you so far, and it's certainly been bothering me, is the fact that in order to do this we have to remember this long syntax and remember to write that out every single time. And then we have to stop the styling at the very end of the string to prevent it from spilling over onto other strings. So. What I highly recommend that you do in situations like this is make some sort of helper function that will take care of these things for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some helper functions for adding colors and styles to our strings in our console. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create several functions for the different color schemes that are available to us. All right, so the first function that we're going to create we'll call something like function color standard. And what this is going to do is it's going to apply the standard colors, right? Right. So from 30 to 37, 40 to 47, 90 to 97, 100 to 107. Now there's a few ways that we could go about this. Uh, obviously the easiest way would just be to allow ourselves to pass the number code as the argument here. And that's one way to go about it for sure. So let's actually just give that a try. So what that would look like is we would basically take the number code and the string, and we'll actually have the string that we want to add this uh, color to as the first argument, because that's the most important. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to copy this uh, string here to use that as a template, and we'll say return and paste this, okay? So if we remove the single quotes and replace them with back ticks, which is going to make it easier for us, then what we're going to want to do is use the string and number code here to customize this string that we're returning. So obviously, we're going to want to allow ourselves to colorify any string. So what we're going to do is just remove the hello color string that we've been using and replace that with whatever the string argument that got passed in here is. Okay, now as far as the number code that we want to apply to this string, all we're going to do is replace the 9 here with that number code. Okay, so we're just going to say uh, string and number code, and that's pretty much all we need to do there. And in fact, with the right number code, this could be used not only for the standard colors, but also for the 8-bit and for the uh, RGB colors. So let's just call this one something like add color. Okay, so that's this function, and that's really all we need to do, um, you know, to create a simple helper function that makes it so that we don't have to remember the escape sequence and automatically applies this closing sequence, right, which will set the terminal back to its default color. So let's just try using this add color function. Now, one thing to note is that, is that basically what this function is doing is it's taking the string and it's returning a copy of that string with these escape sequences wrapping it, right? right? So if we say something like add color 
hello, and the number code, let's just do something like 34. Well, in that case, all that that's going to be doing is replacing this string here with hello and replacing the number code with 34. Okay, but since it's returning a copy, we're gonna have to say something like let uh, colorized string equals add color. And then when we print that out, right, if we say console.log colorized string, that's going to have the colors. Whereas if we just print out the original string and say console.log hello, that's obviously not going to have the color. So if we run this now, we'll see that sure enough, hello is printed out in blue, which is 34. And the other hello is just printed out in the typical color um, because we didn't add any colors to it. So we can actually cut out this middle step here too by just uh, you know using the add color function in place. So uh, in this case with hello, we could just say add color to hello. And then for the number code, we would just say 34, all right? So let's run this again and we'll see that sure enough, hello will be printed out in blue like that. And the other thing too is, is that we can add this into other strings, right? So, you know, if we wanted to say something like let greeting equals, and then maybe we have someone's name here. So I'll just use mine like that. We can say hello and then add the result of calling add color on the name. And let's see, we'll use 34 for my name as well. And that will become one big string with the escape sequences in that string, right? So in other words, these things don't have to apply to an entire string. They, they can easily be applied just to pieces of a string. And we could even add something else onto the end here if we wanted, all right? Like uh, an exclamation point, for example. And down here now, if we log out our greeting, we can just say console.log greeting. And we'll see that sure enough, the coloring has only been applied to the name in this message that we just printed out. All right, so this is just the basic helper function that we've created um, for abstracting away the exact syntax that's going on behind the scenes. But we can make this a lot better if we want to and uh, you know make it a lot easier for ourselves to apply a wide range of different colors and styles to our uh, strings. So what we can do here if we want is actually create a mapping between the different number codes and the different colors. And what that would look like is something like this. We'd wanna say something like let, and we'll start off with colors four bit, okay? And this is just gonna be an object. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have the digit here, uh, the last digit that applies to each of these numbers, right? So zero for black, one for red, two for green, etc. And what we're gonna do is we're going to add that onto the end, depending on whether we want it to be the foreground, background, and whether we want it to be bright or not. So, all right, so all we need to do is say black zero, we'll do red one, green is gonna be two, yellow is gonna be three, blue is gonna be four, magenta is gonna be five, and let's see, cyan is gonna be six, and then we have white, uh, which is going to be seven. Okay, so this will make it a lot easier for us to actually specify numbers by strings, because what we'll be able to do is create a function that will actually take one of these strings as an argument and return the corresponding number, okay? So what that's gonna look like is we're just gonna say let, and we'll create another object here with the different variants. So we'll just say something like uh, variants, and this is gonna be an object, and what we'll do is we'll have foreground, which will be three, right? That's the first digit in the foreground colors, so three zero would be foreground black. We'll do background, which will be four, and then we'll do foreground bright, and I wanna specify that with a dash in it, so we'll just say foreground bright like so, because we're gonna be specifying that as a string, so we'll just say uh, nine for that one, and then background, bright is going to be 10. Okay, so now that we've done that, what we should be able to do is create a function that uses both of these objects and sort of constructs the appropriate color code for us. So what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say function and we'll call this one add color. And actually what we'll do is we'll go up and change the old add color to you know internal add color since we're very rarely gonna want to use this function elsewhere. 
And then down here, what we're going to do is we're going to say function add color. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the color and it's going to take the variant as well. Okay, so uh, we'll set the default value for variant to something like foreground. But, you know, we'll also be able to specify background, foreground bright, or background bright as well. All right, so all we have to do now is call the internal add color function with whatever string we want and with the number code that we're going to construct from these two objects here. And of course, that also means we're going to need to add the string in here as well. Okay, so what this is going to look like is we're just going to say return underscore add color. So our internal add color function that takes away the uh, stress of bringing about the escape sequences. And then we're just going to pass the string itself. And in order to figure out the number code, what we're going to do is get the color code and the variant code. So we'll just say let color code equals colors four bit. And we're going to search for um, that color that was passed as the argument here. And then for the variant, we're going to say let variant code, there we go, equals variance. And we're just going to search for the variant here. Okay, now there is a possibility that someone will input a color that doesn't exist in either of those objects. So let's just provide a backup value here. We'll just say or for if that doesn't exist and the default color there will be zero. And for the variant code, we'll just say or and we'll have the default for that one be three, which is foreground, okay? And actually the default for the color code should probably be uh, white here. So we'll set that to seven instead of zero. Okay, so it'll just default to the normal terminal color if someone puts in a color or a variant that aren't quite right. So now that we have the color code and the variant code, we, we should just be able to add those together in our argument here. So for the color code, we'll just use back ticks and we'll say color code. And actually before that, we're gonna wanna put the variant code. So we'll say variant code and color code after it. And that should be all we need to do. So. Let's try this again with our new improved add color function. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add color to the name, but we're gonna say add color name, and we should be able to say blue. Okay, so let's try running this. And sure enough, we should see that that works just the same way as actually specifying the color code did, but this is obviously a lot easier being able to refer to colors by name since it frees us up from having to remember all of the different color codes here. Okay, and just to check and make sure that the different variants such as background and uh, foreground bright, those kind of things work, let's just test this one out. We'll say blue background. And if we run it again, we'll see that sure enough that gives it a blue background. And if we try this with um, a blue, let's say foreground bright, we should see that that gives us a bright foreground color. It's kind of hard to see the difference between these two, but it definitely is a little bit brighter down here than the original one was. So anyway, this add color function is a great helper function for allowing us to add simple colors to strings. So let's actually go one step further and see how we can create individual functions for the different colors in a very similar way to NPM packages like chalk, okay? So what we would wanna do in this case would be something like, instead of saying add color name, blue, foreground, bright, we might wanna be able to say just blue, name, right? That would certainly make things a lot easier. So the way that we're going to do that is by using a concept called partial application with our add color function. Now this is a functional programming concept, so don't worry too much about it if uh, it doesn't make sense to you. But basically partial application is just when we can take a function like add color here and create another function from it that has one or more of its arguments fixed. Now, in this case, what we're going to want to do is, is allow ourselves to create new functions from this add color function by specifying different values for color and variant while still leaving the string argument open. All right. So what this is going to look like is we'll say something like function create color. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the color and the variant, just like we saw above, and it's going to return another function that takes the string and simply calls this add color function with all three of those accumulated arguments. You'll see how this actually allows us to do things like this in just a minute. So all we need to do in this case is say return add color 
with all of those arguments accumulated. So string, color, and variant. And that's all we need. So now what we can actually do is use this create color function to create functions like blue here that can apply a color and a variant to a string automatically. So what this is gonna look like, we're just gonna say let blue equals create color. And then for the color, we would wanna say blue. And for the variant, we could either just leave that blank or uh, say foreground, but I'm gonna leave it blank because we don't need it. And this blue is going to work in this way, right? If we run our code now, what we'll see is that sure enough, that applies blue to the name. So if we wanted to create other functions as well, right? If we wanted to say, let red equals create color red, and we wanted to apply that to the name instead, we could say red name. And if we run this, we'll see that that will apply the color red to the name. All right, and of course, if we wanted to uh, do some kind of background color, like a yellow background, let's say, then what we could do is just say, let yellow, and we'll abbreviate this with BG, equals create color, and then we could say yellow, and we would say background for the variant. Okay, so now we could say yellow background, like so, and call that on the name, and if we run our code, we'll see that sure enough, that will apply the yellow background to the name. So anyway, this is just an example of how to create helper functions that make working with colors in the terminal much easier. And as a little challenge that I'm gonna leave up to you here, I want you to try and think of a way that you could do that same thing that we did with colors with some of the other text decorations, such as underlines, italic, bold, etc., where you can just create functions like this that you can call on a string and make it bold or underlined or italic or whatever. And just as a hint, you should be able to use this add color function to do that just with the relevant number codes that correspond to each of those decorations. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. We've already seen elsewhere how to add basic colors to the things that we log out to the console from inside our JavaScript programs. And what we're gonna do in this section is actually take this a step further and see how to create basic animations inside the console, right? So this will allow us to, among other things, of course, do things like display loading bars and loading messages that update as our program actually uh, completes some kind of task. Uh, but besides that, we're also going to take a look at some basic concepts that can be used to pretty much create whatever kind of animation you want in the console. So without further ado, let's jump right in and see how to make animations happen in the console. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to create a simple animation that will show the progress of something that's going on in our program. All right, so it's a pretty common thing when you run some kind of script or when you run some kind of, uh, you know, when you, maybe you're downloading something to see a message that looks like this. And you might see something like loading and then it's maybe got dot, dot, dot. And then after that, you have the percentage that's been completed of that loading. And what it does is it starts at 0% and gradually it will count all the way up to 100% and then you know the program will continue executing below that. So that's what we're gonna be seeing how to do here. We're gonna be seeing how to do the rather simple task of just displaying a percentage that counts up without moving, right? And the without moving part is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I'm gonna show you how that's done in just a minute here. But you know, we obviously don't wanna print out a new line every time where we say loading 0%, then next up we have loading 1%, right? And stuff like that. We don't wanna print out a new line for each incremental improvement. We wanna keep that in place. So. What this is gonna look like, uh, first of all, we're gonna start off here with some of the color functions that we created in a previous section, right? We came up with these functions for adding color to strings as we print them to the console. And we also created this create color higher order function. And don't worry if you don't know what a higher order function is, 
just know that what this allows us to do is create functions that will automatically apply a color to a certain string, right? So if we want to color a certain part of a string green, let's say, we, we could say let green equals create color. And then the color and variant here are just gonna be two strings. The color is just gonna be the name of the color we want. And earlier we saw how to create this object thing that basically stores different color codes for each of the different colors. So these are all of the colors that we can use. All right, so that's the first argument. And then the second argument is a variant, which basically just tells whether we want to apply that color to the foreground, to the background, and whether we want it to be bright or not. All right, and those variants are down here. So we can either pass foreground, background, or foreground dash bright, background dash bright. All right, so if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend going back and taking a look at how that's done. If not, feel free to steal this code and use it yourself. All right, so, you know, again, if we wanted to create a function that would color some strings green, we would just say create color green. And uh, the default variant here is foreground. So if we wanted that to be background, we could just say background, and that would uh, add a green background to any text that we wrapped it in, right? So we could say console.log green, and then say something like hello. And what that would do if we were to run this code with index.js is it would print out the string hello with a green background, as you can see. Oops, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna be using this create color function and the add color function, just to add a little bit more visual interest to some of our animations here. But now that we're familiar with that, we've reviewed what these functions that we built do, uh, we can finally move on to actually creating an animation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just push all this stuff down to the bottom so that it's not too distracting for us and gives us a nice blank screen. And let's talk now about animations and how they work. So as I mentioned before, one of the tricky things about animations is getting the animation to stay in the same place. So, you know, if we were to print some sort of string to the console, right? In this case, that might be something like loading, right? Well, we can't do that with console.log because in that case, if we were to print loading and then say 0% and then try and change that to loading 1% just by calling console.log again, well, that's just going to put those two things on different lines because that's what console.log is designed to do, right? It's designed to print out a string and then go to the next line and, right? It's really meant more for debugging purposes than for doing things like uh, ASCII art or uh, animations, of course. So we want to avoid this. And the way that we're going to avoid this is by using the read line package. And this is something that we talked about in a previous section as well. So if you haven't seen this yet, I highly recommend you go back and take a look at it and see uh, how to use the read line package to draw things effectively in the console. So what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to use the read line package. And here, I guess I'll write that in lowercase because it's all lowercase in code. So we're going to want to use the read line package. And specifically, we're going to want to use the cursor to function, which will allow us to move the current position of the cursor in the terminal back to whatever line we're trying to animate and rewrite over that line with a new piece of text, right? So in other words, if we've just uh, written loading here with the percentage, which I'll just draw again here, let's say 0%, then what the read line package is gonna allow us to do is go back to the beginning of this line and rewrite the same thing, but with a different number, right? So we're just going to write over that. And as you'll see shortly, that's going to give a very strong visual impression of animation, right? So um, animation in the console is primarily just done by writing one piece of text and then writing over that piece of text and then writing over that piece of text with some modified string. Okay, so that's gonna be our basic strategy here. So going back to our code, what we're gonna want to do is first of all, of course, import the read line package. And to do that, I'm gonna say import read line from read line. And this is something that I've mentioned elsewhere as well, but I'll mention it again here in case this is the first uh, one of these that you're watching. I'm currently using node version 16.15.0. And in future versions of nodes such as 18, which currently is not the long-term support version, it's, it's more of the cutting edge version, um, I've seen that the import statement for this is gonna be a little bit different. So you might have to do something like import all as read line from 
and then it would be something like node read line. I believe that's what you want to do there. So anyway, just uh, something to keep in mind if you end up getting an error saying that the read line package can't be imported that way uh, and you're using a later version of node, that's probably why. So anyway, that's just something I wanted to point out here in case you get problems with that. So now that we've imported the read line package, the next thing that we're going to want to do is clear the console. Okay, so what this is going to look like, we're going to say process dot standard out dot write. And you may or may not have seen this before. It's something that we mentioned in another section. The way that we clear the console uh, from a Node.js program is by writing out a very specific character that tells the console that we want to clear it. And this is a pretty long escape sequence here. It's going to be slash u 001b. I would make sure that your capitalization is the same as mine. Um, and after that, it's going to be opening square bracket to J and then backslash U001B again, and then opening square bracket zero semicolon zero F. Okay, so pretty long escape sequence, but that will clear the console for us. Okay, and if you want to, just to make this easier in the future, we can make a function called clear console or something like that, and then we can just do that inside that function. So we'll just be able to call this clear console thing uh, from our other pieces of code whenever we want to do that without having to worry about this nasty escape sequence ever again. Okay, so now that we know how to clear the console, let's actually do that to start off with. We're just going to call clear console like that, which will clear the console for us. And the next thing that we're going to want to do is create our animation. All right, now the first thing that we're going to want to do to create our animation is write out whatever the initial state is going to be, right? So again, if we're printing out the string loading dot 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 with a percentage like so, then, uh, you know, we're going to want to start off by printing that to the console. Now, as we've seen in other sections, and, you know, if you haven't seen those other sections again, that's not really a big deal, but I would recommend going and watching those at some point. Um, we're not going to be using console.log here because console.log's functionality is a little bit too much for what we want here, right? It automatically adds a new line. It's just a little bit cumbersome to work with. The better one to work with is this process.standardout.write function, which will just write individual characters to the console without adding any extra new lines, right? It will basically just add characters wherever your current cursor position is and move over to the right, sort of like a typewriter. All right. So let's uh, start off here by writing out our initial state, which is going to be process.standardout.write. And what we're going to do is we're going to use back ticks here. And what we're going to do is just initially set this to loading dot 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 with zero uh, percent as the string. Okay. So if we run our code right now, just to see what we have so far, what we should see happen is that the console gets cleared, right? So the previous console prefix here gets erased when we call clear console and write out this special character here. And we see that loading 0% gets written there. And this little thing that comes after that is just the final position of the cursor. And that actually reminds me, this is something that we've talked about elsewhere as well um, in a section where we talk about drawing to the console. But if you really want your animation to take up the entire terminal, then what you might want to do is at the end of the program, move the position of the cursor down to the very bottom so that the new console prefix appears down here and not right underneath uh, wherever your animation was. That might not be what you want, but I'll just show you how to do it real quick because it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. What you're going to want to do, and we'll actually just create this in its own function as well. We'll just say function and we'll call this function move cursor to bottom. And all that we're going to do in here is use the read line package dot cursor to function in order to move the cursor to the bottom of the terminal. So the way that we do that is by uh, moving the cursor in process dot standard out to the X position of zero, right? The X position is just the horizontal position. So we don't have to worry about that too much. And the Y position, we're going to want that to be at the bottom of the terminal. And to do that, we can just say process dot standard out dot rows, which gives us the vertical size of the terminal, right? So it tells us how many rows there are here. As you can see, that's a, a discrete amount. 
And what we're going to need to do in order to make sure that we don't go down too far, we're going to need to just subtract one because that will be the line that this uh, prefix ends up getting printed out on, right? So that we don't cut off the top of our drawing or animation or whatever it is that we're doing. Okay, so what that'll look like in case you don't know is if we call move cursor to bottom at the end of our program and run our code again, we'll see that that will just draw our animation and whatever else we want up here. And the new terminal prefix for the command line will appear down at the bottom of the terminal. Okay, so that's just a way to keep this thing from cluttering up uh, your animation that you work so hard for. All right, so you don't need to do that, but you know, it might be something that you wanna do. So that's the function for doing so. Okay, so anyway, at this point, we've seen how to clear the console. We've seen how to move the cursor to the bottom at the end of the program. And we've also seen how to write out the initial state of our animation. So, all right, so what we're gonna wanna do now is as our program progresses, and we're gonna be simulating this just using JavaScript's built-in set timeout and set interval functions. As the program progresses, we're gonna want to overwrite this string here with some other value, right? So we're gonna want to overwrite this with loading and, you know, let's say 50% or 100% or whatever. So the first thing that we'll do here, just to get a taste of what this is gonna look like, we're gonna use JavaScript's built-in set timeout function. And what we're gonna have it do is after, let's just say maybe one second, so we'll pass 1000 milliseconds as the second argument here. We're gonna overwrite this initial line here with a new value. So what we're gonna need to do there is say process.standardout.write. And then for the string, Again, just as a beginning example here, we'll say loading and we'll do, I don't know, 50%, let's say. Okay, so if we run this code now, what we're gonna see is that at first the loading 0% is printed and then we get loading 50% printed after that. Now, one thing actually happened here and that is that the cursor got moved to the bottom before this thing happened. So obviously we want to uh, call move cursor to bottom after we're done animating. So we'll just move that into there and that should uh, have that effect. So let's try this again. All right, so we see loading 0% and then we see loading 50%, but instead of overwriting the original message, right? Loading 0%, it's been printed after it. And that's not exactly what we want. So the reason that this is happening is when we call process.standardout.write and we write this loading zero thing to the console, after that happens, the current position of the cursor is gonna be right here, right? It's gonna be right after the last character that we wrote. And that's why when we call process.standardout.write again with this loading 50% thing, it just kind of picks up where the cursor left off. So what we have to do in order to overwrite the previous text is we have to move the cursor back to the beginning. And a lot of times it's also helpful to clear the line. So let's just start off by moving the cursor back. The way that we're gonna do that is by, before we say process.standardout.write, we're gonna say readline.cursor2, and we're going to move the cursor in process.standardout to zero zero, all right? All right, so we're moving it back to the top left-hand corner of our terminal, and that might not always be what we wanna do, by the way, right? If we just wanna have an animation that's on its own line, instead of clearing the entire terminal, we might want to do something a little bit different than this, but for now, this should work. So let's run this now, and what we're gonna see if we run our code again is that we'll get loading zero and loading 50% successfully overwrites that, all right? So just run it again, and you can see that we've got the start of an animation going here. So the next thing that we're gonna wanna do here, as I said, is in most cases, we're gonna want to clear the line that our cursor is on before we overwrite it. And the reason for that is if we're writing a shorter string, that shorter string isn't going to completely get rid of whatever was previously there. And many times we don't really know what the size of the string is that we're gonna be writing uh, we just know that we want it to replace whatever was there in the first place. Okay, so, you know, if we were to write something like hello, let's say, inside this animation, then what we would see is hello is only going to overwrite the first six characters or so of loading, and, you know, we can still see the old stuff here. So, usually that's not what we'll want. So, what you're going to want to do is clear that line. So, after we move the cursor, we'll say readline.clearLine. 
and we're gonna clear the line that the cursor is currently on. And as the second argument here, we're gonna pass zero, which just means that we wanna clear the entire line. Okay, so let's try that again with the hello string that we're printing and what we should see. Oops, it looks like that didn't work. Oh, and the reason for that is that I didn't write all of standard out. So let's try that again. And sure enough, we see that hello completely overwrites the loading message this time. All right, so we've got everything else in order. We've got the initial state getting printed out. We have the cursor moving back to the beginning of the line each time something happens. We have the line getting cleared each time we want to write something new. And we have the new string getting written. So the last thing that we're going to need to do here is actually replace this set timeout with something that happens a little bit more frequently. So what we can do is instead of using set timeout, we can actually use the set interval function, which is like set timeout, but it happens multiple times, right? JavaScript is going to call this callback function here continuously every, you know, so many milliseconds, whatever we specify for this argument here. So this would call this function every second, but to make this a little more interesting, let's call this function every 100 milliseconds. So it'll get called 10 times a second. And what we're gonna wanna do is increment the percentage that's loaded each time. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start off by defining a variable called percent loaded, and we'll set that equal to zero. Okay, now the initial message is gonna be loading and it's gonna have percent loaded as the number here. So what we'll do is just change this to back ticks and we'll insert the value of percent loaded into there, all right? And now we're just gonna go down into set interval. And of course, we're gonna move the cursor and clear the line every time. And we're going to want to update the percent loaded and write that out to the console every time this set interval thing is called. So what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say percent loaded and we'll increment that by, let's say five every time. And then what we'll wanna do is instead of hello, we're gonna want to use back ticks and say the same string, we'll say loading percent loaded, just like we did up above. And we'll wanna put the percentage sign after that, of course. Uh, Nope, there it is. Okay, got it. And in case you're wondering why it takes me so long to type those characters correctly uh, sometimes, it's because my keyboard that I usually type with doesn't have any labels on it whatsoever. Um, it's actually quite terrifying when I have to go and enter in some kind of lengthy password or something like that that involves symbols because I can never tell what I'm about to type. I like not having the letters, but I need the numbers and the symbols because I can never remember where those are. Uh, sometimes I get lucky, but usually I don't. So anyway, just an aside. So now that we've set the interval, what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to stop this from executing when our percentage reaches 100. And the way that we do that in JavaScript is by assigning this interval that we create to a variable. So we'll say something like let interval equals set interval. And then what we'll do is we'll check and see if percent loaded is equal to 100. And here we'll do greater than or equal to 100, I suppose, just to make sure we're not infinitely calling this thing if we happen to miss 100, right? If we're using something like three instead of five. And inside here, what we'll do is we'll say move cursor to bottom, and we'll want to clear the interval by saying uh, clear interval. That's just a global function you can call in JavaScript. And we're gonna want to pass the interval that we created up here to that, which will stop this function from getting called. Any all right, so that should be all we need to do. Let's give this thing a try. What we're gonna do is just open up our terminal and run our code. And sure enough, we'll see that we get this nice little loading animation that has the percentage go all the way from zero up to 100. So anyway, what we've learned here is the basics of creating a very simple animation in the terminal for loading. And I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to do a very simple animation uh, that's text-based and just counts up from 0% all the way to 100%,
let's do something that's a little bit more exciting. And instead of just writing a loading message, let's create an actual loading bar in the console. Now there's a few different ways that we can go about this. And obviously um, this is a highly configurable thing. You can feel free to play around with different characters, different colors, etc. But usually what I've seen for loading bars is you have uh, square brackets for the start and the end. And in between those square brackets, you usually have like dashes or something like that. And the way that it works is as this loading bar progresses, right, as whatever program is uh, displaying this loading bar completes tasks, these dashes here turn into colored equals signs, right? So usually they're green or something like that. And visually that gives the impression that the loading bar is filling up. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at how to do here right now. And it's gonna be a pretty straightforward thing to do. And in my very nerdy opinion, it's also a lot of fun. Now, obviously there are some other variations that you could do on this as well, right? You could just have spaces here to begin with and then maybe fill it up with asterisk characters or something like that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different possibilities. So anyway, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna draw out this initial version of a loading bar and well, let's just jump right into it. So um, what we're gonna wanna do here is just like we had this function uh, called get loading message that basically took care of generating our colored loading message for us, we're gonna wanna create something very similar and we'll call it something like get loading bar or get progress bar or something like that. I think progress bar is a little better. All right, so we'll say get progress bar and this is going to take the same kind of argument as our loading message does. We're gonna just call it percentage and that's more or less where the similarities end, okay? So what we're gonna have to do here in order to draw our progress bar is we're gonna need to use this percentage to figure out how full the progress bar should be and use that information to basically generate the two different parts, the filled part and the um, empty part of our progress bar. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna wanna do here is we're gonna to wanna to convert the percentage, which is a number between zero and 100, into an actual decimal, right? So a number from zero to one. And what this is gonna allow us to do, it's just gonna make the math a little bit easier. So let's start that off. We'll say something like let amount full, and this will be percentage divided by 100, okay, so you'll notice that when percentage is 100, this amount full will be equal to one. When percentage is zero, this amount full will be equal to zero. And just to make things easier for us as well, we'll just say amount empty, and this is gonna be 100 minus the amount full. So we'll just say 100 minus amount full. All right, so now that we have the amount full and the amount empty, and actually the amount empty is gonna be one minus amount full, okay? The next thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is actually create the progress bar string. Now, the first thing that we know about the progress bar is that it's going to have uh, the square brackets at the beginning and the end. So we can already write those out and I'm using back ticks here so that we can insert the full and empty uh, portions of the loading bar in between them. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna to need to figure out how many uh, equal signs to generate and basically what we're gonna do is just use that information to create a string that's just that many equal signs. And we're also gonna to wanna to do that for the empty portion for which we're gonna to wanna to use dashes, okay? So here's how that's gonna work. The first thing that we're gonna to need to know is how big we want the progress bar to be, right? How, how many units wide do we want this thing to be? Now, this is actually the perfect thing to add another argument here for. So we'll just say width, and then we can pass in that we want it to be, let's say 20 wide or 10 wide or 30 wide or whatever. And we can use this width now in conjunction with the amount full and the amount empty to figure out how many equal signs and how many minus signs we want to generate. All right, so here's how that's gonna work. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, let full portion, and this is just gonna be the joined together equal signs in a string that we can then insert in between these square brackets when we're done. And what this is gonna look like, we're gonna first figure out how many units wide this full section should be by combining width and amount full. So what we'll do is say width times amount full. So what you'll notice here, just mathematically speaking, is that if 
we're at 100%, amount fold is going to be 1, and so the full portion is going to be equal to the width, right? So the whole thing is going to be full. Now, same thing if it's 0, right? Amount full is going to be 0, and the full portion is going to be 0 units wide. Now, one more thing that we need to do is make sure that this ends up as a whole number because what we're going to be doing here is creating an array that length and basically filling it with equal signs and joining it together. So we're going to say full portion equals new array width times amount full. And we're going to need to round this. So what we'll do is say math dot ceiling. OK, so we'll just say that we're going to round this portion up and maybe we'll round the amount empty down just to make sure that we stay at the same width. And then what we're going to do is fill it with equal signs, as I said. So we'll just say dot fill, and we're going to pass the equal sign as a string. And then we can join that together into a single string by saying join with an empty string as the argument. Okay, so again, what this is going to give us is a string with as many equal signs as the full portion should be wide. All right. So now we're going to do the same thing with the empty portion. We're going to say let empty portion equals new array. And for this one, we're going to use math.floor to round down. And we'll say width times amount empty. All right, and we're going to fill this one with uh, minus signs, right, dashes, and join that together just like we did with the equal signs. And that'll give us our empty portion. All right, so now that we have these two things, all we need to do is insert them in between the two square brackets here. So that's pretty straightforward. We're just going to say full portion. And after that, we're going to say empty portion. OK. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So we've now created a function that, given a percentage and a width, will create the progress bar for us. So. In order to animate this, all we need to do is go down in, into our set interval callback and swap out get loading message with our new uh, get progress bar function. Okay, so uh, we're going to need to do that here too as well. Of course, we'll say get progress bar percent loaded, and for the width, let's say that we want that to be 20. All right, and then we'll do the same thing down here. We'll say get progress bar. And for this one, we'll say percent loaded and 20, just like we did up above. And that should be all we need to do. So let's give this thing a try. What we're going to do is uh, run our code. And sure enough, what we'll see is we have our nice little loading bar here uh, that starts all the way over at the left hand side and fills up until it's done. Okay, now one thing that you might have noticed is that despite my best mathematical efforts to avoid this, the loading bar does flicker a little bit in length, as you can see right here. It adjusts in length as we get closer to the end. All right, now I believe that a way to fix this is actually just to change the way that we're rounding. So I did math.ceiling and math.floor. Uh, these should really just both be math.floor. Round. I wasn't really thinking of that. I'm not quite sure what I was thinking there. But if we run this again, what we should see is that the loading bar remains a constant length. All right, so now that we've done that, the next thing that we're going to want to do, of course, is add some color to this loading bar. So let's give that a try. Let's maybe add a green color to the uh, equal signs here as our application loads. What that'll look like is if we go back into our get progress bar function, we're going to want to just apply the green color, which we've already created up above, to our full portion. And for our empty portion, we're just going to leave that as is. OK, so let's try this again. And sure enough, we'll see that our loading bar has a nice green color to it now. All right, so that's pretty cool. And just to give you an idea of some of the other uh, things that you can do with this, let's say that instead of equal signs, you wanted to have it just be an entire green background as the character. Well, in order to do that, all you would have to do is create a green background function. So in order to do that, we would just say green, create color green, and we would use the background or background bright string there. And we could call this uh, green background. And then all we would have to do is for the full portion, we would just want to fill this with spaces instead of equal signs. And we would want to apply the green background uh, coloring to that. All right, so that should colorize this correctly. Let's just give that a try. And sure enough, we'll see that that loads nicely with that big green background right there. 
So I think that looks pretty cool. Uh, again, feel free to play around with this as much as you want. Now, just for fun, one more thing that you can also do with this. I'm going to change this back to just green with the equal signs here. So we'll just put that back there. One more fun thing that you could do is, uh, let's say that you're doing something like transferring files. Well, in that case, what you might want to do is have two loading bars, one after the other, and have one start full and sort of empty out and have the other one fill up as that one empties out, right? So if you're transferring files, this might be a nice visual. In case that doesn't make sense, let me just show you what I mean here. First of all, we'd probably want our progress bars to be different colors. So let's try adding another argument to our get progress bar, which will be um, the color that we want to apply. So we'll just say color. And for this, what we're going to do is instead of using these create color color functions that we've added up here, we're just going to use the simple uh, add color function. So what that'll look like is we're just going to say instead of green, we'll say add color. And we'll add that to the full portion, of course. And for the color itself, we're going to pass through the color argument. And for the variant, we'll just set that to foreground. Uh, we'll do foreground bright, all right? So we'll say foreground bright. And this will allow us to add color to our progress bar. Okay, so just to test and make sure that this still works, let's give this another try and we'll pass the green color as the progress bar. Or, you know what, let's try red. Okay, and here we'd want to do the same thing up here. So we'll just do red. And if we run our code again, we'll see that sure enough, our progress bar now has a red color uh, for the full portion. So now all we need to do to animate what I was talking about beforehand is basically write two progress bars, one after the other. All right, so we might want to say get progress bar and have the red progress bar be full automatically. Okay, so for this one, we'd want to say 100 minus percent loaded. And then after that, what we're going to do, and here I'll just uh, add some indentation here to make it a little more readable. What we would do is we would say plus, and then we would add some kind of arrow or something like that in between the two progress bars. And then after that, we would add another get progress bar with the percent loaded, the uh, size 20 and the color green, all right? And then of course, we'd wanna do the same thing down here. So I'll just copy this and paste this down here. And we can now indent this. And if we run our code, what we should see is that we now have this nice little transfer progress bar things. So, you know, this might be in a situation where you're transferring files. So you might see transferring files. And, you know, that's kind of a nice little animation there. You might actually even want to have this uh, loading bar go the other way, right? So you might want to have the full portion move over to the right instead of over to the left. Now, the way that you could do that is simply by adding yet another argument to this get progress bar function, where you say something like uh, direction equals, and then you'd have the default for this be left, just as an example. Right, that would be the side that the full portion is on. And then all you would do is you would say return and you would check to see whether the direction is equal to left. If it is, then you would return the standard one. Otherwise, what you would do, okay, and we'll add the ternary operator here. Otherwise, what you would do is you would simply reverse the full and empty portions. All right, so you could just uh, copy the empty portion here like so and put that before the full portion. All right, and we just need to remove that other semicolon there. And now what we could do is set the direction of this other loading bar to something like right, and we didn't even uh, specify something for right, so we could really pass anything here except left and it would work. But let's do the same thing for uh, the loading bar down here. And if we run this again, what we'll see is that that moves over to the right-hand side pretty nicely. All right, so we've seen how to create a pretty cool loading bar here using some basic terminal animation concepts. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to create a basic animation in the terminal, and you know all that this does so far is just says loading and it counts from zero all the way to 100, 
uh, incrementing the percentage every so many milliseconds here. The next thing that I want to take a look at is how to do this kind of animation and have it stick to its own line. All right, so in order to show you what I mean, let's just say that uh, this loading message that we're animating is only one part of a larger program uh, where we're logging all sorts of things to the console, right? So maybe before this, we say console.log and we print out just a simple message that says something like preparing to load, all right? Well, in that case, with the current implementation that we have for our animation, this isn't gonna work out very well, right? And to show you what I mean, let's just try running this. If we run our code again, what we'll see is that very briefly, this message here preparing to load flashes on the first line, and then it prints out this loading, 0% loaded thing. And then after that, what it does is it jumps back up to the line above it and counts up to 100. Okay, so the thing that's causing this problem is the fact that we're setting the cursor to a concrete position. All right, but what we wanna do instead is move the cursor only to the beginning of whatever line it's currently on, right? So we don't want to overwrite this line that we printed above it. We want that to stay there. We only wanna overwrite the previous place where we uh, printed out that message. All right, so in order to do this, it's actually quite a simple fix. All we need to do is remove the second zero, uh, which is the Y position, by the way. And in this case, what we're doing is we're just moving the cursor back to X position zero on the current line, all right? So the default here is just to leave the cursor on the current line if we don't specify the Y argument. So let's try this again. And what we should see now is if we run this, we'll see the preparing to load uh, message getting printed here. And then underneath that, we'll see the correct loading animation. So everything is looking great so far. The last thing that I wanna do here before we move on is add a little bit of excitement to our message here by actually colorizing it. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna create a function that will say something like uh, get loading message. And all that this is gonna do is take the current percentage and it's going to return this string, all right? So we're just gonna copy this string here and paste it in here and we'll change this to percentage. And then what we're gonna do is add a color to this using some of the color functions that we created in another section down here. All right, so let's say that we want this message to be yellow while it's loading and green once it's reached 100%. Well, in that case, what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna use this create color function. And what we'll do is say, let yellow equals create color and we're gonna pass yellow as the argument here, which will set the foreground to the yellow color, and then we'll make green as well. And this one, we'll want it to be bright, so what we'll do is pass the foreground bright string as the second argument. And again, this is something that you can see in another section if you're curious how any of this works, but it's not really that important right now. Okay, and actually, since we're gonna to want to probably use these two color functions elsewhere. Let's just uh, define them. We can even define them up at the top of our code just to be sure that we can use this anywhere we want. Okay, so we have our yellow and green functions. So let's say again that uh, we want to color this loading message yellow if it's not at 100% and green if it is at 100%. So all that that's gonna be in this case is we're gonna say let color function equals percentage, and we're gonna to check to see if the percentage is equal to 100%. If it is equal to 100%, then we're gonna want that to be green. Otherwise, we're gonna want that to be yellow. And we could probably make this a little bit more robust again by saying greater than or equal to 100. Okay, and then all we have to do is call this color function, which is either gonna be green or yellow, depending on this logic here, on our loading message. So we'll just say color function, loading, and that should be all we need to do there. All right, so let's give this another try. What we're gonna do is instead of uh, just hard coding the loading message here, we're gonna say get loading message, and we're gonna pass the current percent loaded to that function, which will obviously fill that in and colorize it appropriately. And then we're gonna do the same thing down here. We're gonna change this to get loading message and pass the current percent loaded to that as well. All right, so let's try this again. We're gonna run our code, and sure enough, we'll see that this is yellow and turns green once it's complete. And you know, you might also want to add the string complete to the end of this. 
And the way that you could do that, basically what we could do is we could just uh, remove this and change the logic around. So we would say something like return percentage is greater than or equal to 100. And in the case where it's greater than or equal to 100, we would wanna say green loading percentage. And uh, then we would just say complete like so. So I'll take that from here and paste that up above. There we go. And let me just uh, remove the first green here. Otherwise we would wanna color it yellow and the string there would just be loading dot, dot, dot percentage without the complete, okay? And that should be about it. So that would be our get loading message function. Let's try it again. We're just gonna run our code one more time and we'll see loading, blah, blah, blah. And then when it gets to 100, it changes to green and says complete afterward. All right, so that's pretty much all we need to do there. Oh, the last thing is that we need to actually put the space between loading dot, dot, dot and the percentage just to, uh, Make sure that it looks good. There we go. Run it one more time and we're done. So again, what we've seen here is how to make sure that our animations stay inside the line that we want them in. And this isn't always going to be something we want, right? There might be certain situations where we want the animation to take up multiple lines and clear everything else out of the console before it happens. But anyway, that's something that's up to you. And if you wanted that to be the case, all you would have to do is uh, go into the set interval here and change this read line cursor to function by adding a zero in the Y place. And what you would see is that, well, in our case, that wouldn't work out quite as well because we're writing that other message here. We're writing loading zero and then we're doing the animation, but you get the idea. Okay, so let's just remove that for now. And that should complete our first and fairly simple animation. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to do several different types of animations in the terminal, the last thing that I wanna show you how to do is actually display these animations in association with something that's going on behind the scenes, right? So, you know, when you wanna display something like a loading bar or really any kind of loading animation, obviously this is going to be in a situation where your program is doing some kind of processing and obviously you'll want the progress displayed in the progress bar to reflect how far through a given task you are, right? So if you're um, you know, processing some data and you're halfway through the data, you'll want your progress bar to show that you're halfway through processing the data, obviously. So let's take a look at how something like that might work if we were to use this get progress bar function. Um, and you know, if we were actually doing something like processing files or whatever. And in that case, we obviously wouldn't be using set interval to do all of this, all right? What we would be doing instead is some kind of real asynchronous operation. So what I'm gonna do here to simulate this real asynchronous operation is really just use a series of nested set interval uh, calls in order to you know, simulate what it might look like if we were processing a lot of data or something like that. So um, what I'm gonna do here is use the set timeout function. And I think that I said set timeout earlier, maybe I said set interval, but we're gonna be using set timeout here in order to simulate a long running operation. And all we're gonna do is for each of these, um, we'll just set a certain amount of time, right? So the first one will take maybe 1000 milliseconds. The second one will be something like, uh, you know, let's say that this one takes 1500 milliseconds. So let's say that the next one here, takes, I don't know, let's uh, let's do 2000 milliseconds for this one. And we'll do a few more here. In fact, what we can do is just take these, copy them and paste them inside. And yes, we're ending up with a little bit of callback hell here, but that's kind of the idea, right? All right, so the point of all of this is that each of these set timeout things uh, is just representative of, of some kind of time consuming operation, right? So that could be making a network request, it could be downloading something, it could be processing files, etc. And in this case, we would be assuming that each of them depends on the results of the previous operation, okay? Now in situations like this, we're gonna wanna do, if we're displaying a progress bar, is have the progress bar reflect how far through we really are in this long running task. Now, this is actually a pretty simple thing to do. All we would need to do 
is take all of this code in here, where we set the cursor to and display the progress bar, etc., and put it inside each one of these functions, right? So we would paste that, we would paste that, and you probably get the idea here. Um, and we could use percent loaded or something like that, or we could just pass a number if we wanted to. So we could say something like, and here, let's just get rid of the other progress bar and just do a single progress bar for this example. Uh, so, you know, we could just say that this first one when it finishes is 10%. The next one when it finishes would be, and we'll do the same thing here again, would be something like 20%. And, you know, maybe the next one's 40%, then 50%, then 80%, then 100%, right? Uh, each of these might represent a different portion of the total work that needs to happen as well. But in any case, as you can see, there's quite a bit of repeated code. So what we're usually gonna wanna do in situations like this is just create a separate function, which we'll call something like update progress, something like that. And obviously what we'll want this to do is just take all of this code that was in here. I'm just gonna copy that and put that inside this function. And this update progress thing is obviously gonna have to take a percentage that we'll want to set the progress bar to, all right? And the same operations are gonna happen too, right? We need to set the cursor back to the beginning of the line. We need to clear the line. Then we need to draw a progress bar with the updated percentage. Now, what we don't need to do is uh, increment this percent loaded thing since um, at least in this situation, that's not really something that's necessary. So all we would do in that situation is just say process standard out dot write, and we would write the new progress bar with the updated percentage like so, okay? And in this situation, all we would need to do is inside each of these set timeouts, we would wanna call update progress with the updated percentage. So we could just say update progress. And then for percentage, we would say maybe 10. And then for the next one here, we would just remove all of this and say update progress to 20 perhaps. All right, so we'll say 20. Uh, for the next one, we would have 40. And I'm just kind of making up numbers here. It doesn't really matter too much. For the next one, we might have something like 55. And then maybe this one's a big jump. So we'll say 85. And then this one would be 100, okay? Now what you're gonna see if we run this is that as each of these simulated uh, time-consuming tasks finishes, the progress bar is gonna nicely increase until finally we're done. And uh, we can log something out to the console saying, finished. All right, so let's give that a try. And what we're gonna wanna do here is remove this interval code. You know, you can feel free to comment it out if you want, but I'm just gonna remove it to make it easier. And if we run our code now, what we should see, and oops, it looks like we left this original transferring files thing there. Let's just remove the other loading bar from that as well. There we go. And let's try running it one more time. And sure enough, we'll see that this thing increases only when certain tasks complete, all right? So this gives us, in theory, a better idea of what's actually going on behind the scenes. And then of course it says finished once that completes. So anyway, that's just one way that you can update a progress bar to reflect uh, actual operations that are going on behind the scenes. There are obviously many other ways to do this depending on your needs, but this is definitely one of the simplest ways to go about it. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. One of the most underrated technologies in full stack web development, in my humble opinion, of course, is WebSockets. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in this section. So to give you an idea of what WebSockets are and what they allow us to do, uh, WebSockets allow us to communicate between our front end and back end in a different way than we've been able to do so far just using requests and responses, right? So in the normal way of doing things, right, the uh, non-WebSocket way of doing things, we'll call it, you have the front end, which sends a request to the back end whenever it needs something, and the back end, basically all it can do is respond to that request and uh, handle it in some way, right? Now, what the backend can't generally do without WebSockets, that is, is send messages to the front end directly, right? So let's say that we're building a messaging application and the backend wants to notify the front end that 
the user has a new message. Well, without WebSockets, that's something that we can't do. So anyway, that's what we're going to be learning about here today. We're going to be seeing how WebSockets work in JavaScript, and we're going to be taking a look at a very useful package called Socket.io that brings WebSockets into JavaScript and makes them very easy to use. So without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so before we jump right in and see how to work with WebSockets in Node.js, what I'd like to start off by doing is talking about how exactly WebSockets work and rephrase, by talking about what WebSockets are actually meant to do. So in other JavaScript related rephrase, so in other node related sections, we've seen how to use rephrase. We've seen how to create web servers and REST APIs using libraries like Express, right? Now, when you create a web server, which I'm just going to draw like this, you'll see this symbol used sometimes. Usually when you see a big monolith looking thing, maybe it's got a few lines on it that is just meant to represent a server of some sort. So normally when you have a regular web server that's, you know, maybe running a REST API, the main way that the client side, which I'm going to draw as a computer here, is going to communicate with that server and that REST API by making requests to the server, right? So, uh, you know, let's say that we have our REST API running on our server here for loading products, right? Let's say that we're creating an e-commerce site here, for example. Well, if the client side wants to load those products from the REST API, then what it's gonna do is send a request to the server and that will probably look something like this. It'll send a get request to slash products. Okay. And, you know, obviously this is a simplified version of an e-commerce REST API, but that's the basic idea is that we would send a request to the server. And what the server would do is it would load those products from the database and respond to that initial request with all of the products, right? So you'd end up with a JavaScript array containing presumably quite a few different products that the client would then, you know, display in the browser or whatever. Okay, so that's the basic interaction that goes on when we have a simple RESTful API, all right? So in other words, whenever the client wants some data or whenever the client wants to make some sort of change to data on the server, which by the way, uh, the client would be able to do by sending something like a post request to the server, so if we wanted to, let's say, add a product to our shopping cart, then we would send another request to the server. The server would process that request and respond with some sort of data. Now, one thing to notice about this relationship here is that the client side is really the one that gets to call all the shots, right? So the client side gets to say, hey, server, I need some data. Hey, server, you know, uh, make some changes to this data for me. Hey, server, delete this data, etc." right? So in other words, only the client side can actually initiate these kinds of interactions, right? So in other words, if you were to have your server again, just gonna redraw this to get rid of all of our uh, messy lines there. So in other words, if you were to have a server and uh, you know a client side, and this doesn't have to be a computer, that's just the easiest thing to draw. It could pretty easily be um, you know a, a smartphone or something like that as well. But anyway, if you have a client and a server, the server, generally speaking, can't initiate that interaction, right? The server can't send a request to the client saying, hey client, uh, you didn't actually ask for this, but I have some data for you, right? right? That's just not part of this client-server relationship. It can only go in the other direction where the client says, hey server, I need some data. Server gives that data back to the client. Okay, now this kind of interaction works really well for the vast majority of client server relationships, websites, etc. And you know, you could certainly build an entire full scale web application just using that relationship. But there are a few things that aren't really very easy to do with this setup. Okay, so as a very simple example, let's imagine that we have a chat application here, and this would be the front end. And you know, we would probably have a text box down here at the bottom that someone could type in, and then we'd have a button over here that uh, the user could click to send a message. Well, if we picture our server over here now, 
The client side can pretty easily load the messages from the server, right? It's just gonna make a request to the server saying probably something like get users slash, and then whatever the user's ID is, slash messages, okay? And then what the server would do is obviously, first of all, verify that this is the actual user using some kind of user verification logic. And then it would send back those messages to the client side. And of course the client side could then take those messages and display them here, right? So you might have one message here that you received. You might have a message over here that you sent, etc. Okay. Now, again, the problem with this setup in situations like this is let's say that there's another client connected to the server over here. All right. So there's another client using the same chat app, another user, let's say. And let's say that this user wants to send a message to this user. We'll just call these users one and two respectively. So the way that this user could send a message to this user would simply be by making a request to the server saying, you know, probably something like post messages. And that would include, of course, the text of the message that the user wants to send. The server would process that and it would say, okay, cool, I've received your message. And here's where we run into the problem. Even though this user here has sent a request to the server saying that they want user one to receive a message from them, there's not really any way for the server to directly send that to the other user, right? Again, that's something that the server can't initiate. This, again, the server can't just initiate that interaction. The interaction has to be initiated by the client side. And this sort of interaction here, where you need the ability to communicate both ways between the server and client is where WebSockets come in, right? All right, so WebSockets are gonna enable us to implement something like this that will actually work so that when user two here sends a message to user one, the server can simply say, hey, user one, I got a new message for you, all right? So in other words, what that interaction would look like is this. Let's again say that we have our server here, getting pretty good at drawing this thing, I'd say. And let's say that we have two users that are connected to the server. I'm just gonna draw those as uh, computers here just because that's easier. And we'll say that this is user one and this down here will be user two. Now what WebSockets allow us to do is instead of just having the client send a one-off request to the server and having the server only be able to respond directly to that request, what we do is we establish a connection between the client and the server that's persistent and allows both parties to send data to the other one whenever they want, right? So in other words, um, our client side can send data to the server in this direction and the server, and this is where things are really different than uh, the basic request response architecture, the server can actually send data to the client at any time. Right, as long as this connection here is open, both parties are able to communicate with each other uh, whenever they want. And just for those of you who are curious about the terminology here, this is referred to as a full duplex communication. All right, kind of a nerdy sounding word, but that's what it's called. So what this means is that our server can have multiple clients connected to it at a time. And let's say that user two wants to send a message to user one now, all that they have to do is send that message through this connection. And they could also send this message with a regular post request as well. But you know, since we have this connection open, we'll usually take advantage of it. And the server then will be able to process that and send that message to user one, right? So in other words, as soon as user two sends that message, it's gonna go through this connection, through the service connection with user one, and it's going to appear in their application. So that's what WebSockets allow us to do. They allow the server to send messages to the clients whenever it wants, which allows us to do this kind of real-time communication thing. Okay, so that's the basics of WebSockets, and we're gonna see how to initiate this kind of connection and how to send messages through the connection uh, very shortly. But before we do that, I just wanna point out that there is actually another way without using WebSockets to get around this problem of real-time communication. But to be frank, it's not necessarily a very good one. All right, so again, let's picture we have our server. I'll just draw that real quick one more time. And let's say that we have our two 
clients, user one and user two. And let's say that our server doesn't support WebSockets. So obviously what we would have to do in this case is user one would have to send a request to the server saying, get messages. So the server would respond to that request with the messages and user two would have to do the same thing, right? User two would say, get messages. The server would respond with user two's messages. So at this point, both of our users have loaded their messages, but now let's say that user two wants to send a message to user one. Well, again, that's going to happen by user two sending a post request. Usually it's a post request anyway, to the server. And the server of course is only gonna be able to take that message and save it to the database, right? So, you know, let's say that we have a database over here. The server is going to take that message and put it into the database. So now the data on our back end is up to date. But the problem here is that user one's client doesn't have that updated data, right? So the data that user one here has is the data that was received from the server the first time we loaded the messages. So in other words, user one would actually have to hit the refresh button and that would start this request over again. And that's when user one would see the updated data. Okay, so obviously expecting users to hit the refresh button in a chat application isn't feasible. That, that would really go against the whole idea of a chat application in the first place. So what many applications used to do before the use of WebSockets was widespread was they would just automatically send requests to the server asking for updated data every so often, right? So every second, every five seconds, maybe even every 30 seconds only. So, you know, what you would have is you would have the initial data load, you'd wait a little while, then the application would send that request to the server again to see if anything had changed. The server would respond with updated data, it would wait again, and then it would just keep doing that as long as user one had the application open. Okay, now this is something that's referred to as polling. And it does work because it keeps the data on the client side reasonably in sync with the data that's on the server, right? So at any given point in time, your data on the client side won't be more than, you know, a few seconds out of sync with the data on the server side. However, this really isn't real time communication and, you know, it's really not the best user experience, right? A user having to wait 10 or 30 seconds even to uh, see a new message that another user sent to them isn't really the best user experience when they could have just seen it instantaneously. And another problem with this is that by sending constant requests to the server every so often, if you have a bunch of clients that are all doing that, that can end up putting quite a bit of strain on the server. So anyway, polling is always a possibility if for some reason you can't use WebSockets, but nowadays it's better to use WebSockets. So I just wanted to point this out as a possible alternative and also just so that you appreciate how much easier it is to use WebSockets than it is to use polling. So anyway, that's polling and we also covered the basics of WebSockets. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we're more familiar with some of the benefits of WebSockets and some things that they allow us to do above and beyond just regular requests and responses, the next thing that we're gonna do is see how to actually set up WebSocket connections in Node.js. Now, while it's perfectly possible to set up WebSocket connections in Node.js without any kind of special libraries, it is quite a bit more difficult than just using a library. So what we're gonna be doing here to get ourselves started is using a library called Socket.io. Now the Socket.io library is very, very popular. And really it just makes the process of setting up WebSocket connections much easier. Now that being said, there are actually two different Socket.io packages. There's one for the client side, which is called Socket.io client. We'll be seeing that in just a minute. And there's one for the server side which is just called socket IO. So anyway, there's two different packages that we're gonna have to install in, into our NPM projects, depending on whether that project is meant to be a client or a server. And just as a side note here, we're usually not gonna install both of these into the same project. 
All right, so this is the package that we're gonna be using to actually set up a WebSocket connection and you know send communication through it. So what we're gonna be doing here in order to get an idea of how the Socket IO packages work is we're gonna be setting up two separate programs. The first is going to be the client side program. Okay, so this will be, um, well here, I guess I'll draw it as a computer. This will be the client side program that actually initiates that connection with the server. And then we're gonna have the server program that will run continuously and handle socket connections. Okay, so generally whenever you're building an application that incorporates web sockets, you're gonna have these two separate parts of your application, right? The client and the server. And by the way, the client doesn't actually have to be a web browser or you know, a computer application. It can actually just be a Node.js script that's running in the background um, or, you know, a command line application or something like that. I'm just drawing it as a computer to make the distinction between client and server. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be setting up an application that's gonna involve two separately running pieces of code, the client side code and the server side code. And what we're gonna do is build a very simple chat application that will allow two clients, which we're gonna simulate just by opening up two separate terminals, to send messages to each other by establishing a socket connection with the server, all right? And simply sending messages through them, which the server will send on to the other client. Okay, so it's gonna be a pretty straightforward application, but it's also gonna really give us a good idea of how to establish WebSocket connections and how to send messages through them, as well as how to actually handle those messages on the server and on the client side. Okay, so let's start off here by building the server side of our application. And in order to do that, what we're first gonna have to do is set up a project, all right? So I'm currently working in just one big folder that contains all of my JavaScript example code. So what you can do if you want to is just create a new folder wherever you like to keep your JavaScript code. And, you know, I'm just going to do that in the terminal and create a new folder, which we'll call WebSockets, okay? So I'm gonna hit enter, and then I'm going to change directories into WebSockets. And I'm gonna open that up in my IDE now by saying code dot, and that will open up that folder for me. Now, if any of these commands don't work for you, that's something that you can set up through Visual Studio Code if you're using it. Or, you know, you could always just create this new folder and open it up by doing file open, all right? So whatever you're most comfortable with, go ahead and do that. The important thing is that you just have a new project uh, that's empty that we can start writing our code inside of. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do in this project is the same thing that we normally do in most JavaScript projects. And that is we're going to initialize it as a new NPM package by saying npm init dash y, and that will create the package.json file for us. And once we've done that, we're gonna install our first package, which will be the socket IO package, all right? All right, and the socket IO package, which you can install by saying npm install socket.io, this is the server side package. The client side package is socket IO dash client, okay? So let's start off though, just by installing the socket IO server side package. And once we've done that, let's also install the express package, which is what we're gonna be using to create a server, right? So in order to establish a socket connection, you actually have to have a web server that socket IO can sort of wrap around, so to speak. You'll see what that looks like in just a minute here, but let's also install the express package here. So now that we've done that, we can actually start creating our server side code. So let's create a new folder, which we'll call server. And then inside this folder, we'll just create a new file called index.js. And just in case you're wondering, uh, we are gonna write client side code as well. And for that, we'll just say client as a folder and create index.js in there. And actually it's gonna be easier for us here if we, if we just create uh, two different files. So I'm gonna delete that uh, folder and file I just created. We're just gonna create two different files with those names. So we'll say server.js and we'll create a new file called client.js. That's just gonna make it easier because, because our project's probably not gonna get that big where we'll need an entire directory structure. Okay, so let's start off in our server.js file. The first thing that we're gonna need to do here is 
set up a basic express server. Now you may or may not have seen the sections where we talked about how to work with Express and Node.js. If you haven't seen those, don't worry too much about it, but you will wanna go back and take a look at those at some point. So setting up an Express server is gonna look like this. We're just gonna say import Express from Express. And in order for this import syntax to work, you may or may not have to go into your package.json file and add type module to it. All right, and this is gonna depend on what version of Node.js you're using. So if you get an error about the line that says import, you'll know that that's probably the reason why and that's the way to fix it, okay? So now that we've imported Express, the way that we create our app is by simply saying let app equals Express, okay? So we're just gonna call Express as a function and that will create a new Express app for us. Okay, and once we've created that Express app, we're gonna tell it to listen by saying app.listen. And instead of specifying an exact port number here, we're actually going to say process.environment.port. And this will allow us to pass in the port number that we want as an environment variable later on if we want to. But we'll also just provide a default value of 8080 for if that environment variable isn't specified, okay? And once we've done that, we're just gonna wanna have a callback function here that will log something out to the console like server is listening on port and then we'll insert the value of that port by saying process.env.port. All right, so now that we've got an Express app up and running, let's just test this out to make sure it works so far by saying node and then we'll say server.js and hit enter. And as you can see, because of the version of Node.js that I'm using, I get this cannot use import statement outside a module. So as I said before, we just need to go into package.json, change this to type module. And once we save that, we should be able to run our code again, okay? And there we go, we see server is listening on port undefined, but that's just because process.env.port doesn't exist. So we'll say, or, 8080, okay? And I'll just put parentheses around that to make sure that uh, that gets interpreted correctly. So let's run this again, and sure enough, we'll see server is listening on port 8080. Awesome, so now that we've got our Express server set up, we can actually add socket IO to our server. Now the way to do this is first of all to import something from the socket IO package, and that's something that we're gonna be importing is a capital S server and you need to import it as a named import with these uh, curly braces around it. And we're gonna say from socket.io for that. Okay, so now that we've imported this server thing, what we need to do is we need to use it to create a sort of wrapper around our current Express server so that we'll be able to accept and establish WebSocket connections from clients. So all we need to do in order to make that happen is say let io equals new server, and then we're going to pass the Express app as an argument to this constructor. Okay, and that's all we really need to do in order to add socket IO and the ability to establish connections with clients to our server. So now that we've got that all set up and let's just try running this again, just to make sure it all works and we don't get a syntax error. Ah, and it looks like it doesn't work and we're getting an error. Oh, you know why we're getting this error? That's because I forgot an intermediate step here, and that is that we actually have to create another layer around our Express app using Node.js's HTTP package. So don't worry too much about this little detail here, just make sure that you do it, because obviously it doesn't work without it. You're just gonna have to import the HTTP package from Node.js, which is you know just a regular built-in package for working with network requests and things like that. And what we're gonna need to do is use this HTTP package to create a basic node server around our Express app. And what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say let server equals HTTP.createServer app. And then we're going to wrap this server with Socket.io's capital S server, all right? So we're gonna say new server server, and then it needs to be the server that says server.listen. Now, really the only reason that we have to do this is just because uh, Socket.io is set up to work with basic HTTP servers 
from Node, and it's not set up to work with any specific server such as Express, all right? So don't worry too much about that detail again. Uh, just know that this should make our code work now. So let's try running it again. And sure enough, what we should see is that it says server is listening on port 8080. All right, so now that we've got that set up and it doesn't really do very much right now, we have to actually set up the client side first. Let's move over and set up the client side. Okay, so first of all, what we're gonna need to do is install the socket IO client package. And the way that we do that is by saying npm install socket.io dash client. Okay, so we're installing that into the same project, but it's gonna be a different script that ends up uh, using that package. And once we've done that, we're going to open up client.js and import that package. All right, now the way that this is gonna work, we're gonna have to start off by importing the socket IO client package from socket.io dash client. And then we're gonna have to use this package to create a connection to our server that we can then start to send messages through and listen for messages from. Now, the way that that works is we're simply going to create a new socket by saying let socket equals, and then we're gonna say socket IO client, and we're gonna need to pass a URL here for the server that we want to connect to. Now, in this case, it's just gonna be the URL of our server as it's running, which will be on localhost port 8080. But in this case, we actually have to specify the IP address, which is 127.0.0.1. Okay, and that's gonna be port 8080, so colon 8080. And that should create a connection to our server. Now, one thing to note is, is that this actually isn't an asynchronous function. It's just going to establish that connection for us and give us this socket. And uh, that's pretty much all we need to do to create a socket connection with the client side. Okay, so at this point we have both a client file and a server.js file. And the next thing that we're gonna be taking a look at is how to actually set up and listen for messages on that connection. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've set up the basic code for our client and server, the next thing that we're gonna have to do is once we've established a connection, which we're doing by calling socket IO client on our client side, we're gonna want our client and our server to respond to events that the other party sends, right? So the first and most important event that we're gonna want to listen for on our server is the connection event. This is the event that happens whenever a new client establishes a socket connection with the server. So the way that we add a listener for events that, that come from clients on our server is by saying IO, right? That's this thing that we created here with the capital S server that we imported from socket IO. We're gonna say IO.on, and for the connection event, we're just gonna say connection, okay? And this function here works pretty much like you would expect it to. Whenever this event occurs, what it's gonna do is call the callback function that we pass to it as the second argument, okay? So what we can do inside here is say console.log, a new client has connected, okay? And that's all we really need to do there. So in other words, whenever a new client connects to the server, we should see this message logged out to the console. So let's test this now. What we're gonna do is we're going to open two separate consoles, one for the client and one for the server. All right, so this one will be for the server. We'll say node server.js and that should start our server running. And then over in our other terminal here, we're gonna run the client script. So we'll say node client Dot JS. And when we hit enter, what we should see, if we go back to our server, is that it says a new client has connected. All right, so at this point, our client and our server are successfully connected to one another, and that means that they can start sending messages to each other, which is pretty cool. So first of all, let's talk about how to listen for messages on the client side and how to send messages from the server side. So the way that we listen for messages from the client side is actually quite simple. All we need to do is say socket.on, 
And the first argument that we pass to this function is gonna be the name of the event that we wanna listen for, right? So let's say that when our client has successfully connected to a server with socket IO, we want the server to send a message with a greeting, right? Our server is just gonna say, hello, new client or something like that. Well, in that case, the event that the server is gonna send would probably be called something like greeting. And by the way, we can choose the names of these events ourselves, as long as they don't interfere with existing events like connection um, in socket IO. All right, so what we're gonna do is whenever a greeting event comes through that socket connection, we're gonna call this callback function. And for now, we'll just say console.log and we'll log out something like the server says, hello. Okay, so again, what this will do is after the socket connection is established, whenever we receive a greeting event from the server through that connection, our client side code is going to run this callback function and we should see this printed to the console. So the next question is how do we actually have the server send this event through the connection? Well, in order to do that, what we're gonna need to do is take a look at the socket argument that gets passed to this callback function on the server. All right, so when a new connection is created on our server, when a new socket connection is established, that is, and this connection event occurs, this callback function is going to be called, but it's actually gonna be called with an argument called socket. Now this socket argument is basically just a reference to, to the client that just connected. And it's sort of similar to the response object in express applications that we can use to send back a response to the client side, right? So, you know, we can say response.send in express and use that to send some kind of data back to the client side after a request. And just like we can do that, we can use this socket argument in socket IO to send messages to the client. Okay, so what this is gonna look like after the client connects and we print out a new client has connected. If we wanna send a greeting event to the client, all we need to do is say socket.emit greeting, okay? Now this socket.emit is the socket IO equivalent, so to speak, of response.send in express, in that it's just gonna send this event through the connection, and when our client side receives that, it's gonna take a look and see if it has any listeners for that event, and if it does, it's going to call the corresponding callback function, okay? And since we have this greeting event here, and that's the event that we're emitting here, this should work out just the way we want it to. All right, so let's give this a try. We're gonna to need to restart our server. All right, so we'll just stop that here, and we'll stop our client as well, and we'll restart our server, and now when we run our client side code, what we should see is our client will connect and sure enough, it will print out the server says hello, meaning that we just received that greeting event from the server, okay? So now that we know how to send basic events from the server to the client, the next thing that you're probably wondering is, is it possible to send data along with an event so that our server could actually send this message instead of us just having that hard coded in our client side code? Well, the answer to that, I'm happy to say, is yes. And it's actually quite a simple thing to do. All we need to do is when we say socket.emit, we simply pass a second argument here that will be extra data that gets picked up by the client side. Okay, so what we could do is say, you know, something like, hello, client. And then inside the client side, the way that we can access that extra data is by getting it from this callback function's arguments, right? So we can just call that data or whatever we want. And let's just log that out and see what happens, okay? So if we stop our client side here, and we'll also stop our server and restart it, what we're gonna do is run our client again. And sure enough, we'll see that it logs out hello client, right? Which is an event with data that we just received from the server. Cool, so at this point, we're able to establish that socket IO connection between our client and our server, and we're able to send events from the server to the client. So the next question is, how do we have our client send messages to the server, and how do we have our server respond to those messages? Well, I'm happy to say that it's actually quite easy to send messages from the client side. All you have to do is say socket.emit, just like we did on the server, and you know, 
just like on the server, we can specify what event it is we're sending back. So let's call this one something like return greeting or something like that. And then back on our server, the way that we listen for that is by saying socket dot on return greeting. And this is gonna be just like we saw when it was reverse and the server was sending the event and the client side was picking that up. We're just gonna have a callback function with any data. And what we'll do is we'll say console.log and we'll say something like uh, in backticks here, we'll say the client says, and then we'll print out that data, okay? And back on the client side, we'll, uh, we'll change this here just to be a little bit more clear what's going on. We'll say the server says data. And then for our socket.emit return greeting, we'll include the data, hello server. Cool, so let's restart both our server side and our client side one more time here. We're going to just stop both of those and restart the server. Okay, so we see servers listening on port 8080. So now let's restart the client side. And what we should see is that we get a little bit of back and forth. We see that it says the server says, hello client. And back on the server, we see a new client has connected. That's when the initial connection happens. And then we see that it says the client says, hello server. All right, so at this point, we're able to send data back and forth between the client side and the server side whenever we want. And the really important thing to understand here is unlike a regular REST API or you know a request response driven server, our server can now send data back to the client whenever it wants. So, you know, if we wanted to wait a few seconds and send some sort of other event, right? So we could say set timeout. Um, and then inside here, we would say socket.emit. And let's send another greeting, I suppose. And we'll say hello again. And let's say that we want this to happen after, I don't know, eight seconds or so. Okay, so that would be 8,000 milliseconds. Well, what's gonna happen is if we restart these things, we'll just restart our server and we'll restart our client as well. What we're gonna see is that after eight seconds, so just give it a little while, and what we should see is that after eight seconds, we get this message, the server says, hello again. All right, and this is the main technique by which we can receive regular updates directly from the server without our client side having to pull the server continuously, right? So um, while we just use set timeout here, this could easily be another user actually sending a message to the user at some point in time, okay? So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we know how to set up a basic socket connection between a client and a server. We know how to send events from the server to the client and from the client to the server. And we also know how to handle those events. So at this point, we know enough about working with socket IO to actually build a very simple chat room application. All right, so what we're gonna wanna do here is when we run this client side program, the program itself is gonna use Node.js's read line package. And if you're not familiar with that, don't worry too much. You'll see how that works in just a minute here. But it's gonna use Node.js's read line package to continuously get input from the console. All right, so, you know, it'll just have a prompt here, like type a new message and hit enter to send. And whenever we send that message, that message will be received and displayed by all of the other clients that are currently connected to the server, right? So what we're gonna do is just open up a few more terminals and run this same script, right? Which will create several instances of this client program that will all be connected to the same server. All right, so first of all, let's just set up the basic read loop for the client. And as I said, we're gonna be using the read line package from Node.js. So we'll just say import read line from read line. And once we've done that, we're going to set up a read line interface, which is gonna look like this. We're gonna say, let rl equals read line dot create interface. And we're gonna pass a configuration object to this that will say input, and that will be the standard in. 
and we need to say process.standard in there. And we're gonna say output process.standard out. Okay, now if you're wondering what I just did there and you haven't worked with the read line package at all before, all that we're doing here is creating a simple read line interface that we can use to continuously display prompts in the terminal uh, for the user to type things into and it will allow us to see what the user is typing in as a response, right? So this is what we're gonna use to allow the user to send messages. All right, so once we've set that up, we're gonna create a loop that will allow the client to keep typing in messages and sending them. And actually right now I'm realizing that I did all of this in the wrong file. This should all be on the client side. So hopefully uh, you caught that. If not, don't worry, I didn't catch that either apparently. And let's just remove that from there. Okay, so what this loop is gonna look like is after we establish the connection with the server, we're just gonna create a while loop. We'll say while true. Okay, so it's just gonna keep going and keep waiting for input from the user. And what we're gonna do is use this read line interface that we just created by saying rl.question. All right, this allows us to display a prompt to the user. And we're gonna say something like enter a message and hit return to send. Okay, and we'll leave a space after that so that the user can start typing their message. All right, now the way that this question thing works is when the user enters in a response to this prompt, we can get that inside our callback function here. So we'll see response, and we can use that response in some way. Now, what we're gonna wanna do with this is we're gonna want to actually send that response to the server so that the server can send it to all of the other currently connected clients. But before we do that, the callback version of rl.question actually won't work out very well for us. So what we're gonna wanna do instead is use promises, which, which assuming that you're using a version of Node that's 17 or greater, I believe that I'm currently using Node 18. Let me just take a look here and see what my Node version is. Yep, I'm currently using Node 18.2. Uh, you can actually just say import all as read line from Node read line slash promises, okay? So that will allow us to use promises for this instead of having to use the callback way, which makes it kind of difficult to use with a while loop. All right, so all we have to do now is say, let response equals rl.question, and we need the await keyword before that in order for that to work. And then what we're gonna do is once we've gotten the user's message, we're gonna send that to the server by saying socket.emit, and let's come up with a new event. We'll call it new message. And we're gonna send that response along with that new message event, okay? Now, before this will actually work, we do need to wrap this inside an asynchronous function because we're using the await keyword. And by the way, if the async await stuff doesn't make sense to you, don't worry too much about it. Just know that whenever we use the await keyword, we have to wrap that in some sort of async function. So what we'll do is we're gonna say async function and we'll call this start app. And we'll put our while loop inside of there. And we'll call this start app function down here at the bottom, okay? Now, let's remove this socket.onGreeting stuff because we don't need that right now. What we're gonna wanna do instead is listen for new messages that we get from the server. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say socket.on and let's call this other event incoming message. All right, so this will be just a, a new message that's coming from the server. And when we have that new message, what we're gonna do is just log that out to the console. All right, so we'll say something like received a new message and we'll print out that message that we just received. Okay, and that's pretty much all we need to set up. So let's test out this client here. And uh, well, before we do that, let's actually set up our server to listen for the new message event. So what we'll do is just remove this greeting thing. We'll remove the socket.onReturn greeting and we'll remove this set timeout. And what we'll replace that with is socket.onNewMessage. In that case, what we're gonna do is we'll just say something like console.log and we'll have the server say the client says 
and then we'll just print out the message there, okay? Now, this isn't quite complete yet because we're gonna have to have the server broadcast this new message to all of the currently connected clients, which I'll show you how to do in a minute, but this should at least tell us if everything is working well. So let's try running our server and our client side again. What we're gonna do is stop our server and restart it, and we'll start our client program with node client.js. And the first thing that we should see is our prompt that says enter a message and hit return to send. So let's say, hello server. And when we hit enter, we should see that prompt appear again. We're just gonna keep seeing that. And if we go back to our server program, we should see that it says, the client says, hello server. All right, so if we keep sending messages from the client side, hey, hello, are you there? That should have been a question mark, but you get the idea. If we go back to our server, we're gonna see that each of those events successfully came through and we see the client says, hey, the client says, hello, the client says, are you there? Cool, so the last thing that we're gonna to need to do here in order to make the messages that our clients send get broadcast to all currently connected clients is whenever our server receives a new message event, we're gonna have it broadcast an incoming message event to all of the clients. All right, so the way that we emit an event that will get picked up by all currently connected sockets is a little bit different than the way that we emit an event that will only be picked up by an individual socket, right? If we were to say socket.emit uh, incoming message when we receive a new message event from a given client, then what would happen is only the client that sent this new message event would receive this incoming message event, right? That's what the socket.emit function does. So if we restart our server here, and I don't think we'll have to restart our client, it should just automatically receive a connection. Yep, sure enough, we see a new client has connected. If we send a new request through here now, like, hey, we'll see that it prints out received a new message, hey. This is actually getting printed in a weird spot, right? So we'll have to fix that. The point here is that this client is getting that message, but if we were to open up another terminal and run this client side code again, oops, uh, I wanna run node client.js here. All right, so if this client were to send that message, let's say, hey again, we'll see that again, we received this new message, hey, but on this other client, we won't have received anything, okay? So the way that we broadcast a socket IO event to all currently connected sockets is instead of saying socket.emit, we simply say io.emit, okay? So let's try this again. What we're gonna do is disconnect both of our clients, right? We'll just kill both of those programs like so with control C and we'll restart our server now and reconnect both those clients by running the program. So node client.js and node client.js. And first of all, what you'll see on the server is that we have two new clients that have just connected. So that's exactly what we wanted. And now if we send a message from one client, we'll say something like, hello, is anybody there? We should see that this client received that message and also our other client received that message as well. Okay, so both of our clients received that message. Okay, so, in this situation, what we did is whenever we receive a new message, we simply broadcasted that message to all currently connected sockets, right? All currently connected clients, even the one that sent the message in the first place. Now, that might not be what we wanna do, right? We might wanna send the message to all of the clients except the client that actually sent the message in the first place. So in that situation, what we would wanna do is, is instead of saying io.emit, we would say socket dot broadcast.emit, all right? So we have socket.emit, which sends it to a single socket. We have io.emit, which sends it to all currently connected sockets. And we have socket.broadcast.emit, which sends it to all other sockets besides this one. Okay, so let's try this one more time. We're gonna restart our server like so. And we should see that our two clients automatically connect for us, which is one of the nice things that socket IO will automatically do by default. And let's try sending a message from our first client here. We'll say, yes, I am here. And what we'll see is that no message gets printed out on this client, but if we go to our other client, we'll see that it says received a message, yes, I am here, okay? 
So anyway, we now have a pretty cool little chat application. It's very simple and it allows multiple clients to all send messages to each other in real time using WebSockets. Now, the exciting part about this is that everything we learned about building clients just in a basic Node.js program is also going to apply to front-end programs such as, you know, if you're building a React application or an Angular application, or, you know, even if you're just building a basic vanilla JavaScript application, for the front end. All of this stuff is still going to apply except for the read line create interface. All that you're going to do in that case is just replace this with some kind of text input that the user can enter messages into and hit send. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to do is whenever we receive a new message, we just want to add a new line for that. So we'll just add the new line character. And after that, we'll just reprint out this prompt, right? We don't need to call rl.question again. We just need to print that out again. So we'll just say um, console.log, enter a message and hit return to send like so. And hopefully that will make it look a little better. So let's try this again. We're going to restart our client side. All right, so we'll restart both of these here with control C and run node client.js. We'll do the same thing here. Oops, let me try that again. There we go. And let's try sending a message. We'll say hello, and hit enter. And if we go to our other terminal, we should see that it says received a new message, hello, and then it says enter a message and hit return to send. Oh, and actually just to make this look a little better so that the cursor doesn't start off on another line, we want it to start off on the same line, we'll just change console.log here to process.standardout.write. Okay, and that should keep us on the same line. So let's just try this one more time. We'll just exit out of both of these and restart them. Let's try this once again. And if we send a message that says hello and go to our other client, we should see that says received a new message, hello. And we have this prompt now that appears underneath again. We'll say, hey, and we see that we get that same thing on our other client now. Cool, so this has been a pretty in-depth introduction to how WebSockets work. And hopefully by now you're appreciating not only some of the things that they allow us to do, but but also how simple and intuitive it is to work with these things, right? Literally all that the socket IO package requires you to do is send messages on one side and listen for messages on the other side, right? So it's really just a network of clients and servers listening for messages coming from one another. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. When most developers think about creating a basic web server using Node.js, they tend to think about libraries, right? Such as uh, Express.js or Koa.js or Happy.js is another library for simplifying the process of creating servers. However, using a library actually isn't 100% necessary to create a server using Node.js, right? That is, you can do this perfectly fine without installing any external libraries with NPM. And that's what we're going to take a look at here today. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at how to build a basic web server using Node.js's built-in HTTP package. And this is a package that's included with Node.js. So as I said before, you don't have to install it. And this really forms the foundation that a lot of these other libraries such as Express are built off of. So in other words, by being able to build a vanilla Node.js server, as we're going to learn how to do here, you're gonna be able to have a better understanding of how Node.js servers work and what the underlying code looks like behind all of these libraries that are so commonly used. So without further ado, let's jump right in and see how to start creating web servers with Node.js. All right, so what we're gonna do first here is set up a simple project that we'll be writing all of our code inside of. So uh, what you're gonna to wanna to do first is just create a new empty directory. I've called mine node server here, but you can call it anything you want really. And we're gonna initialize this as an NPM package by saying NPM init dash Y. And this is likely something that you've seen before. 
all that this is doing is it's generating a package.json file for us that will allow us to keep track of certain details about our projects, such as the version. Uh, some of these other fields are for if we want to publish this package to NPM so that other people can use it. And we also have scripts, which we'll be seeing how to use later on in order to create shortcuts to actually get our server up and running. Cool, so now that we've done that, the next thing that we're gonna do is create a new directory that we'll be writing our code inside of. And it's not strictly necessary that we create a new directory here, which by the way, we're gonna call source. But I've always found that as projects grow in size and complexity, having all of your source code inside its own labeled directory it can make the project just a lot easier to manage than when it's mixed in with all of the other configuration files, etc. Okay, so anyway, let's create a new file inside of our source directory, and we can call this file either index.js or server.js or main.js. There's a lot of different common names for this file, and you know, if you look online in different forums or different examples, you'll see that people tend to use all of them. But I usually see that server.js is the most commonly used name alongside things like index.js, so we're just gonna use server.js here for the time being. Cool, and that's pretty much all the setup that we need to do for this project, right? That's one of the nice things about just uh, basically working with vanilla node code, so to speak, is that, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of setup required. All you really need to do is create one or two files and get going, and even this package.json thing that we generated isn't strictly necessary. You could, if you wanted to, just create a single server.js file and just write all your server code inside there and run it, and, and that would be perfectly fine. But because this project is going to get bigger and bigger over time for us, um, I wanted to go through just the, the initial very few uh, setup steps before we started writing our code. Cool, so now that we have our project, we can actually start creating a Node server. Node servers are created using Node.js's built-in HTTP package and the HTTP package basically it just contains a lot of different methods and that sort of thing for creating servers setting them up and defining how they behave so the first thing that we're gonna want to do in this file is import the HTTP package and depending on your settings you're gonna import that either using the require keyword or the import keyword um, the require keyword would look something like this we would just say const HTTP equals require HTTP. All right, and that would import the HTTP package for us. The way that you would do this using import syntax would be by saying import HTTP from HTTP. But in order to make that work, you would actually have to go into the package.json file and add type module to this file. And that would make that work, all right? Now, since I've already added that to package.json, I'm just gonna use the import syntax because you know I find that it's just a little bit easier to work with. So anyway, now that we've imported the HTTP package, we're gonna create a simple HTTP server. And the way that we do that, well, let me ask you, if you had to guess what the method would be for creating a server in Node.js, what do you think it would be? Well, if you guessed HTTP.createServer, you would be correct. That is the Node.js method for creating a new web server. And uh, basically we can just call this thing as a method and that will create a new server for us. And what we'll usually do is we'll want to assign this server to a variable so we can just say let server equals HTTP.createServer. And that's how we create a server. So it's pretty straightforward. And once we've created our server, the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is have our server start listening for requests, right? The entire point of creating a web server in the first place is usually just to have this little server running here. And generally you'll have a lot of clients, whether that's someone on a computer or a smartphone or whether that's another server or just some script that's running and making a request. But anyway, all of these clients are going to be making requests to the server and the server is going to have to basically process those requests and respond usually with some kind of data as well. So that's gonna be the purpose of a server, but in order for the server to be able to actually intercept these requests in the first place, we need to tell it to listen. And the way that we do that, let me just ask you again, if you had to guess 
what would be the method that we would need to call in Node.js for having our server start listening? Well, if you guessed server.listen, you would be correct. Now this method, we have to pass an argument to it. And what this argument does is it specifies what specific port our server will be listening on, right? Right. So the usual values for this are like 8,000 or 8080 or, uh, well, the default port for HTTP is port 80. But, you know, for development purposes, we'll usually do port 8,000 or port 8080. We'll just do 8080 since, since that I believe is the most common one to use for development. And that will basically tell our server to start listening on port 8080. All right. So these are really the three lines that are required for setting up a node server and starting it. And if we run our program right now by saying node server.js, and actually we're going to need to say node source slash server.js, what we'll see is that basically nothing happens right now in the background. What's going on is the server is listening because of that. The program won't end unless we specifically tell it to, or unless some kind of error occurs. So you can stop this program by pressing control C and that will end the program. Cool. So anyway, that's how we get a server up and running. Currently our server doesn't really do anything though, right? Uh, you know, as we said before, the entire point of most web servers is to listen for requests and be able to handle those requests and send back some sort of response. And currently our server doesn't really do any of that, right? If we try and send a request to our server, let's just run it again and go over and open up a new tab and just paste localhost 8080. What we're going to see is that we just get this little spinner thing in the top that goes around and around and around and around because basically what's happening here is our browser is trying to send a request to localhost 8080, which, which by the way, is where our server is currently running and accepting requests. But since we haven't told our server to actually respond with anything, our browser is just sitting there and waiting for the server to respond and it's never going to. So eventually our browser will just give up and say, could not connect or something like that. You'll get some kind of error message here. All right. So the next thing that we're going to want to do is make sure that our server is actually responding to requests. So the way that we do that is actually by passing a callback function when we create a new server, right? We pass a callback function to HTTP.createServer. And of course we can either define that inside the parentheses itself by just saying function, blah, blah, blah. Or we can define it separately by saying something like uh, function on request. And then we could do anything inside here that we want, right? We could say received a request. Okay, so let's just try that. What we're gonna do is just pass this on request function to our create server function as an argument, right? This is going to be the callback function that gets called when we receive a request. And in order to see the changes here, what we're going to need to do is stop our server and restart it. Okay. So in order to see any changes to your node server, you're going to need to stop it. And there are ways around this. There are, you know, certain coding constructs that you can use to automatically reload your code without having to restart the server. But you know, we're not going to get into that right now. First things first. So let's restart our server. And again, we're not going to see anything happen. So now let's go back to our browser and hit refresh. And we're going to see that it still does that little spinny thing. However, You'll also see now that if you go back to the terminal where we ran our server, it says received a request. All right. So this callback function that we just defined here is logging this out and that's about all it's doing, right? We're still not sending back some kind of response or acknowledgement to the client. So again, you're going to see that the client is just continuously loading and it says the site can't be reached, blah, blah, blah. So. In order to send back a response, what you're going to need to do is actually add arguments to this function here to the callback. And those two arguments are going to be a request argument and a response argument. Now we'll go into a lot more detail on both of these shortly, but for now, all you need to know is that in order to send back a response to the client, when you receive a request, you just need to say response dot end. And then inside here, you, you can include any kind of string data or message that you want. So what we're going to do here is just say hello from Node.js, and that's it. So let's restart our server in order to make that take effect. And 
Once we've done that, we're gonna go back to our browser and hit reload. And now we'll see hello from Node.js and we no longer have that little spinny thing. And by the way, you're gonna notice here that I have this little view symbol as the fave icon in my tab. That's just because view applications run on localhost 8080. And uh, since the browser isn't getting a fave icon from our server, obviously, since we just created it, it's just keeping that as the default. So just ignore that. You'll probably have something a little different. You'll probably have that little world icon or something like that. Cool, so the last thing that I wanna do here before we move on is have our server actually print out some kind of text indicating that it's listening for requests, right? Because it's a little unnerving when you run a node program like this and you just don't see anything happen. You don't know if you're waiting for something to happen or if something's processing in the background, etc. So what you can do is when you call this server.listen function, you can actually add a second argument, which is gonna be a callback function that we can use to print out some kind of message. So what I'm gonna do is just create a function down here that we'll call something like on listen. And what we'll do here is just say console.log and we'll print out the message server is listening on port 8080. And that's it. Cool. So. Let's just pass the onListen function now as an argument to server.listen. And if we restart our code now, we should see that sure enough, it prints out server is listening on port 8080. And that just gives us a little bit more information so that we're sure that everything is going well and we're sure that the server has actually started successfully. All right, so that's the basics of creating a very, very simple vanilla node server. The next thing that we're gonna see is how to actually implement some more complex logic and do things like handle requests. We'll see what these two objects really are here and some of the other methods and properties that they contain. And that's about it. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to set up a very simple vanilla node server and actually have it respond to requests with a little message here, the next thing that we're gonna do is take a closer look at these request and response objects here that we're getting passed as an argument to our on request callback. And uh, we're gonna see how to use these things to really make our server do a little bit more. So first of all, these two arguments here are objects that contain a variety of different properties and methods that we can call in order to really customize the behavior of our server. So just to give you an example, if we have our server running, and uh, let's say we go back here and send a request from localhost 8080, well, we've already seen that we get this response, hello from Node.js. However, this is also gonna happen if we say localhost 8080 slash hello, for example, and hit enter. We'll see that we get back that same response and the same thing is gonna be true if we say blah, 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 and hit enter. We'll see that we get that same request. So basically what's going on here is, is no matter what this path is after localhost 8080, as long as the beginning is localhost 8080, our server is going to receive that request and process it, right? So in other words, our server isn't really distinguishing between different paths. And in general, this is something that we will wanna do when we create things like REST APIs or even when we create a simple server just for sending back files. All right, so in order to access this path from inside our server callback, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this request object right here, right? So this request argument is basically an object that just contains a lot of different information about the request we received, right? So it contains things like the path, which is in request.url, it contains the method, right? So if it's a post request or a get request or a delete request, etc., that will be under request.method and so on and so forth. As you can imagine, there's a lot of data that this request object can contain, right? So it can also contain things like if there was a request body that was sent along from the client, that's where we'll find it. You get the idea, okay? So just to make things a little bit more interesting, let's actually print out some of the data that this request object contains. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna modify this console.log and we'll say console.log 
and we'll use back ticks here to make it easier for ourselves to insert data. And we'll just say something like received a request. And what we'll do is we'll print out the request method, right? So this is gonna be get, post, put, etc. And for that, we'll just say request.method. And then we'll print out the path for the request, right? That's just the uh, part of the URL that doesn't include the localhost 8080 or whatever the host name is. So let's say dollar sign curly braces and we'll say request dot URL, all right? That's the property that we use to access the path and that's it. So let's restart our server now. And what we should see is whenever we send a request, we now have that path along with the request method. All right, so we see that we have get and then slash ASDF, blah, 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 blah. Basically whatever we typed in. Now, another thing that you're gonna see here is that in addition to this request that we're actually manually sending, we're also getting this request that's looking for a fave icon. And that's something that the browser is going to automatically send whenever we type something into the browser, right? So this file here is generally a file that sites provide when they want to customize what the browser displays up here in the corner, right? So, you know, if you go to Google, for example, you'll have that little G in the corner here instead. So anyway, this is just the browser automatically requesting this thing. So generally we'll just want to ignore this unless we really do want our server to return one of these things, in which case we'll just need to add a fave icon uh, to our project, all right? So anyway, now that we can see what path is being requested from our server, we can actually start to handle things a little bit differently. And that's something that we're gonna see how to do uh, in a little more detail shortly. But let's just try this with a few different paths, right? Maybe we want to send a request to slash hello, in which case we would see that our server would say received a request, get hello. If we just send something like slash API slash users, for example, we'll see that this will have slash API slash users and so on, right? So you probably get the idea. And um, you know, what we can actually do if we wanna build something like a REST API is use this data, right? So we can use the URL and the method in order to actually handle different requests differently depending on where those requests went to, right? So if you wanna think of these two pieces of data, right? Like the uh, method here and the path as just ways for the client to communicate to the server what it's trying to do, that's more or less what's going on here. So um, anyway, that's how we use the request object. And again, the request has a lot more data that we'll see how to handle later on. Uh, but let's take a look at this response object. So the response object is a little bit different from the request object because its main purpose isn't necessarily to provide us with information about the response like the uh, request object's purpose is to provide us with information about the request. Its purpose is more to give us a series of methods that we can use to actually send back a response to the client side. So uh, what we saw here is by calling response.end with some kind of data, we were able to just send that back to the client. So this is how we tell the server what data we wanna send back to the client. And generally you're limited to sending back string data or you know, there's, there's a few other types, but, but you can't just directly try and send back a JSON object, for example, right? If you try and say name Sean, and let's restart our server here. What you'll see is if we try and send a request here now, we'll end up getting an error, right? It'll say uh, something like the chunk argument must be of type string or an instance of buffer or blah, blah, blah and it says that it received an instance of object, right? And that's just because we tried to pass a JavaScript object to this as an argument. So we'll see later on how we can actually send JSON data back to the client, because obviously that's a pretty important thing uh, for servers to be able to do. But for now, we'll just stick to sending strings. So let's say response.end, and we'll say uh, hello from node again, like so. And you know, if we restart our server again, we should be able to send this and get that same response. Cool, so let's take a look at some of the other methods that this response object provides us with that will help us customize this response a little further. So one thing that you're almost always gonna wanna do when you're sending back responses from a server is set different headers on that response 
to give the client side a little bit more context about any data that we're sending back as well as to let the client side know how things went on the server using a status code. So let's take a look at how to include a status code first. Basically, all that we need to do to include a status code, and first of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with status codes, status codes are just numbers like 404 that communicate to the client side the status of their request, right? So you're probably already familiar with this 404 status code. All that this means is that some sort of resource that you are trying to load from the server, such as a page, doesn't exist or wasn't found, all right? So that's what the 404 status code means. There is a lot of other status codes as well. Uh, 200 is the status code, meaning that everything is okay, right? You'll usually see it written like this. And this is sort of the default status code for if you're doing things like loading data. And there's a lot of other status codes as well. Usually they're differentiated by the first number in the status codes, right? So 200 status code usually signify that everything's okay. 300 status codes usually mean that uh, the resource was moved or there's some sort of redirect or something like that, right? 400 status codes usually mean that something went wrong but that there wasn't an actual error in the server, right? So you'll see 400 status codes when either a resource wasn't found or if a client is trying to request a resource that they don't have access to or if the request isn't following the correct format. So usually these status codes mean something along the lines of there's some sort of error with the request itself, all right? And then there's 500 status codes, which generally mean that some sort of error occurred on the server, all right? So while 400 status codes, right, like a 404 status code would mean, no, sorry, you're trying to look for a page that doesn't exist. A 500 status code, if you're trying to go to a page, would generally mean something along the lines of there's some sort of error in the company's servers. All right. So anyway, those are the main status codes. You'll see those used in a lot of different circumstances. And there's usually a status code for pretty much every situation that you want to communicate to the client side. But anyway, the way that you specify a status code on your response in Node.js is by saying response dot right head. All right. And then you're just going to add the status code here. So if you want to say right head 200, that will give a 200 status code if you wanted to say 404 and say something like, uh, you know, page not found, then that would be how you would do it. Okay, cool. So that's how you add a status code to the response that you want to send back to the client. But usually you'll also want to include additional headers, such as the content type header which uh, basically just tells the client what type of data it's gonna be dealing with, right? So you might see content type application slash JSON. And that just means that we're trying to send back JSON data in this response instead of just regular string data. So anyway, things like this you'll want to include in the headers and and there's actually two different ways of including headers in a basic Node.js server like this one. The first one is to pass a second argument to this right head function, specifying what the headers are, right? So this is gonna be an object, and basically all the headers we're just gonna specify as keys, so content type, for example, and the values for those headers we're gonna specify as the values for those keys. So if we wanted application slash JSON, that's what that would look like, all right? And additionally, if we wanted to uh, include our own headers, right, like X something, and then the value for that could be whatever we want it to be, hello, that would include those headers for us. So if we uh, restart our server, what we should be able to see is if we send a request, we're gonna see, first of all, that we have this page not found thing that we changed our message to, but then if you open up the inspector window and go to network, this will actually let you see in much more detail the requests you send. So let's hit refresh. And what you're gonna see is this request that we're sending. This is localhost 8080 slash API slash users. First of all, you'll notice that it's in red and that's because of the status code. All right, so in addition to communicating with our front end application, if we have one, status codes also play a role debugging because generally browser tools like this will do things like color code different status codes for you. So anyway, 
this can be very useful. And if you double click on that, what you're going to see is that this gives us a lot more information about the request that we sent and the response that we received. And if you go down here, what you'll actually see is that in response headers, we have a few other headers that we didn't specify ourselves. These are just headers that are automatically included like connection, date, keep alive, transfer encoding, just ignore those. The ones that we specified are right here. So content type application slash JSON and X something hello. Those are both in the response headers here. So that's one way that you can make sure that the headers you're getting back from your server are actually correct. All right. Cool. So now that we've seen one way of specifying headers, there actually is another way to specify headers. And that is by using the set header method on the response object. So what that looks like, and you can do the exact same thing with this as you can do with this syntax here. This is just kind of a shorthand, but what we could do is say response dot set header. And then this takes two arguments. The first argument is going to be the name of the header. So content type, for example, all right, we'll say content dash type. And the second argument here is going to be the value for that header. So we can say application slash JSON, for example, and that will set that header in just the same way. So let's do the same thing with our X something header. And I'm just going to remove this object here for now. What we'll do is say response dot set header X dash something. And then we'll say hello. Cool. So if we rerun our server, what we're going to do is uh, just run source slash server.js again. And let's go back to here and hit refresh. And what we should see is we get the same kind of response. And we should also see that the headers are what we have in our program, right? So we have application slash JSON, and then we have hello here again. So this is just doing the same thing as what we saw beforehand. Sometimes it will be beneficial to use this set header function instead of just writing all of the headers uh, using the right head function. Because by setting headers like this, it will allow you to actually access the value of a header later on, right? So you can actually use that as part of your server logic. And in case you're wondering how to get the value of a specific header, you can do that just by saying, uh, we'll just do console.log and we'll say response.getHeader. And then for that, all you need to do is specify the header name. So we could say X something, and this should print out hello in our server console. All right, so let's just restart this. And if we hit refresh, we should see that all of the headers are the same here. And we see that the value of that header is available to us inside our server as well. All right. So those are the two different ways to set headers. Generally, I prefer to specify my headers as an object here. It's just because it's a little bit less procedural, so to speak, right? It's easier. I find just to see them all in one place, but nevertheless, many people like to use the set header method instead. So you'll just want to figure out what works for you. So the last thing that I want to show you here is how to write data without using response.end because response.end, all that this really does is it tells the server, okay, we're done with the response. And that's what makes the client actually stop uh, loading with this little spinner thing here and uh, just display whatever it received. So we do have to use response.end inside this callback uh, at the end of our response, but we can actually write data without this just by saying response.write. And inside here, we can include whatever data we want. So we could say something like hello. And what this is going to do is it's going to add this to the response. And when we call response.end, it will add whatever we pass to that to whatever data we put in here. So what that's going to look like, and actually let's just change this to a 200 status code. All right, what we're going to see, and oops, I have a typo here. That should be response. There we go. What we're going to see if we restart our server and send another request is that it says, hello, page not found. And basically all of that data that we wrote is just lumped together. All right. So if you ever have a reason where you need to write multiple pieces of data separately, right? If you're uh, loading pieces of data one by one from a file and you want to write all of those to the response, you could always use response.write to do that. And then you could just say response.end when you want to send it, right? You don't actually have to pass anything at all to response.end. If you just call it with no arguments, it'll just take all of the data that you've added with response.write and send that along. So let's just try this one more time now that we've removed the data from response.end. And what we'll see if we hit refresh is that it just says hello.
Okay, so anyway, that's the request and response arguments. As you can see, these provide a lot of functionality for us and they'll really end up forming the basis of a lot of the server side logic that we'll write. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've learned the basics of working with these request and response objects inside our request handler and doing things like uh, sending responses back to the client, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to actually create a functional server that will respond differently depending on the URL, right? So generally this URL, right? The path that comes after localhost 8080 or whatever the host name is for our server will be a pretty important way that clients will communicate what they actually want from the server, right? So let's just say that we're creating a simple REST API to manage server side data. Well, what that's gonna look like usually is, let's say we have things like uh, users, products, and uh, maybe we have articles as well, okay? Well, in order to load each of these different resources, what we're gonna want the clients to do that need these resources is send a get request to a specific path, right? And just by RESTful conventions, this will usually be the name of the resource in plural, right? So if you wanna load users from the server, you'll say get slash users. If you wanna load the products, we'll say get slash products. And if you want to load the articles, we'll say get slash articles, okay? And of course, if you want to do other things like update a specific user or uh, add a product to your shopping cart, there's going to be different combinations of the request method here and the path here. And that's something that we'll talk about later on. So don't worry too much about this if uh, you've never created a REST API before. What we're going to do here is just take a look at how to handle different paths inside our on request handler. Now, the simplest way to do this is actually just to use a big if statement, or you could use a switch case statement as well, to basically just look at the URL property of the request that we receive and execute different logic accordingly. So let's just remove all of this stuff for now. You can always just comment it out if you want it around for reference. But basically, the first thing that we would want to do inside our request handler is check to see what the current value of response.url is, right? And we could always get that by just saying let URL equals response. Oops, response, not require there. And uh, this is just using object destructuring to get a variable called URL that's equal to the URL property on this response object, right? So that's just the same as saying let URL equals response.url in case you're not familiar with that. And now that we have the URL, what we can do is we can just check to see what the value is. Now again, the most direct way to do this is just to say if URL is equal to, and let's say slash users, then we'd want to uh, basically load the users and send them back to the client. Otherwise, if the URL is equal to something like, what did we say, uh, articles or products or whatever, then we might want to load the articles and send those back to the client. And then we'll say else if, and we'll do URL is equal to uh, products, slash products that is, then we would want to load the products. Okay, now in the situation where the URL doesn't match any of these things, what we're usually gonna wanna do is just send back some kind of status code that says, nope, that's not a valid route. Sorry, try something else, right? So in this case, we would generally just send back a 404 status code, sometimes with some kind of message attached to it. All right, so this is really the most direct way to handle different paths and uh, apply different logic to each of those paths. And it's not really the shortest or most concise way to do things. We'll take a look at some other alternatives shortly. But first, let's just test this out. So what we're going to do is just write in some different responses and actually implement the logic for each of these cases. So for if the URL is users, then that means we want to load the users. And for now, we'll just say something like uh, let users equals. And then we'll just say John, Jane, Bill and Betty. All right. And once we have those users, 
we'll just send them back to the client. And the way that we do that, you might remember, is by saying response dot end, and we'll just include the users as the data. All right, now for articles, what we're gonna wanna do is just say let articles, and we'll just say something like, um, all of the articles. We're just using strings here because we haven't seen yet how to actually send JSON data. That's something that we'll take a look at later. So we'll just say all of the articles, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll send those back to the client side using response.end. And we'll say articles. And then for products, we'll say let products. And we'll say a lot of good products, blah, blah, blah. And we'll send that back to the client side as well by saying response.end products. Okay, and finally for our 404 case, what we're gonna do is just say response.end and we're gonna say there is no route for that path. Or, you know, we'll say maybe there's no handler for that path. And we'll want to set the status code to 404, which is something that we'll take a look and see how to do in just a minute. So anyway, that's really all we need to do. In all of these cases, we're calling response.end, 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 response.end with some kind of different data. So let's just give this a try. What we're gonna do is restart our server and let's try sending a request to localhost 8080 slash API slash users. And actually not API slash users. We're just gonna send this to slash users for now. And uh-oh, it looks like we have, there is no handler for that path. Uh, the reason for this actually is because this should be URL equals request. I'm not sure why I said response. Uh, you probably noticed that as I was doing it and that's just plain wrong. So let's try this again. We're going to restart our server. We'll hit enter and let's go back and try this again. And sure enough, we'll see that we get our users. Now, if we try and send a request to slash articles, let's say, uh, let's try that again. There we go. We'll see all of the articles. And for our products, we'll see a lot of good products. And if we try something else, like if we just enter in some kind of big, long, non-existent string there, we'll see that it says there is no handler for that path. And the same thing is gonna happen for really anything besides those three main route handlers that we created. All right, so again, this is really the most direct way of doing this. Now, one thing that we're not doing here is we're not setting the status code and our code is a little bit repetitive. So what you might want to do is instead of calling response.end over and over and over again here, what we're going to do instead is just say let data. All right. And then inside here, what we'll do is just, just set the data equal to whatever string we want to send back, right? So this will shorten things considerably. We'll say data equals all of the articles. Data equals a lot of good products. And for this one, we'll just say data equals there is no handler for that path. And then all we need to do is after this big if statement, we're just gonna say response.end. Oops, there we go, response.end. And we'll call that with the data that we got from that if statement. All right, now in addition to the data, we're also gonna want to set the status code. So we'll do the same thing that we did with our data here. And what we'll do is we'll just say let status code equals 200. And we're just gonna assume that it's 200 unless something goes wrong, in which case we'll wanna set it to a different status code. So in the case here where we don't have a handler for that path, we'll wanna say status code equals 404. And then down here, what we'll do is we'll just say response dot right head, and we'll pass that status code, whatever it may be, as an argument to right head. All right, so this is gonna take care of setting those two things for us. So let's just try this again. We're gonna restart our server. And if we go back over here and send something to slash users, what we'll see if we open up the inspector window is that uh, in our network tab, well here, let's hit refresh. We have status 200, whereas if we go to a route that doesn't have that, we'll see that the status code is 400. And in each case, we'll also see that uh, for articles, for example, we get that data sent back as well. Okay, so using an if statement here works as we've seen, but there are obviously a lot of slightly better ways to go about this. One option would be to use a switch case block. And here's what that would look like. We already have the URL from the request up here. So all we would have to do is say switch URL. 
And then we would just create a case for each of these different routes that we want to handle, right? So if we say switch URL, and then we would say case users, let's just uh, adjust this a little bit. And we would need to surround this whole thing in curly braces as well. Okay, so we'll say switch URL. We'll have a case for if the URL is equal to users, in which case we would wanna say break after we set that data. Uh, then we would have a case for articles. So we'll just delete everything up to there and say case articles. Then we would have a colon there. We'll move case down. And then we'll do the same thing for products. We're just gonna say case products, change this to a colon here, and we're gonna say a lot of good products. And last but not least, we'll have the default case here. And that will simply set the status code and data to their respective values. And here, let's just add break to these other two cases. We don't need to add a break to default because that's the last case. And that's pretty much all we need to do there. So this is a little bit longer, but it's also gotten rid of a lot of unnecessary code, like all of the if statement related code. And it's also a little bit easier to read as you can see. So let's just test this out to make sure it works just like our if statement did. So if we restart our server and go back, we should be able to refresh and see that we get the same responses as before. Let's try products. Uh, let's try the non-existent route here. And sure enough, we see that we get the same results as what we had before. Okay, so that's another way to go about it. And of course, there's lots of other ways as well. And most of those ways are just gonna take advantage of basic JavaScript syntax and control structures. So, you know, feel free to get creative and figure out what feels best for you and what looks the best in code. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to create a basic node server and have that server respond differently to different paths, and we've also seen how to send back different data, different status codes, etc., the last thing that we're going to take a look at here is how to have our server automatically restart whenever we make changes, right? Because up until now, Whenever we've wanted to restart our server, we've had to actually open up our terminal and manually kill the server and then run it again by basically just going up and running the last command. Now, this way of doing things is, I mean, it's sustainable, right? It doesn't take that long to do, but it can get frustrating, especially if you're trying to make lots of little changes and get instant feedback about those changes. It can be exhausting to just have to kill the server, restart the server, kill the server, restart the server. And uh, needless to say, there are gonna be some situations too where you'll just forget to do this here and you'll wonder why that last line of code that you added isn't doing anything, uh, you know, especially when you're trying to troubleshoot some kind of bug in your server. So anyway, with most servers, I highly recommend that you add the ability to automatically have them restart whenever you make changes because it's just gonna make your life a lot easier. So there are several different ways that you can do this, but the easiest way is going to be using an NPM package called NodeDemon. Now, it might seem a little strange that we're using an NPM package to restart our server when we're not even using when we're not even using an external NPM package to write our server in the first place, but NodeDemon is different because usually it's used as a development dependency, meaning that it's just a tool that when you build your server and release it to production, isn't going to be included in your final program, right? So it's not going to potentially weigh down and slow down your server when you release it to production. So anyway, let's install NodeDemon into this project. And the way that you can do that is by saying npm install NodeDemon and it's spelled N-O demon. Some people pronounce this differently, like no demon. Some people say no demon, like Pokemon. There's a lot of different ways to say it. I say no demon just because it's node and it's sort of a demon that runs in the background and takes care of things for you. But anyway, you're also gonna wanna add the flag save dev to the end of this, and this will install it specifically as a development dependency which again means that when you build this server for production, it's not going to be included in the final bundle. So let's hit enter. And this should install the node daemon package for us. And all we need to do now is in order to use this node daemon tool to run our server and automatically restart it, we just need to run the command npx 
no daemon. And then we just say the file that we want to run. So it's going to be source slash server.js. And if we hit enter now, that's going to run our server continuously and it will automatically restart it when we make changes. So all of this stuff up here is from node daemon. That's just output telling you what it's doing. It's watching all of the files in this current directory, etc. And we see that server is listening on port 8080. Okay, so this is just the alternative command instead of node source slash server.js that we use with node daemon. And what we should see now, if we go back and just send a request to something like slash users, we'll see that we get the original output. And if we go back and make a change, okay, so let's say that we change this to uh, no one. What we'll see is that node daemon actually says restarting due to changes, and we see server is listening on port 8080 again. So node daemon is basically just doing what we were doing uh, manually, but obviously it's doing it automatically for us. So if we go back now and hit refresh, we'll see that we now get that updated behavior from the server. Okay, so this just makes it a lot easier to work on a server. It makes it much quicker to write a server and test it when you don't have to restart it. And it also makes it much easier to troubleshoot bugs and see if your changes make a difference. Uh, because again, you don't have to worry about just restarting it, restarting it, restarting it. Now, because this command can be a little bit difficult for people to remember, right? A lot of times people forget npx or they type npm node daemon source server.js or whatever, right? Anyway, it's, a, it's an inconvenient command to have to remember. So what a lot of people will do as well is just create a custom script for it inside their package.json file. So if you want to do this, all that we have to do is just add a line to our scripts here. Uh, usually you'll see this called something like dev, since uh, we'll be running this in development mode when we use node daemon more often than not. And then inside here, we just have to say npx node daemon and uh, the name of the file we want to run. So source slash server.js. And now if we stop this, we can actually run our code by saying npm run dev instead of npx node daemon blah blah blah. And this just makes it easier to run your code in development mode since you no longer have to remember what the actual command is in the background, especially when you start doing things like adding environment variables where you say something like port 8080. It just becomes very cumbersome to have to type these things out. So anyway, by creating a dev script like this, and using a package like node daemon, we can make development on our server a lot easier and more streamlined. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. In previous sections, we've spent quite a bit of time working with Node.js's built-in HTTP package, and we've seen how to use that package to build web servers that handle different requests. However, one thing that we haven't seen how to do yet is use that package to build a real-world REST API, and that's what we're going to be doing here today. So basically what we're going to be doing is just using Node.js's built-in HTTP package to create a real-world REST API that a client would be able to use to manage a specific resource, such as users, products, etc. So that's what we're going to be doing here today. Let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, let's discuss the basic structure of the REST API that we're going to be building. So the REST API that we'll be building is going to be based around some sort of resource. And just because this is a really common thing that you're going to need in most applications that you'll build, what we're going to be doing is using users as a resource. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to define some fake users just as a sort of JavaScript array with things like name, age, etc. And that will be the data that will be on our server side, right? So the purpose of this REST API that we're going to be building will be to allow our server to be the one that stores and manages the data, right? I'm just going to draw that over here and, you know, we'll just have our users as sort of a little database thing over here. 
right? So we're gonna have our server be the manager of the data, and this is necessary for a multitude of reasons. Um, among those really just being the fact that this is the most secure place to have your data managed, since this means we have much more control over the code that's actually being executed on our server versus on the client side. So anyway, the purpose of our REST API is, is gonna be to serve as a sort of interface between our client side, right? Or any clients that want to load or modify this data and the actual data itself in our server. So, you know, REST APIs usually have a pretty fixed set of different things that they'll allow the client side to do. And obviously this is gonna depend on your actual application data. But what we're gonna be taking a look at here, the main functions anyway, are gonna be allowing the client side to list a given resource, right? So uh, this would be the case when, let's say we wanna display a list of all of the currently logged in users or something like that on the client side. The client would send a request to this list endpoint and just by the implementation of our REST API, what the server would do is it would load the users from the database or file or wherever we're storing our users. In this example, we're just gonna be storing our users as an in-memory array. And it would simply send that back to the client. All right, so that's the first endpoint that we're gonna be building here. Uh, but in addition to this, we're also gonna be building a read endpoint. And the difference between a read endpoint and a list endpoint, and I'm not sure if this is a technical term or not, but I'm just gonna say it like this for the purpose of this example. Uh, for our purposes, a read endpoint is going to be an endpoint for loading an individual instance of a resource, right? So list gave us all of the users. A read endpoint would be where the client side just wants to have the data for a single user, right? And the way that you usually differentiate these is a list endpoint will be slash users, right? It'll just have the resource name in it. And a read endpoint will usually be slash users slash, and then you'll have the actual user ID that you want the information for that comes after that. Okay, so we have a list endpoint for loading all of our users, a read endpoint for loading an individual user. Additionally, we're going to add a create endpoint for creating new users, right? If the client side, for example, uh, has a new user sign up through a create account page or something like that, we'll want to create a new user on the server side. So we're gonna have an endpoint for that. And additionally, we're gonna have an update endpoint for if we want to update a given user's information, right? If a user wants to change their email address or something like that, we'll have a delete endpoint, which will allow the user to delete their account, presumably, if the user wants to uh, you know, download all their data, get rid of their account, and stop using our site. And finally, if we have time, what we're gonna do is implement a simple search endpoint, okay? So a search endpoint, and again, I'm not sure if this is a technical term or not, but I've definitely heard it thrown around. A search endpoint is an endpoint that's sort of like a list endpoint, but it allows the client to perform some sort of search on the data here, right? So we might want to find users by name, let's say. And in that case, we would want to have a separate search endpoint that would take care of that. So anyway, these are all of the main endpoints that we're gonna be creating here. And let's just sort of map out what each of these is gonna look like, right? So for listing, right, we already saw that the endpoint for that is just gonna be the resource name. And usually this is paired up with a get request, right? So usually the way that a client will load a list of a given resource from the server is by sending a get request to the route that's just the name of the resource, right? So users or products or articles, you get the idea. All right, now for a simple individual read endpoint, as we already saw, this is also going to be a get request and it's gonna be sent to slash followed by the resource name and then another slash and followed by the ID of whatever resource we want to load, right? So if we wanna load user 135, we would send a get request to slash users slash 135. Okay, pretty straightforward so far, right? So next up, we'll have our create endpoint. And one key difference to keep in mind between the create endpoint and the two other endpoints we've talked about so far is that 
the create endpoint is gonna need to include some extra data, right? When a new user signs up to our site, let's say, we're obviously gonna need to include things like the user's username that they signed up with or email and their password, as well as any other information we want to store about the user on our server. And what that means is that we usually use a post request instead of a get request whenever we want to create a new resource. And this is just sort of a convention that's used when creating REST APIs so that the client side, right, whoever's developing the client side, will already, before even looking at your documentation, have a pretty good idea of what sort of request they'll be sending to your server in order to do something like create a new resource. So for creating a new user, we're gonna send a post request to slash users. All right, so we're basically gonna have two different endpoints that have the same path, right? We have this get users and post users for create. And you know, that's perfectly fine. That's part of the reason why we have this uh, request method in the first place so that we can differentiate between those two things. All right, so we have list, read, create. Next one is going to be update. And for updating a given resource, what we're gonna be doing is sort of combining the read endpoint and create endpoint uh, because what we're gonna be doing is sending a request with extra data, right? We're gonna need to send whatever updates we want uh, to be made on the server to a given user using a put request, all right? So put requests, again, this is just by convention that we do this. You can also use a post request, I suppose, if you wanted to, but I usually see put requests done for this. And we're gonna be sending that request to slash users. And then just like in the read endpoint, we're gonna add the ID of whatever user we wanna update. So 234, for example. All right, so list, read, create, update. The next one is going to be delete, and this is going to be for deleting a specific user. Now, in this case, the request method that we're gonna use is perhaps pretty obvious. That's going to be a delete request, okay? And we're gonna be sending that to slash users, slash, and then the user's ID that we want to delete. Okay, so as you can see, we're gonna need URL parameters in these three endpoints for sure. So that'll be something we'll need to implement as we do that. And the last one here is going to be the search endpoint. Now the search endpoint, you can implement this in a variety of different ways. There's, there's a few different conventions for doing this and I'm not quite sure which one is technically considered the correct way, but the way that we're gonna use is by sending the same exact type of request that we sent to the list endpoint, right? So get and then we're gonna send that to slash users. But in addition, we're also going to include some query parameters in the URL. So, you know, if we want to search for users by name, then we would send a get request to slash users. And then after this, we would have a query string. So we might say question mark name equals Bob, right? If we wanted to search for people named Bob on our server. Okay, so in other words, the list endpoint and the search endpoint are really going to be the same endpoint. It's really just gonna depend on whether there's a query string or not uh, for filtering the results. So anyway, these are the main endpoints that we're gonna be creating on our server. So uh, what we're gonna do next is get started with the list endpoint. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we know a little bit about what our REST API is gonna look like, let's get started implementing the first endpoint, which is gonna be the list endpoint. Now, what I'm gonna do here is start off with an empty server file, and this will just give us a little bit more practice with setting up a basic HTTP server in Node.js. So you're gonna to want to have the basic project that we set up a while ago, except for the server.js file, which will just be blank now, okay? So in order to do this, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We're just gonna start off by saying import HTTP from HTTP. And additionally, we're also gonna to need to import the URL parser from the URL package, which again is included with Node.js. So you don't need to install that. And we're gonna add the query string package in order to uh, help us parse query strings correctly when we need to use those for for example, our read endpoint. 
Okay, so that's all that we should have to import for our server. The next thing that we're going to do is create a new server using this HTTP packages create server function. And what that's going to look like, we're just going to say let server equals HTTP dot create server. And we have the callback function here for now. What we're going to do is say request and response. And then inside here is where we're going to start defining our endpoint logic. So now that we have that set up, we're just going to start our server listening by saying server dot listen. And we're going to have it listen on port 8080 here. And then once everything goes well, right, once the server has successfully been started, we're just going to log out to the console saying something like server is listening on port 8080, right? So the typical message that gets printed out from a server. Awesome. So now that we have our server set up, which was very easy and took all of like two minutes, I believe, we can actually start creating our list endpoint. All right. So in order to create our list endpoint, what we're going to do here, we're going to have to check and make sure that the request method and the request path match our specification for the endpoint, right? So it's going to need to be a get request on the slash users endpoint. And what we need to do in order for that to happen is we're going to first of all get the method and the URL from the request. So we'll say let method and URL equals request. And after that, what we're going to do is use the URL parser that we imported up here to parse that URL and make sure that we're removing any query parameters that come after the URL, right? We'll worry about those query parameters later on when we create the search endpoint. But for now, we just want the actual path for the request. So what that's going to look like, we've seen this before. We're just going to say let path name equals URL parser dot parse. And we're going to parse the URL that we got from the request. All right, and now that we have the method and path name, we can compare those to our endpoint specification. So we're going to want to make sure that the method is get and the path name is slash users. So uh, there's a lot of different ways we can do this. For now, what we're going to do is just say if method is equal to get and path name is equal to slash users. All right, so we're doing kind of the brute force method here just directly checking the method and the path name for an exact value. And inside here now is where we're going to want to implement all of the logic that we want for our list endpoint. So what I'm going to recommend you do here, instead of writing all of your code directly inside this if statement, what we're going to do is actually create separate files for each endpoint handler. All right, and this is something that's sort of similar to what we saw if you've seen the section about creating your own server-side framework using Node.js. Uh, what we're going to do here is just create a new file, and we'll call this file something like handle list request. All right, so we'll have similar files for handling the read request, for handling the create request, etc. And actually, let's um, call this handle list users request. And actually, we don't even have to have the request on there. That's a little redundant. We'll just say handle list users. Cool. So let's hit enter and create that new file. And what we're going to do inside here is define a function, which we'll call handle list users. And what this is going to do here is it's basically just going to take the request and the response objects from the server. And inside here, we're going to write all of the logic for handling whatever request we received, right? So for listing users, what we're going to want to do is basically use this response object to set the correct header and add all of the users to the response body. All right. So basically, this is just a handy way to split up logic in your server into multiple files instead of writing all of it directly inside your server file, which as we've seen previously can get a little messy. All right, so um, now that we have this handle list users function, what we're going to do is export it. So we'll just say export default handle list users. And then we're going to import that into our server.js file by saying import handle list users from handle list users. And then we'll call that here inside our if statement by saying handle list users. And uh, for arguments, we're going to pass the request and response objects there. 
Cool, so that's how we're gonna call that function. So now all we have to do is figure out how to implement this thing. Now, since the main purpose of this endpoint is to list all of the users on our server, right? In other words, to just send back data for all of the users that we have, what we need to do before we can actually implement this is create some fake user data that we can use. So what we're gonna do here is create a new file and we'll call that users.js. And all that this is gonna do is export an array of user data that we can use to build out our endpoints. So what this is gonna look like, we're gonna say let users equals, and this is just gonna be an array, so let's add some data to this. All of the users will have three properties, by the way. One will be an ID, one will be a username, and one will be the user's password. So we'll say ID, and this will be one, two, three for the first user. We'll do username and I'll just say Sean, you can use your own name here. And we'll say password and we'll say ABC123 or something like that. And that's our first user. Let's do the same kind of thing for our second user. We'll say ID234, username, we'll do Bob, I suppose. You can do whatever you want here, it doesn't really matter. And we'll say password, uh, why don't we do XYZ789 uh, for this, exclamation point. And our last user will say ID 345, username for this one we'll do Sue, and for password we'll do, I don't know, 321 ABC, I suppose. All right, and that will be our third user. So now that we have all of our users, we just need to export those users. And we'll do that as the default export here. So we'll say export default users. And now we have some user data that we can use to handle our requests. So now that we have that, let's just go into handle list users, and then we're going to import our users file. So we'll say import users from users.js. And actually, I think back in the server, I forgot the JS for handle list users. We just need to add that since we have type module set in our package.json file. All right, and now all we have to do is take this user's data and send it back to the client side. And that's actually very easy to do. We just need to say response.end users, and that will send all of the users to the client side. And we're also gonna want to set a simple status code here as well. So we'll just say response.write head, and we'll send back a status code of 200, indicating that everything is okay. Cool, so that's all that we need for our handle list users endpoint handler. And actually uh, I wrote out the full word response. This should just be res.writehead and res.end. Or, you know, if you typed out request and response, the full words up here in the arguments, you'd obviously want to use the corresponding name down here. Cool, and that's really all that we need to do here for our handle list users function. So let's just go back to server.js and uh, well, let's run this thing and see what it does. So what we're gonna do is run our server by saying node source slash server.js. And you could also do this using node daemon if you have the script set up by saying npm run dev. And just to be clear here, uh, in another section, we added this dev script so that we could do this. It won't work without that, what we're about to do. So let's hit enter. And and that should start our server running and no daemon will automatically restart our server whenever we make changes, all right? If you've watched the previous sections, you're more than familiar with this by now, I'm sure. Cool, so now that our server is running, let's open up Postman and give this a try. So we're just gonna create a new request up here and we're gonna be sending a get request to http colon slash slash localhost 8080 slash users, okay? And we're gonna click send here. And uh-oh, it looks like an error occurred. So let's go back and take a look at our console. And ah, yes, the reason that this happened, and by the way, that's kind of a confusing error message in case you ever see that the chunk argument must be of type string or blah, blah, blah. All that that means is in our handle list users function, we need to actually stringify our users before we send them back. So we need to say json.stringify users because response.end will only take a string or something called a buffer as an argument. So uh, we just need to convert that into a string and that should work now. So let's go back to Postman and try this request again. We're gonna click on send 
And sure enough, we see that we get all of our users sent back to us. Now, a few things that I want to point out here, just because, well, you never know, uh, but I want to point this out is that in the real world, you would never, ever want to send back the user's password to the client side in a list endpoint or really in any other endpoint at all. In fact, you wouldn't even want to store the user's plain text password in your database at all. You You'd want to actually encrypt that password so that uh, if a hacker gained access to your database, they wouldn't be able to see those passwords. But anyway, this is just for the sake of example, so that's why we're going to see these passwords in all of these endpoints. But again, in the real world, that's not something you're going to want to give the client side access to ever. So anyway, with that caveat there, that's how to create a list endpoint. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen how to create a simple list endpoint for our REST API, the next endpoint that we're gonna create is a read endpoint for loading individual users by their ID. All right, so what this is gonna look like, uh, first of all, we just need to create a new case in this if statement for our endpoint specification. Right, we said that the endpoint was gonna look a little like this. We would have get, and then this would be followed by slash users, slash and then the user's ID after that. Now, this does include a URL parameter. So what we're gonna have to do in this case is change the comparison that we're using for this endpoint path, right? Right. We're not gonna be able to just say path name equals blah, 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 uh, slash users slash something because that something can change and it could really be any value we want. So what we're gonna have to do here is we're gonna say else if method equals get, right? So that part's exactly the same. And we could actually combine that, which I'll show you how to do in just a minute. And then we're gonna say path name dot starts with, and we're gonna say slash users slash. Okay, so we wanna make sure that it starts with this sequence of characters here. And additionally, we're gonna have to add one more thing that we check for, and that is that there are only two segments, this users segment and the segment that comes after that, which will be the ID segment. So in order to do that, we just need to say, and path name dot slice one. We've seen this before. This basically takes the initial slash off the path name. And then we're gonna say dot split by slash. And we wanna make sure that that has a length of two, right? So basically we're just checking to see that there are only two segments in the URL path name. All right, so we'll say equals two. And that should be pretty much all we need to do. Now, this is a rather messy condition. So, you know, at some point we might want to put a little bit of thought into refactoring this to make sure we can maintain it properly. But for now, we'll just leave it the way it is. All right, so inside here, what we're going to do is, is the same thing that we did up here with our list endpoint. We're just going to create a new function, which we'll call something like handle uh, read user by ID. All right, kind of a long name, but at least it, explains what we're doing here. And then what we're gonna do is pass the request and response objects to that function, just like we did with our handle list users function. Cool, so what we're gonna need to do next is actually define that function here. So let's create a new file, which we'll call handle read user by ID. And uh, that's gonna be .js here, of course. So let's define that function function handle read user by ID. It's gonna take a request and a response object as arguments. And we're gonna to want to export this as the default export from this file. Again, just like we've seen before, we're gonna say export default handle read user by ID. Cool, so now all we have to do is implement the body of this function and we should be good to go. Oh, and one last thing, we do need to import this into our server.js file which we can do just by saying import handle read user by ID from handle read user by ID dot JS. All right, so let's go back into our handle read user by ID function. And basically what we're gonna need to do is first of all, we'll need to get the ID from the path. So if the path is slash users slash ABC or you know whatever an ID looks like in our application, we're gonna to want to get this as a string so that we can load the corresponding user. So 
what that's going to look like. And there are obviously various ways to do this. But the way that we're going to do it is just the quick and easy way. We're going to split our URL into segments, which we can do by getting the path name. So we're going to do the same thing that we did in here, which we're just going to get the URL from the request and use the URL parser to parse that. So let's just go into here and paste those lines and we can remove method for now, but we do need path name. And we'll also need to import the URL parser package from uh, URL. All right. And now that we have that, we can simply look in the path name to find out what the user's ID is. So we'll say let segments equals path name dot slice one dot split by the slash character. And then we're going to want the second segment, which will be the user's ID. So we can just say let user ID equals segments index one. And now that we have the user ID, all we need to do is search through our user's array to find the user with that ID and send that back to the client side. So let's start off here by importing our users from the file, right? So from users.js. And once we've done that, we're simply going to find the corresponding user by saying let user equals users.find. And we wanna find the user whose ID, and actually let's just change this to you so that we don't get confused with this user over here. We're gonna say u.id is equal to user ID. All right, so we're finding the user whose ID is equal to the URL parameter value. And now that we have the user, assuming of course that we do have the user, which we're gonna to wanna to check by saying if user exists, right? We're just going to send that user back to the client side by saying response.end user and, and the status code in this case would be response.righthead200. Okay, now if we don't find a user, all that we're going to want to do is send back a 404 status code, which we can do by saying response.righthead404, right, indicating that the user was not found, and we're going to say response.end to send the response. And that should be all we need to do for our handle reuser by ID function. So let's test this thing out now. We've already added it to our server. So what we're gonna do is head over to Postman and let's try sending a get request to slash users slash one, two, three, right? We know that there's a matching user with that ID. So this should work if we did everything right. And if we click send now, Oops, it looks like we have another error. So let's go back to our console and see what that error is. And sure enough, it's the same error as before. Perhaps you even caught this before I did. We just need to say json.stringify user instead of trying to send back a raw JavaScript object using response.end. So let's try this again. Our server has automatically restarted thanks to node daemon. So let's go back to postman and click send. And sure enough, we should see that we got the user back with the ID equal to 123. And you can test this with other users as well. Let's try 234. Sure enough, we get another user. And if we try 345, yep, we get the user with ID 345. So that's how to create a simple read endpoint using Node's HTTP package. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we've created a list endpoint for getting all of the users from our server. We've created a read endpoint for getting individual users by ID. And the next endpoint that we're going to be creating is a search endpoint. So this is not the original order that I put things in beforehand, but uh, since search endpoints are going to be very closely related to our list endpoint here, I thought that that just made sense to talk about next. So we're going to be creating an endpoint that will allow the client side to include some sort of extra criteria when they want to list users that will basically filter the results based on some sort of property. So again, what this is going to end up looking like is the client is going to send a get request to slash users and they're going to include some query parameters on the end that will filter the results by certain properties, right? So we'll probably want to allow them to uh, filter by the name property, for example. 
So in that case, we would say name equals, and then let's say that they want uh, to search everyone whose name has an A in it. Well, that's what that would look like, all right? And, you know, if we had other properties as well, such as uh, hair color, something like that, we would want to say something like hair color equals brown, let's say. And that would tell the server that we want to filter the results uh, to people that have the hair color attribute set to brown, all right? So that's the basic idea here. And in order to differentiate this from the list endpoint, what we're going to want to do is check to see if any query string exists on the URL. All right, so what we're going to do is use this query string package that we imported before to basically parse any query string that might be there. So uh, what we're going to do is, in addition to getting the path name from this URL parser.parse thing, we're going to say path name and query, which will give us the raw query string. And then what we're going to do is say let query params equals qs.parse. And we're going to parse that query string, which will give us a JavaScript object containing all of the keys and values that were in it. So now that we have our query params here, what we're going to do is check to see whether there are any in the first place. And if there are some, we're going to want to use the search endpoint. Otherwise, we're going to want to use the list users endpoint and just send back all of the users. So here's what this is going to look like. Inside here, what we're going to do is just check to see if query params exists. And actually, uh, what we'll want to do instead is just check to see whether there's a query string in the first place before we parse that so that we don't waste computation power there. So we'll just move this into the if query. And if that happens, we're going to want to call another function that we'll have to define, which we'll call handle search users. All right. And for that, we would pass request and response, as well as we'd probably want to pass the query params as another argument there, just so we don't have to reparse them inside this function. Okay. So that's if we have a query string. Otherwise, we're just going to want to call handle list users and let that function, which we defined earlier, do its thing. So now that we've defined all of that logic there, let's just create this new handle search users function. All right, so we'll create a new file for it called handle search users.js. And there we go. And let's define that function inside of here. We'll call it handle search users. And as we already saw, it's going to take a request and a response object as arguments, as well as the query params object that we already parsed inside server.js. So now that we have all of that, let's just export default handle search users. And we're going to want to import that into server.js by saying import handle search users from handle search users.js. Okay, and we already added that down here, as you'll remember. Cool, so now we just need to implement this handle search users function. And basically what we're gonna do is look through the query parameters and see if they include any properties that we're going to allow the user to filter by, right? So we're not gonna want to allow the user to filter by all properties, obviously. So let's just say that we only want the client to be able to filter by the user's username property, all right? And if we open up users, you can see that that's really the only property we have available to filter by. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start off by defining an external constant here, which we'll call something like searchable fields. All right, and this is just gonna be an array containing a single string, which is username. Now, if you wanted to, what you could do is actually add additional fields to this array if you wanted to allow the client side to search by other fields later on down the road. So this is gonna give us a lot of flexibility later on if we wanted to add other searchable fields. But for now, we'll just stick to username. So now that we have that, what we're gonna do is look through the query params and only pay attention to the ones that are in this searchable fields array. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through all of these properties in query params by saying for let property in query params. So this is going to loop through all of the keys of this query params object, right? Property is going to be the key. And in fact, let's just rename this to key so that we know what we're dealing with here. And what we're going to do is, first of all, check if that key is in the searchable fields. So we'll say if 
searchable fields dot includes key. And if that's the case, what we're going to do is find all of the users that correspond to the criteria that was included, right? So first of all, let's import the users up here. We'll say import users from users.js. And then back down here, what we're going to do, actually, we'll need to define a new variable here, which we'll call something like results equals, and we'll just make that an empty array, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll say let new results equals users.filter. And then what we're going to do is just find all of the users whose property, right, whatever property we're looking at here, which in this case is just going to be username, contains whatever the value was that we included in query params, right? And this is just one way of doing this. Obviously, you could do starts with or ends with, or you could allow regular expressions, something like that. But let's just keep it simple here for now. So we'll say users.filter, and we want only the users whose property, whatever that is that we're looking at, starts with, so we're kind of assuming that it's a string here, I suppose, which might not be accurate later on down the road, but again, just for simplicity, let's assume that it is going to be a string, and we'll want it to start with the actual value that was provided for this query parameter. So we'll just say query params key. Okay. Oh, and actually, I realized that I said includes, but then I typed starts with, so let's change that to includes query params key. And uh, now that we have the new results, we'll just need to push those onto results here. So we'll say results.push new results. And that should successfully get all of the users that match a given filter. So now that we have all of that, we're just going to want to send back those results to the client. And to do that, we just need to say response dot uh, end json dot stringify and we're going to stringify those results and we're also going to send back something like a uh, status code so we'll say right head and we'll send back the 200 status code or if there were no results right which we can check by saying results dot length is greater than zero then what we'll do is return a 404 status code so i'm just using a simple ternary operator here to decide between those two status codes. And that should be all we need to do. So let's give this thing a try. What we're going to do is head back to Postman and let's try finding all of the users whose name contains the letter S, which should, if we did everything right, that is, return two users. So let's just say users slash and one other thing to notice here is, is that Postman actually gives you a slightly easier interface if you want to be able to work with keys and values in a table. Um, and it will automatically keep the URL up here in sync. So if we wanted to add a username query parameter and then the value S, you can see that we can just type that into this table and Postman will automatically update that up here. So let's click send. And what we'll see is that sure enough, we get those two users, but something that's a little bit strange is that we have a nested array. And the reason for that is we called results.push on an array. So we should just be able to add a spread operator there and save it. And that should get rid of that behavior. So let's try this again. We're going to click send. And sure enough, that got rid of the nested array behavior. So there we go. That's how to build a simple search endpoint. Now, a few additional things that I want to point out about this is the way that we implemented our logic here, it's combining any query parameters that were included using the OR operator, basically. So, you know, we're getting the new results and we're just pushing those onto the array. And what that means is that if we had two or three or four query parameters, it would return the users who matched any of those query parameters all in the same array, right? Instead of treating that like an AND operator. Now, if that bothers you, all you would have to do is change the logic here a little bit, right? Instead of just adding all of those new results onto here, you would actually want to filter the results even further by results that we already have that match the new results here. But anyway, I'll leave that up to you as an exercise. So anyway, that's how to create a simple search endpoint on our REST API. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
All right, so we have a list endpoint, a read endpoint, and a search endpoint. So the next endpoint that we're going to create here is an endpoint for creating new users. All right, now this endpoint is obviously going to be called something along the lines of handle create user.js. And basically the way that it's going to work as we saw is if we receive a post request on slash users, what we're going to want to do is get the request body and use that to insert a new user into our fake uh, database here that we have in our users.js file. So here's what this is going to look like. First things first, we're going to want to add another condition to our if statement saying else if method equals post. All right, so we're checking for the post method in this case. And we're going to want to check to see if the path name is equal to slash users. All right, and if it is, we're going to call our handle create user function by saying handle uh, create user with our request and response objects there. And let's just go up here and import it, even though we haven't actually exported it from that file yet. Uh, we'll just say import handle create user from handle create user.js. And now that we've done that, we can go back to handle create user and actually implement this thing. So what this is going to look like, we're going to start off by defining the function itself, which is pretty easy to do. And it's going to take those two arguments that we've seen in most of our other handler functions. And then we're just going to say export default handle create user, which will make it accessible in our server.js file. So now all we have to do is get the request body from this request object here and add that to the users array that we have inside users.js, right? So uh, we're just going to need to import this and call users.push when we finally get the new user data from the request body. So first of all, let's just import users from users.js. And now down in here, what we're going to do is add a listener for this request. So we're going to say let body equals, and it'll start off as an empty string. We've seen how to do this in other sections, if you don't remember this. And then we're going to say request dot on data. And whenever we receive a new chunk of data, what we're going to want to do is just push that onto the body by saying body plus equals chunk. And then we're going to say request dot on end. Right? This is once all of the data has been received, and here's where we're going to want to actually insert the user. So in the real world, what we want to do is automatically generate an ID for our user. But for now, just to keep things simple, we're just going to assume that the client side will be including the ID as well as the user's username and password. So literally all we'll have to do is take this body and push it onto this user's array by saying users dot push and we'll just push that body directly onto there and actually what we'll need to do is parse that first so we'll say something like let new user equals json dot parse body and then we'll push the new user onto our users array and then of course we'll want to respond we'll want to say something like response dot write head and we'll send back 200 and then we'll say response dot end and we don't really need to send back anything We'll just send back that status code indicating that everything was successful. So that's all we should need to do for our handle create user function. Let's give this thing a try by going over to Postman and we'll change this to a post request, all right, to slash users. And then what we're going to do is add a request body. So we'll say raw and we'll change this to JSON. And let's just add the data for a new user here. We'll say ID and we'll set that to four, five, six, or something like that. For username, we'll make that new username something like uh, Betty. And for uh, password, we'll do something like, uh, I don't know, just randomly type letters, that works. So let's click on send now. And what we should see is that we got a response. There's no response body or anything but there's just the status code that says 200 okay. And since that user was added to our server, what we should be able to do now is send a get request to slash users, right? To our list endpoint. 
and see that that new user is in there, right? And we see that right here, our new user has been successfully added to our users array. And obviously this is gonna be reset whenever our server restarts, which is why in the real world we would be using a database. But anyway, the basic functionality is there. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've created all of our endpoints except for two, and those are the update endpoint and the delete endpoint. And we're actually gonna tackle both of those in a single video here just because they're fairly straightforward. So what we're gonna do is we'll start off by creating the files for these two handlers. So the first one is gonna be handle update user.js, and we'll hit enter for that. And then we'll say new file, and we'll create another one called handle delete user.js. All right, so let's just define the rough signature of these functions. We'll say function handle update user. And this is gonna take request and response arguments just like most of our other ones have. And then we'll say export default and we'll export this thing, handle update user. And the same thing is gonna happen for our handle delete user. So we can actually just copy and paste a lot of this code to reduce the amount of typing we have to do. And then we can just replace uh, update here with delete and same thing down here. We'll say handle delete user. Cool, so now that we have both of those in place, let's head back to our server and actually call these functions at the right time. So what this is gonna look like, we'll say import handle update user from handle update user dot JS, and then import handle delete user from handle delete user dot JS. And then we'll go down here. And basically what we're gonna need to do is call both of these in the same situation as we needed to call our original read endpoint, right, with this big, sort of messy if statement here. So what we're actually gonna do, since the criteria with these is really only differentiated by the method, right? The, the rest of these conditions here are gonna apply to all of these endpoints. What we're gonna actually do is move this method equals get thing inside our else if block. All right, so what we're gonna do then is we'll say if method equals get, and in that case, we would want to call our read handler since that would be our read endpoint there. Otherwise, if our method is equal to put, that's going to be our update endpoint. So we'll wanna call handle update user. There we go. And we'll pass request and response as arguments there. And we'll wanna have one more else if block to check and see whether method is equal to delete. And in that case, we would wanna say handle delete user, all right? And we'll say request and response like so. Now, in all three of these cases here, in our read endpoint, in our update endpoint, and in our delete endpoint, we're gonna need access to the same user ID uh, that we're getting from the URL parameters. So what would make sense to do, and what would end up simplifying our code quite a bit, would be if we simply opened up our handle read user by ID function, all right, so we'll just open that file up here. And basically we're just going to copy the logic that we used for figuring out the user ID. So we're just gonna copy these two lines here, and then we're gonna go into our server file over here, and we will paste those inside our else if statement. So we'll just say paste. And now we have access to the user ID, which we can just pass as the third argument if we want to. All right, so let's just see what that does for us. If we pass user ID, user ID, and user ID. Well, what this means now is if we go into our handle read user by ID function again, I'll just open that up here. We should be able to just delete these things here. We don't have to worry about segments. And we also don't have to worry about path name or URL up here or this one here either. And we can actually just add that uh, user ID third argument there, and that simplifies the logic inside this function quite a bit. Cool, so now that we've done that, let's just go into our handle update user function and handle delete user functions. And actually let's do the delete one first since that's the easiest. 
And what we're gonna do is just import the users array from users.js. And when we wanna delete a user, we're gonna to need to get the user ID, which we already have access to as the third argument here. So we can just add user ID. And then what we're gonna do is just say, let user index equals users. And we're gonna use the find index function to, to get the corresponding index of the user with this ID. And then we'll be able to use the splice function in JavaScript to remove that user. All right, so we'll say users.findindex, and we wanna find the user whose ID, right, u.id is equal to user ID. Cool, and once we've found the user index, assuming of course that it's not negative one, which would indicate that there was no matching user, right, so we'll say if user index is greater than or equal to zero, then what we wanna do is splice that user out of our users array by saying users.splice and we'll want to say start at user index and delete one element from that array. Okay, and that will remove the user from our array. And, in, and once we've done that, we'll want to say response.write head and send back a 200 status code. And then we'll just say response.end like so. Um, actually, we can put this response.end out of the if statement because we're gonna wanna have an else block for if the user wasn't in there. In that case, we're just gonna say response.writehead404 to indicate that the user wasn't found. All right, so that should allow us to successfully delete a user from our user's array. And we can try this out by going over to Postman. And let's try sending a delete request to slash users slash 123. So I'm gonna delete my user here. And if we click send, we should see okay as the status code and now if we send a get request to slash users, we should see that that user is no longer in the array. Awesome, so we have our delete endpoint created and implemented. The last thing we have to do is our handle update user function. So for this one, we're just gonna start off by importing the users array from users.js. And once we've done that, we're going to do pretty much the same thing as we did in the, uh, where was it? Handle create user function, where we put together the user data. So we're just gonna copy these things here and we'll paste them inside handle update user. Although, you know, you might wanna do something like create a helper function to reduce the amount of code that you're copying and pasting. But for now, just to keep things simple, we'll do it this way. And what we're gonna do, this body that we're getting from the client side is just gonna be an object that contains the properties that we wanna update. So if we wanted to update username, the body would look like this. It would just have a property username. And if we wanted to update this to Sean with an exclamation point after it or something like that, then that's what the body would look like. So all we need to do now is change the logic inside request.onEnd. So we're gonna remove this users.push thing and we're gonna find the user with the corresponding user ID. Remember that we're getting the user ID as the third argument, just like we did in handle delete user here. So what we're gonna do is the same thing actually that we did in handle delete user. We're gonna get the user index of the user we wanna update. All right, we'll just paste that down here. And once we've done that, and once we've also received the request body, we're gonna want to basically splice that user out of the array and insert an updated version of the user. So in order to do that, let's just create a new variable down here called updated user equals, and here, this isn't gonna be new user, this will be let updates equals json.parse body, all right? And then uh, our updated user is basically just going to be the current user. So we'll say dot, 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 users, user index, which is all of the data from the current user. And then we're just going to say dot, 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 updates. And because of the way that the spread operator works here, anything that's in this updates object is going to override the data in this original user. Okay, and if you're not familiar with that, don't worry too much about it here. So now that we have our updated user, we're just going to splice the old user out of this user's array and splice this updated user into the array. So what this is gonna look like, we're just gonna say users.splice. We're gonna start at user index. 
we're going to delete one element, right? So that's the user that we're deleting, the old user data. And we're going to insert the updated user. All right, and that's how the splice function works. It can be a little bit confusing remembering what all of these arguments does, but all that that's going to do is in this case, just if we have our objects here, just as an example. All right, it's going to remove the old user and insert the new user in its place. That's all that we're doing here. And once that's happened, we're just going to say response.writehead200 and end the response. And that's about it. Oh, one more thing that we have to do here is we only want to perform all of this updating if the user index uh, was actually found. So what we'll do here is we'll say if user index is greater than or equal to zero, then we want to do all of this stuff here, except for response.end. We'll just leave that outside of there because what we're going to do is just like we did in our delete endpoint, we're going to say else and then we'll say response.writehead404 as the status code. And that should be all we need to do for our update user endpoint. So let's head back to Postman, and we're gonna change this now to send a put request to slash users slash one, two, three, or you know what, let's try and update uh, user uh, 345. So we'll change user 345, we'll change their username here. We'll say something like username, and then we'll change the username to something like, uh, I don't know, awesomeness. Sure, let's do it. All right, so let's click on send now. And what we should see is that we got status 200 okay. And now if we load all of our users, we should be able to see that that user has been updated in our database. So that's our update endpoint, and that completes all of the endpoints in our REST API. So just to review here, we built out a list endpoint, right, which was handle list users. We built a search endpoint, which allowed us to search users with different properties. We created a read user by ID endpoint, which allowed us to get a specific user's data. And we also created update user and delete user endpoints to update and delete users, obviously. And we also created a create user endpoint. So that pretty much completes our REST API. Feel free to go through here and see if you can reorganize things to make things a little cleaner, or you know, see if you can build all of this stuff for a different resource, right? Such as products or articles or you know, whatever your site happens to need. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Previously, we saw how to set up a so-called vanilla Node.js server and how to make that server respond in different ways to different requests. So what we're gonna take a look at in this section is how to use a vanilla Node.js server to handle different request types, right? So if the client sends us different request types such as get requests, post requests, put requests, etc. How do we actually use this vanilla Node.js server, right? Use Node.js's built-in HTTP package to handle requests differently based on their type. And this is also going to include taking a look at how to work with things like URL parameters and query parameters. And also we're gonna see how to parse request bodies if a request that a client sends includes extra data uh, in the form of, let's say, a JSON object. So there's gonna be lots of good content here. Let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, the first thing that we're gonna take a look at is how to find out what request type the client side is actually sending to our server. And then we're gonna see how to actually use that type to manage our requests differently. All right, so what we're gonna do, we have this old server logic that we created earlier. And basically all that this does is it creates a basic HTTP server using Node.js's HTTP package. And we set that up with the on request function that we have up here, which basically takes the request and the response and handles them appropriately. 
All right, so basically what we're gonna do here is just modify this on request callback function so that we can actually take a look at what method was sent, right? What request type, get, post, put, delete, etc. And based on those modifications, we'll basically just be able to handle those requests differently accordingly. All right, so that's our basic plan here. So the first thing to know, and you may have already seen this previously, but the first thing to know is that the request method, there's quite a few different request types that can be specified by the client side, uh, such as get, post, put, delete, and there's a lot more as well, but these are really the main ones that you're gonna be dealing with most of the time. So with each of these, each of these is basically just gonna be used in a different situation. And really most of the time, this request method is just an indicator of what the client side wants our server to do. All right, so if you're familiar with creating things like REST APIs, you'll know that generally get requests are when the client side wants to load some sort of data, right? And this could be if they're requesting something like an HTML file, such as index.html, which is what automatically happens, let's say if you open up your browser and go to google.com, right? Your browser is automatically going to request the index.html file from Google. All right, so that's get requests. And you know, you can also use get requests if you want to load data, right? So, you know, let's say that you're building out a front end using React or, you know, any other kind of JavaScript technology. Uh, chances are you're going to want to load some kind of data from a server. So that could be user data. And that will generally be in the form of a JSON object. And that would be something that you would generally want to send a get request for as well. Okay, now as far as some of the other types of requests, post requests are generally going to be used when the client side wants to include some sort of extra data along with the request. And you'll usually see post requests used when the client side wants to create a new resource on the server. All right, so let's say that we're building, I don't know, a full stack to-do list application and the client side wants to create a new to-do on the server that will be, I don't know, inserted into the database or something like that. Well, generally in that case, we would be sending a post request to the server and that request would contain, usually in the form of JSON data of some sort, all of the necessary data that the server needs to know in order to create that new item in the database. <clears throat> All right, so in the case of a to-do list application, that would probably be the text for the to-do, uh, maybe the due date for the to-do, etc. Okay, so that's what post requests are used for. Uh, put requests are another popular one, and they're similar to post requests in that they'll usually contain some sort of extra data, but Unlike post requests, put requests are usually used when we want to do something like update some sort of data on the server, right? So, you know, if we wanted to uh, mark a to-do list item as completed, right, using the to-do list application as a further example, then we would want to send a put request to the server with any extra data that we need to know about, such as the ID of the to-do list item. Okay, so that's put requests. And the last common one that we're gonna take a look at here, there are, again, many more of these that you can play around with. And, you know, a lot of these are used in very specific situations. But the last common one that we're gonna take a look at here is delete requests. And delete requests are usually used when the client side wants to delete something, right? So, again, just using the to-do list application example, if we wanted to delete an item from our to-do list, right, we just don't want to do it anymore, or we've completed it and want to clear it out, then the client side is usually going to send a delete request to the server, along with some sort of data indicating what to-do list item we want to actually delete, right? Sending the ID. Okay, so these are, generally speaking, the most common request methods that you'll be working with. And in order to handle these in a Node.js server, it's actually pretty straightforward, right? What we're gonna do is get the method from the request. And the way that you can do that is by simply getting the method property from this request argument, right? So just like we can get the URL, which contains the path. And as we saw earlier, we can 
use that URL to basically branch off and have different behavior to, depending on whether the client side sent a request to uh, localhost slash users or localhost slash articles or localhost slash products and so on. All right. So just like we can get that URL from the request argument, we can also get the method. And the method is just going to be a string indicating the method that was used to send that request. All right. So if we just print this out right now, we'll just say console.log. And in backticks here, we'll say something like received a. And then we'll insert the value of method here, request. All right. So if we start up our server here, which you can do either by saying node source slash server.js, or if you follow the setup that we saw previously and installed node daemon into this project, which allows us to automatically restart our server whenever we need to, you can run the command node daemon and then source slash server.js, or if you went the extra step and added a dev script to package.json, all right, and you can check that by just looking in package.json and seeing scripts dev. If you added this thing here, then what you should be able to do is just run npm run dev, and that will automatically run that command for you. And you should see server is listening on port 8080 printed down here, along with a lot of other node daemon stuff. Okay. So now that we've made those changes to our server, what we should be able to do is send a request in a browser to localhost 8080. And if you already have this up, you should just be able to hit refresh. And what we should see is if we go back to our server, our server will have printed out received a get request. And you might see this printed out twice. The first one is going to be the actual request here, as we saw. And the second one is going to be an automatic request from the browser for the fave icon uh, that it should display up here in the top left hand corner. All right, so we see that we have a GET request, and the methods for all of these are going to be all in caps. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with these methods. So what we can actually do now is, in addition to filtering based on the URL, we can filter based on the method as well. All right, so in other words, by combining these two things that we're getting from the request, the method and the URL, we can actually create quite a wide range of different combinations and endpoints for our servers, right? So if we wanted to create a simple REST API for uh, handling users, let's say, we could have a GET request for users, which would allow the client side to load user data. We could have a POST endpoint for our users, which would presumably allow the client side to create a new user, right? If a user logs in, creates a new account or something like that. We could have a put endpoint for users. If the user wants to edit their profile information, the client side would just send that kind of request to our server. And we could also have a delete endpoint for users, which uh, would presumably allow a user to delete their data from our app. Okay, so again, by combining the method and the URL, we can create some pretty complex and usable server interfaces that allow the client side to manage the data effectively for users or articles or products or whatever kind of app it is that we're building, right? If we were building a to-do app, we would just want to say get to-dos and that would probably load all of the to-dos for a user. We might have post to-dos, which would allow the client side to create a new to-do. We could have put to-dos, which would allow the client side to update a to-do in some way, whether that's changing the text or marking a to-do as completed, etc. And we could have a delete to-dos functionality where we actually delete a to-do list item from a user's list. All right. All right, so that's the basic idea. Here's what that might look like in code. And really, it's not much harder than what we did with the URL. All we need to do in this case is branch based on what this method is, right? So let's say that all of these things in here are get functionality, right? So we want to get users, we want to load the articles, we want to load the products, etc. Well, all we would have to do before running this functionality is make sure that the method is equal to get. So we could either do that using a switch case statement, or we could just say if method is equal to get, again, that's gonna be all in caps. And then we could just put all of that functionality inside of here. And there we go. All right, 
So if we run our server again and just check to make sure that this works, let's try loading localhost 8080 slash users. And what we should see is that it says no one, all right? That was the functionality that we added for our users endpoint. And if we were to load articles by saying localhost 8080 slash articles and hitting enter, we would see all of the articles, which is the functionality that we specified here. And the same thing would be true for products as well. All right. Now, in the case that the method is not get, what we would want to do is, is have another branch here. We would probably want to say something like else if method is equal to something like post. And inside here, what we could do is just specify another switch case statement like we did up here. All right, and I'm not going to do that right now. For now, what we'll do is just say something like data equals posted successfully, something like that, just to make sure that we have everything uh, done correctly. And then in order to test this, what we need to do is actually send a post request to our server instead of a get request. And that's what we're going to see how to do next because browsers are really just meant to send get requests for loading data and HTML files. So we're going to need a different strategy to actually test out different methods such as post methods, delete methods, put methods, etc. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at next. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we know how to access the method of a request that our server has received, the next thing that we're gonna need to do, as I said before, is actually see how to test that our server is handling these methods correctly by having a way to actually set those different methods on our requests. Now, there's a very commonly used tool for doing this, and that's the one that I'm gonna recommend you use, and that is called Postman. So Postman is a freely available tool for testing servers as you build them. And if you don't already have it installed, then you can get it from Postman's website, which is just postman.com slash downloads. And you should be able to download that for whatever operating system you're working on. All right, now Postman is a pretty easy tool to work with. And the basic idea here is that it allows us to custom craft any requests that we want to send to our server to make sure that our server is going to handle those requests correctly. All right, so basically this is a much more sustainable alternative to developing our server just by sending requests from the browser or, you know, another approach that many people take, many beginner developers take, is they actually have to build out the front end first in order to test the back end. And neither of those ways is completely sustainable. So Postman is basically just a tool that allows us to test all of our server functionality uh, in isolation without having to build any other tools or use a browser. So once you've downloaded and installed Postman, you're going to want to open that up and it should look something like this. The interface is probably going to change over time, but the basic concepts will stay the same. And you're going to want to create a new request by clicking this little plus button up here in the top left hand corner. All right, so that's going to open up this new tab here. And as you can see, it allows us to specify the URL that we want to send it to, as well as what type of request that you want to send. So you can see right away that there are a lot of different options besides the few that we talked about, right? There's get, post, put, patch, delete, copy, head, options, and many other ones that are used in different situations. But again, we're just going to be focusing on get, post, put, and delete for now, since those are, in my experience anyway, the most commonly used ones. So anyway, those are some options that are available to us. We can set the method, we can set the URL, and we also have the ability to set different things on our request, such as query parameters, which is something we'll talk about later on, any kind of authorization, right? So if a user is using some sort of auth token to prove that they've logged in, this is how you can test something like that. We'll discuss that elsewhere. Don't worry about that for now if you've never worked with that. Uh, we can add extra headers to our requests. We can add a request body, which is something that we're going to talk about shortly. And you can also add other things like pre-request scripts, uh, tests, and you can change some of the other settings that are involved with this request that we're sending. But for now, really all we're going to care about is the request method and the URL. So first things first, let's just test to make sure that Postman is working correctly for us. So 
In order to do that, we're just going to send a simple request to localhost 8080 slash, and then we'll send this to something like slash articles, right? Because we created an endpoint on our server for that. And once you've done that, all you're going to need to do is go over here and click send. And sure enough, what you'll see is that we get this all of the articles response back from the server. Okay, so that works. So let's now test this post request case that we added earlier, right? This uh, else if method is equal to post. And what we should see is this posted successfully message should get sent back to us from the server. So in order to change this request to a post request, we're just gonna change this to localhost 8080, and we're gonna change the request method to post. And then if we click send now, we should see that it says posted successfully. So pretty cool, right? We're now able to actually customize our server's reaction, right? Our server's functionality, depending on what type of request it is that we're receiving. So now that we have this ability, let's go in here and add some different types of request methods. So we'll add else if method is equal to put, and then we'll say data is equal to received a put request. And then we'll say else if method is equal to delete, and we'll say data equals, and we'll just say something like deleting something, all right? And you can make these say whatever you want, but really the main idea here is just to have different responses depending on what that method is. And then if there's some other type of method, besides the main ones that we're working with here, we'll just say else, and we'll say data equals, and we'll say something like, Hmm, I'm not sure what to do with that method. Okay, cool. So now that we've added those things, let's test all of these out. And just as a side note here, your server should have automatically updated as we made those changes because we're running it with Node Daemon. If you chose to just run your server with node source slash server.js, you'll actually have to restart your server manually. So Anyway, let's go back and test this out. What we should be able to do is send things like a post request to our server and click send, and it'll say received a put request. If we send a delete request and click send, we'll say deleting something. And if we send some other type of request that we don't have any cases for and click send, we should see that we get this response back that says, hmm, I'm not sure what to do with that method. Cool, so we're now able to test out different endpoints on our server just by changing the method and customizing the URL here. And one thing to notice is that with some of our requests such as post, put, delete, it doesn't actually matter what that URL is, right? So we could send a post request to localhost 8080 slash blah, blah. All right, and click send, and we're gonna see that we'll get the same response back here as we would have gotten if we had said localhost 8080 without anything after it, right? Same response. And that's the same as if we were to just say localhost 8080 and then just mash keys on our keyboard and click send, we would see that we would get the same response. So in other words, and this is something that can tend to confuse people who are new to server-side development, the URL up here, right? The, the path that we put after our server's host name only matters insofar as we have logic to actually handle different URLs differently, right? So for our get request, we do have this switch case statement where we basically change the data that we're sending back depending on whether it's users or articles or products. But for the rest of our request types here, right? Post, put, and delete, we're just sending back the same data regardless of what that URL is, all right? So in other words, any extra functionality that has to do with this URL is something that we're gonna have to write ourselves, right? There's no intrinsic difference between saying localhost 8080 slash blah, 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 or localhost 8080 slash users or localhost 8080 slash uh, people, unless we've actually specifically define that in our server. So anyway, at this point, we know how to send different request types to our server, and we also know how to actually handle those different request methods accordingly. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we know how to actually tell the difference between post requests, put requests, delete requests, get requests, etc., 
inside our server, and we know how to send those in order to test our server from Postman, the next thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to deal with a request body inside a Node.js server. So we mentioned earlier that with certain request types, such as post requests and put requests, and this can also apply sometimes to get requests and delete requests as well, but that's less common, so we'll just ignore that for now. But with certain types of requests, the client side is going to include some extra data along with this request that the server will need to use in order to complete its given functionality, right? So if uh, let's say that the client side is creating a new user using a post request, well, then the client is probably going to be including some extra data. And for now, we'll just assume that this is in JSON format, although that's not always the case. And that data would include things like the user's email address, probably maybe it would have their password as well and you know, a lot of other data, okay? So that's going to be included in what's referred to as the request body or sometimes request payload. And it's gonna be pretty critical inside our HTTP server that we're creating here that we're actually able to parse this data and use that in whatever way we need to. So unfortunately, unlike the method and the URL of our request object here, which, which we can just get by referencing a simple property on this object, with extra data that's included in a request, things get a little bit more complicated. So essentially the way that this works is when the client side makes a request to our server, I'm just gonna draw those two things up here, the client side is gonna send that data to our server in chunks, right? So basically, you know, if we have data here, let's say that it's user data of some sort, the client side is actually gonna split that up into chunks and send each chunk over to the server individually, right? So we'll have chunk one, we'll send chunk two over, and then we'll send the rest of the chunks in the same way, all right? Now, it's going to be the job of our server to actually take all of these chunks and reassemble them into the original data. Now, this might sound a little bit complicated, but it's actually fairly straightforward because all we have to do is listen for events by using this request object to subscribe to the request. All right, so this is going to be sort of similar to what we had to do when we created a new server, how we passed a callback function to HTTP.createServer that was called whenever we received a request. But in our case here, we're gonna have to subscribe to this individual request and listen for individual chunks, right? So we're gonna have to define a callback function that will get called whenever an individual chunk is received from the client side. Now, this is actually pretty straightforward. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say request dot on and this is a function that takes two arguments the first argument is the name of the event that we want to listen for on the request and every time our server receives a new chunk of data the event that's going to be triggered is going to be called data all right so every time we receive a new chunk it's going to call whatever callback function we pass as the second argument to this so let's actually define a separate function inside on request. We're gonna say function on chunk. And what this function does is it simply takes the new chunk like so, and we're gonna need to basically collect all of those chunks and put them together into the final data. So what that's gonna look like is we're actually just gonna have a variable up here that we modify. So we'll say something like let data and the initial value for this is going to be an empty string that's another thing to realize is that the chunks that we're going to be receiving are always going to be strings and oops it looks like we already have a variable called data down here so let's call this something like uh, request body instead all right so we'll say request body equals and the initial value will be an empty string and then basically what we're going to do is every time we receive a new chunk we're just going to append that chunk to the request body. So we'll just say request body plus equals chunk. And for now, just to illustrate this, let's say console.log and we'll say something like received a new chunk of data. Okay, and that's literally all we need to do in this callback. So once we've done that, we're just gonna say 
on chunk and pass that as the second argument to request.on. And that will take care of accumulating all of the chunks from the request body for us. And when we're done, that request body will be this request body variable up here. Now, there is one more thing that we have to do, and that is once we've received all of the data from the request, all right, once this onChunk function has been called for all of the chunks that the client side is sending to us, what we're gonna need to do is listen for another event which will be called end. So we'll say request.on, and the event name for this is end. And for the callback, we'll just create a new function here called on end. What we're gonna do, this won't take any arguments, we're just gonna say console.log and we'll print out request body, like so. Okay, so let's just pass this on end callback now as the second argument to this request.onEnd, and that should take care of printing out the entire request body for us. So now that we have that set up, let's test this out. Our server should be running correctly. You might wanna just check that to make sure you don't have any syntax errors. And then what we're gonna do is head over to Postman, and let's try sending a post request to our server. And in order to add a body, here's what we have to do. You just need to click on this body tab underneath the URL and request method. And then what we're gonna do is select raw. And from this drop down here, we'll just select text for now. And let's just send something like hello from postman. And if we click send now, what we should see is, first of all, we'll get this response back that says posted successfully. But now if we go back to our server and take a look in the console, we should see that it says received a new chunk of data. All right, so that callback is only getting called once here, right? Because the extra data we're sending is very short. If your data is longer, then you may get several chunks. And then we see that it says hello from Postman, which is the entire request body that we're logging out here, okay? So just for fun, let's try and make this request body a little bit longer to see if we can get multiple chunks. I'm just gonna copy that and paste it multiple times here. There we go, so let's try clicking send again to see if we get multiple chunks in that case. And here, let's scroll up past all of that. And nope, it looks like there's still only one chunk. So presumably this data is only going to be chunked with much larger pieces of data than what we're able to achieve just by copying and pasting. So, you know, if you wanna just sit there and copy and paste this until you generate quite a bit of text, be my guest, go ahead and do that. Or, you know, if you wanna try copying and pasting the text from some ebook into here and sending that, chances are you'll see that you'll get multiple chunks. But anyway, that's how we deal with extra data that's included with these different types of requests. So the next thing that I wanna look at here, we've already seen how to send basic text data. Let's see how to send JSON data instead and handle that on our server. All right, so first of all, in order to send JSON data from Postman here, all you need to do is, in addition to selecting raw from the options here, we're gonna select JSON from this dropdown instead of text. And inside here now, we'll just specify a simple JSON object. We'll say something like A1, B2, and let's try C3. Okay, so that's a JSON object. And if we click send now, what we should see is first of all, again, we're getting posted successfully. And if we go back here now, what we should see is that it says received a new chunk of data. And sure enough, we have this JSON string here. Now, one thing to notice, and this is very important to notice when you're trying to actually work with JSON data on your server, is that this is not yet an actual JavaScript object, right? This is just a JSON string. As you can see, if you print out, we'll just say console.log, and we'll say type of, there we go, request body. Well, that's obviously going to print out string. So let's just try that again. We'll click send. And sure enough, this is a string. All right, so if we wanna actually convert this into a JavaScript object so that we can access its properties, change its properties, etc., then what we're gonna to wanna to do is parse that by saying something like uh, let request body object equals, and then we'll say json.parse and we're gonna try parsing that request body there, all right? And now if we try and print out request body object by saying console.log request body object, we should see that it's an actual JavaScript object now. So let's try sending this again. 
And sure enough, if we go back here, we see that it is indeed a JavaScript object. And you know, if we wanted to do things like print out different properties of it, we could do that just by using actual JavaScript, right? So we can see that we're able to access the property A on our request body now that we've parsed it. Okay, so that's the basics of receiving and parsing a JSON request body from the client side. But one more thing to notice here is if we take a look at all of our logic for responding, right, where we say let data, status code, and then we take care of actually saying response.writehead and response.end, notice that all of this stuff isn't actually going to specifically happen after all of the data is received. So in other words, if we tried to send back the response data in one of these requests here, right? So for our post request here, let's say something like received data, and then we'll say request body like so. Well, if we try this again by sending this request, what we're gonna see is that it says received data and there's just nothing there. Now, the reason for this, and this is something that it takes some getting used to if you haven't worked with it before in JavaScript, the reason for this is that the code that we're specifying inside these callback functions on chunk and on end isn't actually going to be called right away, right? In other words, JavaScript is going to execute all of this code here, right? It's going to define these functions, but not execute them. It's gonna run this code here. It's gonna run all of this code here. And then these two functions back up here are just going to sit and wait for these events to occur. All right, which most of the time is going to happen after the rest of this code down here has already executed. So the moral of this story is this. If you need to access the request body, what you're gonna to need to do is actually put all of this logic for responding to the request inside this on end function, or at least have the on end function call some other function with this logic inside of it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna define another function containing all of our original logic, and we'll call this something like handle request. All right, and this is just gonna contain all of the logic that we defined earlier. And the purpose of this is that it will make sure that this logic is only run after we've actually parsed the request body. So let's indent that here. And then what we're gonna do is from on end, we're just going to say handle request. So in other words, at this point, we know that our request body object exists. And in fact, we can even pass this to our handle request function by saying request body object. And then we'll just say something like uh, body. And now we can actually send back the request body to the client side by saying received data body. Okay, so let's try this again. We're just gonna click send. And sure enough, we'll now see that we have received data. And all we see here is just this little JavaScript abbreviation that it uses for a JavaScript object when we try and convert it into a string. But you know, if you wanted to stringify that again, you could say json.stringify. And basically that would convert that into a string. So let's try this again. We're gonna click send. And sure enough, we see that we have all of that data inside of here. All right, so anyway, that's how to parse and work with request bodies in Node's HTTP server. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna take a look at here, now that we've seen how to do things like work with the different request methods and parse the request body, we're gonna see how to access information that's stored in both query parameters and URL parameters. Now, first of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with this terminology, query parameters are basically extra pieces of data, extra string data that we can add at the end of the URL. So let's say that we send a request to localhost uh, 8080, and then we have whatever our path is. Well, what you're gonna see, and you can see this if you go to sites like Amazon or really any website, right? This is a very common thing for websites to use. You're gonna see at some point there's a question mark in the URL. And, and after that, you'll have a series of variables, so to speak, or keys and values that look something like this, right? So you might have name equals, and then you might have Sean, right? 
Now what this is, this is a query parameter and it's basically the URL equivalent of sending a JSON object that looks like this, where you would have name as the key and Sean as the value, okay? And this can be a very handy way to include extra, just little pieces of information in the URL. And it can be especially useful for doing things like uh, adding filters, right? So, you know, if we wanted to allow users to search for cars, let's say that we were building a car searching website. Well, what you could do in that case is you could just have the client side send a request to uh, whatever your server's URL is, slash cars, and then you could have the additional filters here, right? So you could have something like color equals red as one of the filters. You might also want to specify um, type equal to SUV, in which case you would actually have to add an ampersand symbol, right? This is how you divide one query parameter from another inside the query parameters list. And then you would have after that type equals SUV. Okay, and I'm just putting this on another line because I ran out of space, but this would normally be right after this ampersand symbol. So anyway, that's how query parameters work, and they're useful for many different situations. I'm sure that we'll run into certain situations like that uh, later on. But URL parameters are actually a little bit different. So URL parameters are extra pieces of data that, that are actually included in the segments of the path, right? So... Uh, let's say that we want to load data for a specific user from our server. Well, what we could do is from localhost, blah, blah, blah. I'm, just, I'm not going to write out the whole thing there anymore. We would load localhost 8080 slash users slash, and then we would usually have something like the user's ID. So if the user's ID was 123, then it would look like that. Now, in this case, when the client side sends a request to something like slash users slash 123, what the server is going to need to be able to do is look at this part of the URL and parse out its value, right? So that we can actually find the data for that user and send back just that user's data. All right, now the tricky part here is that we can't just define this as a single path, right? Up here in our code, we can't just say something like uh, case and then say slash users slash one, two, three, right? because the client side is obviously going to have to load data for all of our users. So in that case, we would need case slash users slash uh, two, three, four, if there was another user with that ID and then three, four, five. And then basically we would need to define a specific route for all of our users, which is definitely not an ideal uh, solution for this. Okay, so that's the tricky part with URL parameters. So what we need to do with URL parameters is we basically just need to be able to parse that path. And we can usually separate the path by these slash things, as you'll see. And we just need to know where in those segments to look to find that value, right? So in this case, we have one, two, three. So we would just need to know that if we split this path string by uh, this forward slash symbol, it would be in index one that we'd find the user's ID, all right? So it's a little trickier to work with URL parameters, but that's something that we're gonna see in just a moment here. But first, let's start off with query parameters. So query parameters, as we saw, are just that little question mark thing with keys and values that comes after the main path of the URL. And as a matter of fact, the query parameters are included as part of this URL property that we're getting from the request. So if we just uh, print out the request here, we'll say console.log and we'll just print out the URL. What you're gonna see is that the URL will include any query parameters that we put after the main path. So if we run our server, right? My server's already running here and go back to Postman and we'll say localhost 8080 slash uh, people and then we'll add name equals Sean, okay? If we click send now, what we're gonna see if we go back to our server is that above where it says received a new chunk of data, one, blah, 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 we see slash people and then we see this full query parameter string that comes after that. So the first order of business here when working with query parameters is gonna need to be actually parsing out that query parameter and separating from the main path in our URL. Because what you'll also see, if we go back and change this back to a get request and remove the request body, 
and send this to something that we actually have a case for in our case statement here, like slash articles. All right, we'll say localhost 8080 slash articles and then name equals Sean. What we're gonna see in this case is that our server won't actually have gone down the correct route with articles. Oops, and it looks like we got an error here. Uh, it says unexpected end of JSON input. And the reason for this is when we called json.parse up here on our request body, since in this case, we didn't have a request body, calling json.parse just threw an error. So what we're gonna wanna do here is say something like if request body Make sure that that exists first. All right, so we'll just do it like that, and then we'll put the rest of the stuff in here. Okay, and otherwise we'll just say handle request and call it without any arguments. So let's try this again. All right, our server should be back up and running after those changes. If we click send now, what we should see is that it says there is no handler for that path, right? Now this might be a little confusing because we already have slash articles defined as one of our paths inside our server. But if you take a look at the actual URL, notice that the URL, because of the query parameters, no longer matches the case that we defined down here, right? So in other words, in order to make the stuff that we defined earlier work correctly, we're gonna have to parse this URL into a separate path and the query parameters. Now the good news here is that we don't have to do this manually. If you want to, you're more than welcome to do so, but I wouldn't recommend it because Node.js actually provides another package called URL that helps us with dealing with URLs. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say import URL from URL. And then what we're gonna do is once we've got this URL from our request, we're actually going to use the URL package to parse it. Now the function that is included on this URL package for parsing URLs is called url.parse. And if you wanna see what that looks like, we can just print that out. We'll say url.parse, and we'll have to actually call this something other than URL. So let's import this URL package up here as URL uh, parser, something like that. And then we'll say URL parser.parse. All right, so let's just print out what that gives us. So we'll say console.log URL parser dot parse. And if we go back here and click send, what we should see is that sure enough, it has this URL object that contains protocol slashes off, blah, blah, blah. And then down here, we see that sure enough, it's separated all of these things apart into different properties, depending on what exactly it is we need. So we have the search string, which is basically just all of the URL parameters, including the question mark. We have the actual query itself, which is all of the query parameters without the question mark. And then we have the path name, which is just the path without the query parameters. So this will hopefully make our switch case statement that we created earlier work again. And then we have path and href, which is just the entire thing that we had before. All right, so first things first, let's actually get the search and path name from our URL. And to do that, we just need to say something like let path name and search equals url.parse url. And I'm not sure why this parse function is getting crossed out in my IDE, just ignore that for now, sorry about that. So now we should have the path name and the search string. So the first thing that we'll need to do is go down to our switch case statement and say switch and change this now to path name. All right, so that should make our articles thing work again. So let's just test that out by clicking send. And sure enough, we'll see that we get the response, all of the articles, even though we've included this query parameter string. Cool, so the next thing that we need to do now is actually parse the query parameters. And to do this, again, the good news is that we don't have to do this manually, right? We don't need to go through the string, find the question marks, the equal signs, the ampersands, etc. Although that might be a good programming exercise if you're interested in doing that yourself. Uh, but there's actually a built-in package in Node.js which is called query string. And to use that, we're just gonna say import QS from query string. And then in order to use this, we just need to say let query params equals, and then we're just gonna say QS dot parse. And we're gonna pass the search string to that as an argument. So, Let's run this again, and actually let's just print out the query parameters so that we can see what those are. 
And what we should see if we send this request again is that sure enough, it prints out this new object that says name and Sean. And actually, uh, it looks like it picked up on this question mark, which, which means that instead of the uh, search property here, we actually want the query property. So let's try that again. We're just going to change this to query instead of search. All right, so we'll say query. And then we'll say qs.parse query. And again, my IDE is crossing out QS for some reason. Just ignore that for now. And let's just test this out again. We're going to send this request one more time. And sure enough, we should see that it has name and Sean as this object. So let's also try adding some more query parameters just to make sure that this works the way we think it does. What we're gonna do is separate this using an ampersand symbol. And let's try something like uh, last name equals wassail. All right, and we'll change name here to first name. So let's click send here and see if that works. And sure enough, we see that it's correctly parsed first name and last name into an object. So that's how to work with query parameters in Node.js. So let's now take a look at how to work with URL parameters. Now with URL parameters, as I said before, basically what we need to do is manually parse that URL, right? Which is going to be found now in path name instead of in URL, just as a reminder. And we're just gonna need to know where exactly we expect to find that value, whether that's someone's ID or someone's name or a category of some sort. And we're just gonna need to use that in some way. So for now, what we're gonna do is we'll add this to the user's case. And unfortunately, this actually isn't going to work anymore with our switch case statement, right? Because what we're gonna need to do is check to see whether the URL starts with slash users instead of whether or not the URL is equal to slash users. All right, so we're actually gonna remove this case statement from our switch case. And what we're gonna do instead is say if path name dot starts with, and we'll say slash users like so. And then inside there, we'll put all of the logic that we had before, right? We'll say data equals no one, and we don't need break anymore. And then we'll just say else, and for now, anyway, we'll just have all of our switch case inside of there. So we'll just copy this and we'll put it inside else. So it's getting a little messy here, but later on, we'll take a look at how to clean this up and actually start to create our own server side framework. So anyway, now that we've done that and said, if path name starts with slash users, Inside this if statement, we're gonna to want to allow the client side not only to load slash users, but also we're gonna want the client side to be able to send a request to something like slash users slash uh, one, two, three. And in this case, we would want to specifically load user one, two, three. So in order to do this, what we're gonna to have to do is actually split apart this uh, path name into segments. So here's what that'll look like. We'll just say let uh, URL segments, we'll call it, equals path name dot split. And we're gonna split it apart by the forward slash character. And then what we're gonna do is check to see how many URL segments there are, right? Because if there's only one URL segment, then that means we just wanna load all of the users and that's all we'll have to do. So we'll just say if URL segments dot length is equal to one, then what we'll do is just say data equals loading all of the users, we'll say, okay? Otherwise, if the URL segments is longer than that, what we're gonna wanna do is get the value of the second URL segment, right? Which is gonna be index one. So in that case, what we'll do is say else, and then we'll say data equals, and uh, we'll say something like, here, we'll put it in back ticks. We'll say loading user, and then we'll put in the user's ID, which as we've already seen is going to be URL segments index one. Okay, so that should allow us to successfully get the corresponding URL parameter value. So let's give this thing a try. First of all, we're gonna want to try sending a request to slash users and we'll click send here. And oops, it looks like something didn't go quite right because Actually, the first segment of our URL here is registering as index one. And I'm guessing that's because it starts with a slash. So what we're actually gonna wanna do here is remove that first slash character. So we'll just say path name 
dot slice. I believe we should be able to use slice here, dot split. And we'll just get everything from the first character onward. All right, so by saying path name dot slice, we're just removing that initial forward slash, which should give us what we want. So let's try this again. We're gonna click send. And sure enough, it says loading all of the users. And if we try saying slash users slash one, two, three, for example, and click send, we'll see that it says loading user one, two, three. All right, so that's how to work with URL parameters. And we also saw how to work with query parameters. So I hope this has been informative for you. And I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. In previous sections, we've seen how to use Node.js's built-in HTTP package to set up basic web servers and make those servers handle a pretty wide variety of different requests and situations. So now that you've learned all of that, you may have found yourself wondering, is it possible to use Node.js's built-in HTTP package to create your own unique web frameworks such as Express? And the answer to that question is yes, and that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. So what we're going to be doing here is using Node.js's built-in HTTP package to design and build our own server framework that we can use to more easily create web servers. So that's what we're going to be doing here today. Let's jump right in. All right, so the first step in building your own server-side framework is usually going to be putting some thought into what you want the framework to look like and how you want it to be organized. All right, now, there are already quite a few different server-side frameworks out there for you to look to for inspiration, right, such as Express or Happy or Koa.js, and... All of these kind of do things in slightly different ways. What we're gonna do here is just talk a little bit about what sort of structure we're gonna be building our framework around. And you know, if you wanna stick to this basic structure that I'm gonna describe here, feel free to do so. If you want to kind of branch out on your own and try and figure out your own organization for your server-side framework, you can also do that as well. So a server-side framework is going to need to allow us to do basically everything that we've already defined inside all of our messy server code up here at the top, right? It's going to have to do things like allow us to add different endpoints with different methods, right? So we'll need a way to do things like add uh, a get endpoint for slash users, for example. All right, and we'll also need a way to handle things like URL parameters, all right? That's basically what we did here where we got a user ID, right, from the URL parameter so that someone could say slash users slash one, two, three, and we would be able to parse this part of the URL in our server. All right, and we're also gonna need a way to handle query parameters, which is something that we did up here where we basically parsed all of those query parameters and logged them out. And additionally, we're also gonna need a way to parse the request body if the client side sends a request body along with their request, right? So we're gonna need to incorporate all of this logic here uh, into our server side framework somehow. So in other words, we're gonna need to come up with an overarching design that will allow us to add different endpoints and allow us to easily access all of those different things like the query parameters, URL parameters, request body, etc., without having to manually do it like we were having to do up above, right? We wanna make this as easy as possible for ourselves uh, when we're using this framework, which is after all the purpose of a framework in the first place. So what I'm gonna recommend here is that the server framework we design is going to be based around the idea of using, is going to be based around the concept of using a simple JavaScript array of JavaScript objects in order to define all of our routes. And each of these objects is basically going to contain a few simple things. The first thing is going to be the method that we want to listen for on this route, right? So we might have method get, let's say, or we might have post or put or whatever. Uh, the second thing that each of these route definitions is going to have is the path that we want to listen for. All right, so, you know, if we want to listen for get requests on slash users, 
then that's basically what that would look like there, right? We would specify the method as a property, and we would also specify the path here as a property. And lastly, what we're gonna need is a simple callback function that will get called whenever our server receives this exact request, right? A request that fits this specification. All right, and for this, what we're gonna do is specify an on request property, and you can call this something else if you want. You can call it handler, whatever. But the basic idea here is that this is going to be a callback function that will take all of the relevant information, right, such as the query parameters, the request body, et cetera, as arguments of some kind. All right, we'll decide what that looks like later on, but for now, we know that they'll somehow be expressed as arguments. And basically what it's gonna do, right, we're just gonna have this on request callback function do some sort of processing work, right? So if it needs to connect to a database or, you know, uh, modify some data in the database, et cetera, if it needs to send emails, if it needs to do whatever it is that it needs to do, that'll be inside here. And finally, when we want our server to send back a response to the client, the way that we're going to specify that is by simply returning an object that will contain both the status code that we want to send back to the client side and any additional response data that we want to send back to the client side. All right, and we're going to do this by simply returning an object that will have a status code property. Okay, so we'll just say return status code, and this will be something like 200. And We'll also have a request data, or response data rather, and this will just include any extra data that we want to send back to the client, and that can either be a JSON object or a string or whatever we want it to be. Okay, so that's what our route definitions are going to look like, and basically what we're going to do is just create a bunch of these objects, right? One object for every route that we want to add to our server, and the way that our server framework is gonna work is we're basically going to take this array of route definitions and pass it to our framework as an argument, right? So, you know, let's say that we wanna call this server framework that we're creating my server, all right? <laughs> then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say my server dot create. And then what we'll do is we'll simply pass all of our route definitions, right? That's going to be this array here with all of our route objects inside of it. And that's going to create a new server, right? So we'll wanna say something like let server equals my server dot create, blah, blah, blah. And then we'll be able to simply tell our server to start listening by saying server dot listen. And this is gonna work very similarly to what we saw up here with the basic HTTP server. We're just gonna pass the port number and we're gonna pass the callback function uh, that will be called when our server is actually up and running. So we'll just call that CB there for callback. And that's pretty much how our server framework will work, right? You'll see this pattern quite a lot with uh, different server frameworks, right? Something similar to this where you're creating a new server and you're just starting that server listening, right? That's really the main things that a server needs to be able to do. And really all of the other functionality that we're gonna need is going to be taken care of in this uh, route definitions array that we're gonna pass to myserver.create or whatever we end up calling the function. All right, so now that we've discussed the basic design and structure of our server side framework, Let's just discuss some of the advantages that this is gonna give us over the code that we currently have written in this server.js file. All right, and this is what we've been working on over the course of the past few sections. So basically, uh, as we've seen already, this code is getting really tangled and hard to read, and it's really just becoming very bulky and monolithic, so to speak. So what our server framework is gonna allow us to do is break up all of this code into separate files, right? Or separate functions or whatever we wanna do. And the way that that's going to work is we'll be able to define each route as an object inside its own file, right? So, you know, if we wanna define a get users route, we'll just say method get, all right? We'll say path, and this will be slash users. And then we'll have our on request or whatever we wanna call that property there. And this will be the callback function there. All right, and then we would just take this and we would probably export it from its own file. So we could say something like 
export uh, get users route. I'll just abbreviate that like so. And we would be able to then import that into some central server file, right? Like server.js. And we would import this along with all of the other route definitions and add those to our server all at once as an array. Okay, and if this doesn't quite make sense yet, if you can't quite picture it, you'll see what this looks like a little later on once we've created our server-side framework. But that's the basic idea, is that this framework is A, going to make things a lot easier for us because it will take care of all of the complicated request body parsing and stuff that we saw up here, right? And B, it will also make it easier for us to separate our different route logic because currently, as I said, this logic is just very monolithic. It's all in the same file because you know, we're using a switch case statement or an if statement or whatever. All right, so this will allow us to more effectively break up our code as well, right? So anyway, that's the basic design of our server-side framework that we're gonna be building. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've put a little bit of thought into designing the server-side framework that we're gonna build, let's actually jump into at least getting the basic groundwork laid out for our framework. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create a new file inside our project here. And let's call our file whatever we wanna name this framework. I'll just call mine something like cool server. Dot .js, all right, you can name yours whatever, that's a pretty lame name, but I wanna try and avoid uh, any kind of copyright infringement or whatever if someone happens to be using a name that I come up with that I think is cool and it happens that they're already using it. So anyway, now that we've created this new file, what we're gonna do here is define the basic functions that we want this framework to provide. Now, all right, now as we saw before, basically what our server.js file is gonna do is import this framework, probably by saying something like import uh, cool server from, and then that'll be our file name here, obviously. Okay, and then what it's gonna do is it's gonna create a new server by saying something like let server equals cool server. I'll just shorten that to CS here uh, to make it easier to write. And then we'll say dot create, okay? And this is what we're gonna be passing our routes array to, okay? So right away, we know that we're gonna need this create function on our framework. So what we're gonna do here is say export default and the default export of this is going to be an object that contains that create function as a property, all right? So we'll say create, and as we saw, this will be a function here. So we'll just use the parentheses, and we'll say routes. And then what it's going to do is it's going to create a server inside of here. So we'll say create server. And then what we're gonna wanna do, right, since we're gonna be saying let server equals, and then calling this create function, we're gonna want to return another object from this function that will contain the listen function that will actually start the server listening. So what that's gonna look like is we're just gonna say return, and we're gonna return an object here with the property listen, and this is going to be a function that will start the server. So uh, as we already saw, this is gonna need to take two arguments. The first argument is gonna be the port number, and the second argument is gonna be a callback function that we'll need to call once the server is actually up and running. So uh, what we're gonna do is inside this function now, we're just gonna start the server, which we'll need to write the code for later on. And then what we're going to do is call the callback function once the server has been successfully started. Okay, so this is the basic layout for our framework and it's actually pretty straightforward. Right, a lot of the complexity is going to come in when we start doing things like automatically parsing request bodies, uh, you know, adding just basic route listeners, etc. And that's something that we'll see how to do later on. But now that we have this thing, let's first of all just import it into our server.js file and we'll start using it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually going to move all of our current code that we have in server.js into another file and we'll just call that file something like reference.js since we'll be using this as a reference for building our server-side framework. So I'm just gonna take all of the code that's in here, 
cut all of it out and paste it all inside reference.js. All right, so we'll be looking back to this code periodically as we build out our framework. So now inside our server.js file, we're gonna want to import our cool server uh, framework that we're building and we'll just call that CS. So we'll say import CS from cool server. Oops, there we go, dot slash cool server dot JS. And then of course, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our server by saying let, and then we'll say something like server equals cs.create. And we're gonna pass our routes to this. Right now it's just gonna be an empty array. And then what we're gonna do is start our server listening by saying server.listen. And for this, we're gonna pass our port and we can already see that the IDE is picking up on our definition that we have in this file, which is pretty cool. So for now, we'll just say port 8080. And for the callback function, we'll just say something like uh, server, here, console.log that is. And then we'll say server is listening on port 8080. All right, so that's what our server is gonna look like. And this is really all that we're gonna need to do once we've built out our framework is you know, call this create function and then call server.listen on the return value of cs.create. So all of the complexity from now on is gonna be in defining these actual route objects and we'll get there very shortly and actually taking those routes and mapping them to some sort of functionality inside our cool server framework that we're building. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at next. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've set up the basic export for our cool server, server-side framework that we're gonna be creating, the next thing that we're gonna to have to do is actually start defining some routes and then adding some code to our cool server framework that will actually handle requests in the manner we specify in the route objects, all right? So the first thing that we're gonna do is define our first route and we're just gonna make this a very simple route. We'll make it a sort of hello world route. So we'll just call this hello-route.js. And basically what this is gonna be is a simple JavaScript object containing the method, path, and handler function for our first route that we're gonna be creating. So uh, what we're gonna do is say export default, and our default export here is, is going to be the object that I mentioned, which will have a method property. All right, so we'll just say get uh, we'll also have a path property, which uh, will be something like slash hello, I suppose, for this case. And then we'll have our on request uh, callback function here that should get called whenever our server receives a request that matches these two pieces of information up above. And what's gonna happen there is we're gonna have all of our arguments passed to this. But for now, while we're just trying to get our server up and running, uh, we'll just leave the arguments empty. And then inside the body of this function, remember what we're gonna wanna do is have our on request function return the status code and any extra data that it wants to send back to the client side. So what that's gonna look like, in this case anyway, is we're just gonna say return, and then we'll be returning an object that contains the status code, which we'll say status code 200. And we'll also return extra data that we wanna send back to the client. And in this case, we'll just say something like, hello from the cool server framework. All right, and that is going to be our very simple first route. And by the way, all of our routes are eventually going to be defined like this, although they may well get a lot more complex than this route that we've currently defined. But now that we have this basic route defined, what we're gonna need to do is add some logic to our cool server JS uh, create function that will actually take all of these route definitions and handle them in the way that each route has specified in its on request callback property. All right, so what this is gonna look like, first of all, let's import our hello route into server.js. So we'll say import hello route from and then dot slash hello route dot JS. And once we've done that, what we're gonna do is define our routes array by saying let routes equals, and then inside this array, we'll add 
the only route that we currently have, which is going to be the hello route. And then what we'll do is when we call coolServer.create, we're going to call that function with this routes array. All right. So this array now is no longer an empty array. It's, it's an array of objects that define different routes that we want on our server. Okay, so now that we know what calling this function is going to look like and what the route definitions are going to look like, let's head into our coolserver.js file and see how we can take these route objects that we have in this routes array and translate those into the exact server functionality that we're looking for. Okay, so what we're going to do here is behind the scenes, we're going to use the Node.js HTTP package, right? This is just the basic package that we've already seen how to use elsewhere. And it's really about as low level as you can get in Node.js if you want to build web servers. So the HTTP package is usually what's behind the scenes in frameworks such as Express or Happy or any of those other frameworks that you might be familiar with in Node.js. So ours is going to do the same kind of thing, and it will do that by importing the HTTP package. So we'll say import HTTP from HTTP. And the first thing that we're going to do is actually create an HTTP server. Okay, so we'll do that by saying let server equals and here's where we can look to our old server file as a reference. So let's just open up reference.js here. And let's look for where we created our server in the first place with this. Here it is, we say let server equals HTTP dot create server. And then we have this on request callback function that will get called whenever our server receives a request. So what this is going to look like back in our cool server framework file is we're going to want to say equals HTTP dot create server. And what we're going to need to do here is create our own callback function that will be called whenever our cool server framework server receives a request. So it's going to be very similar to what we had inside our reference.js file, right? This callback function is going to take a request object and a response object, which will just abbreviate like so. And oops, I put the arrow there when I shouldn't have. And then inside here, what we're going to have to do is look through this routes array and figure out whether any of these routes matches the current request that we've received. So first things first, in order to figure out what sort of request we received and what path it was on, we're going to need to look back to our reference.js file with all of our old code. And remember that what we had to do was get both the method and the URL from the request object here. So, and additionally, we also had to use this URL parser, right? This URL package that's included with Node.js in order to actually split that URL, right? Which is just the path that comes after the main localhost 8080. And we have to split that basically into the path name, which, which is only the part with the slashes in it, right? So slash users, for example, and the query object, which contains any query parameters. So uh, what we're going to need to do, I'm just going to copy this for now, and we'll put that into our cool server.js file right inside our callback function here. And oops, since we called this request, actually, let's change this to request and response instead of abbreviating them just to make it easier to copy and paste stuff from our reference file that we're sort of dividing up right now. And we're also going to need this URL package. So let's just say import URL parser from URL. And we're renaming it to URL parser because URL is a very common uh, variable name that we're going to need down here. And we wouldn't be able to use it if we, if we were to name this package URL up at the top. Okay, so at this point we have the corresponding method for the request and the path name that the request was received on. So what we're gonna need to do now is look through this routes array and figure out whether we have any routes that match the request that we just received. Okay, so what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say let matching route equals and we're going to use the routes.find function in order to find a corresponding route whose method property and path property match this request. So what that's going to look like is we're just going to say routes.find. And for each route, we're just going to check to see whether the routes method property equals the method of the request. So we'll say return route.method is equal to method. All right, that's the method we got from the request. And we're going to want to check. 
So we'll do the double ampersand there. And we're going to want to check whether the route's path property is equal to the path name that we parsed out of the URL that we received the request on in the first place. All right. So this will return the matching route for us. And if there is a matching route, what we're going to want to do is call that route's callback function, right? Remember that we defined that as a property called onRequest. So what we're going to want to do inside our cool server.js file is we're going to say if there was a matching route, all right, so we'll say if matching route, then what we want to do is call that matching route's onRequest function. So we'll say something like matching route dot on request. And we don't need to pass any arguments to it right now, although we definitely will want to do that later on. And since this is going to return the response that we want to send back to the client, what we're going to do is say let, and then we'll say status code and data equals matching route dot on request. Okay. So now that we have the status code and data that we want to send back to the client, all we need to do is look at our reference.js file one more time to see how we did this in our old code. And remember that what we did is once we came up with the status code and the data that we wanted to send back, we just called response.writehead with the status code and response.end with the data. So we can just take both of these things out of here and put them in our cool server file. And that should match up perfectly with our framework code. Okay, so now that we have that, the next thing that we're going to want to do is handle the case where there is no matching route. And in this case, we can kind of decide what we want to do, right? If there's no matching route, do we just want our server to stay silent? Do we want it to throw an error? Or do we want it to just respond back to the client side with a message saying, sorry, there's no route that matches that, uh, that specification? Now, the last one is obviously considered to be the best way to go about that since it basically hands off responsibility to the client instead of making our server worry about it. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to say response dot right head and we'll send back the status code of 404, right? Because the route wasn't found and we'll say response dot end and we'll just send back a message saying something like there is no route for and actually we'll change this now to backticks so, so that we can insert the method and path. And then we'll just say dollar sign curly braces uh, method. And then after that, we'll say dollar sign curly braces and we'll put the path name. All right, so you know if the user tries to send a get request to slash users and we don't have a route for that, our server is simply going to respond. There is no route for get slash users. All right, and that's pretty much all we need to do in order to map the HTTP server functionality, which is a sort of raw, low-level, built-in package for creating web servers in Node.js to a much more usable version that we're building here that allows us to define all of our routes in a very simple way like we did in our hello route. All right, so we're going to be able to test this very shortly, but before that will actually work, what we're going to need to do is have our server actually start listening when we call server.listen back in our server.js file, right? We need this to actually do something because currently it's just empty, right? So here's what we're going to need to do for that. We've already created our server up here. So now we just need to go down here to this object that we're returning and inside the listen callback function, we're just going to say server.listen and we're going to pass through that port number uh, so we'll say port like so and then we'll call the callback function when that server is listening so basically this listen function that we're returning is currently identical to the basic http server way of doing things that might change in the future right right and in fact we could change this right now by saying something like console.log and then we'll say something like welcome to uh, the cool server framework. All right. And already it's starting to diverge from the regular HTTP package functionality. Cool. So now that we have that set up, let's give this thing a try and see if we did everything correctly. All right. So let's run our server.js file, which now has this hello route that we're adding to our server that should just send back the message hello to the client side. So let's run our code. What we're going to do is just say node, and then we'll say source slash server.js and hit enter. And sure enough, we see welcome to the cool server framework. Server is listening on port 8080. And if we open up our browser now and try and go to localhost 8080 slash hello, 
Sure enough, we'll see this response that says hello from the cool server framework. And if we happen to change this to a different type of request, right? If we say something like localhost 8080 slash blah, 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 then we'll see this message that we added here that says there is no route for get slash blah, 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 blah. Okay, so cool. Our server framework is now up and running. So the next thing that we're gonna need to do is actually start adding some of the more complex functionality to our framework that will automatically take care of doing things like parsing query parameters, parsing URL parameters, and uh, handling the request body. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at next. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so at this point, we've added some basic functionality to our cool server framework that allows us to define our routes as objects, like what we did here with our hello route, and add those to our server uh, simply by passing those objects, those route definitions, to our framework's create function. So the next thing that we're gonna need to do here is allow ourselves easy access to things like query parameters inside our routes handler function, right? Inside this on request callback function that gets called when we receive a request that matches these two other properties. So what this is going to look like, let's start off with the easiest part of that, and that's going to be passing any query parameters that we have to our routes handler. So what this is going to look like, all we're really going to need to do is down here when we call matching route dot on request, we're going to need to pass those query parameters as an argument somehow. And we could just pass it like this by saying query. But what I'm going to recommend instead, since there is a fair amount of data that will eventually want to pass to this function, right, such as URL parameters, request body, headers, etc. What I'm going to recommend you do is simply pass this as properties in an object. So let's just say query for now. And this will pass an object argument to on request with the property query. Now, what this means is if we go to hello route, what we can now do if we wanted to access the query parameters is add some sort of argument to this on request function, right? So we could say something like uh, request info or whatever. And then if we wanted to print out those query parameters, we could just say something like console.log and then request info dot and we called this property query for query parameters so now that we have that let's try this again we're going to need to restart our server and as a matter of fact we can run this using our npm run dev script that we created a little while ago in our package.json so let's just run that now and that will just take care of automatically restarting our server whenever we make changes all right, so now that our server is listening again, let's go back and try sending this request again with some query parameters. So we'll say slash hello, and then we'll add some query parameters. So we'll say something like A equals one, ampersand B equals two, ampersand, and the ampersand, in case you don't remember that, is just how we separate individual query parameters here. And then we can say C equals three. So if we hit enter now, we'll see that we get back that response that we're returning from our hello route. And if we go back to our server, what we should see is in the console, we have our query string being passed to our routes on request function. Now this is great, but we're actually gonna wanna take this a step further because this query string isn't usually something that we're gonna want to work with directly inside our route handlers, right? So what we're gonna have our cool server framework do is actually parse these query parameters for us and then pass them in to this matching route.onRequest function. Okay, so all we need to do for that is the same kind of thing that we did earlier when we, when we learned how to parse query parameters. So let's open up our reference.js file and find that here. We're gonna need this query string package that is included by default with Node.js, so you don't need to install this or anything. And then we're just gonna need to call qs.parse on our query string that we had from before. So what we're gonna do is go back to cool server We'll import that query string package by saying import QS from query string. And then we'll go down here underneath where we have the query string. And actually let's just rename this here to query string like so, so that we know what we're actually working with. And then what we'll do is say let query equals QS dot parse. And we'll parse that 
uh, raw query string that we had from before. So we'll say qs.parse query string. And now this query that we're passing to matching request should be an object containing all of the query keys and values. So let's try this again. Our server should have automatically restarted. If we go back to our browser and hit refresh, we should now see that we have this object with A1, B2, and C3 instead of the raw query string that we had before. So that's how to parse query parameters and automatically pass them to our route definitions. The next thing that we're gonna wanna do is automatically parse any kind of request body that happens to be included with the requests. So if you happened to see how we handled this elsewhere, working with request bodies in Node.js when you're just using the basic HTTP package is really not the most pleasant thing to do. What we need to do essentially is wait for all of the individual chunks of the request body to come through. So, you know, this is especially relevant if we're doing something like uh, sending a file along with the request, then you'll receive multiple chunks. And once we've received all of those chunks, we're gonna need to basically parse that data, which is originally in the format of a string. We're gonna need to actually parse that into a JSON object, and that's when we'll actually want to pass that to our route definitions on request function, okay? So what this is gonna look like, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We're going to need to add two listener functions for our request object, and we can do that, if you recall, in reference.js by saying, here they are, request.onData and request.onEnd. So data is basically just every time we receive a new chunk, all right? So we'll just say request.onData, okay? And every time we receive a new chunk, what we're gonna wanna do is just add that on to all of the data that we've currently accumulated. And for that, we're just gonna need to create a new uh, request body. We'll call it request data here. All right, and the initial value for this will just be an empty string. And then every time we receive a new chunk, we'll just add that chunk onto this request data by saying request data plus equals chunk. And that's all we need to do there, so pretty straightforward. And then we'll have request.onEnd. And as we saw earlier, this is going to be called when we've finally received all of the data that was included with the request. So for this, we just need an empty callback function. Uh, well, empty meaning no arguments, that is. And here is where we're actually gonna wanna call the corresponding route handler, right? We're not gonna wanna call that until we've actually accumulated all of that data as we saw earlier inside this code here, right? We have our on end handler function here actually call handle request with the parsed request body. So, and that actually reminds me, we need to parse the request body once we've done this. So we'll say let body equals JSON dot parse. And we're gonna try parsing that JSON data that we've accumulated here, which is request data, okay? And we're gonna to wanna to surround this with a try catch block as well, just, just in case the request data isn't in valid JSON format. And if all goes well, then we'll have the complete request body. And, and at that point, what we're gonna to wanna to do is get the matching route and call the matching routes on request function. So let's just cut all of this stuff here. All right, we'll just uh, cut all of that out here. And we're gonna put that directly inside our request.onEnd callback, but after the try catch block, you'll see how we handle this in just a minute if uh, there's an error. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say try, and actually let's define this body variable outside of here first so that we can access it down here in our route handling logic. And once we parse the body, we're gonna want to catch any errors that might've occurred. In the case that an error occurs, we'll just say something like console.log and we'll say something like the request body was not valid JSON. And then we'll just kind of go on and body will be undefined in that case, which will be fine, all right? Since that's what a lot of other frameworks such as Express do, right? If there's no valid request body, then inside the request handlers, body is just going to be empty, right? It's gonna be undefined. So anyway, now that we have this try catch block, which tries to parse the request data, we can actually pass this body as another property to matching route.onRequest. So we can say body like so, 
And now inside our routes, we should be able to reference the body by saying request info dot body. So let's give this thing a try. And what we're actually going to do is change this to a post route. So we'll change the method here to post. And in order to test this now, we're going to need to use postman. So let's open that up over here. And what we should be able to do is send now a post request. Oops, let's just close that window there. Is send a post request to slash hello. And we're gonna add a request body here by selecting raw and JSON from the settings down here. And then we'll say, we'll just say something like A1, B2, and we'll do C3, all right? Pretty boring request body, but this should at least show us that things work. So let's click on send now. And sure enough, we should see our same response, hello from the cool server framework. And if we go back to our terminal now, we should see that sure enough, the request body was successfully parsed and passed to our hello. So again, the really nice thing about this is now that this logic is all inside our cool server framework, we don't have to worry about doing any of these things inside our routes, right? right? Look at how simple our hello route is. All we're doing is just logging out the request body and returning some kind of status code and message. And automatically we have access to both request info dot body and request info dot query, which contain the request body and the query parameters respectively. So our cool server framework is really coming along. And the next thing that we're going to look at is going to be pretty interesting. And that's going to be adding functionality to our cool server framework so that it will automatically parse URL parameters, right? So that we can do things like say slash hello slash ID and include, you know, one, two, three, for example, at this point in the URL. And in that case, we would have access to the value at this segment inside our hello routes on request functions. So that's the next thing that we're gonna be looking at here. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted our cool server server-side framework to actually pass the query parameters and the request body to all of the handlers for the routes that we define, the last thing that we're going to want to do here is allow ourselves to parse URL parameters automatically. So just as an example, if we wanted to define a route for, let's say, loading a specific user by ID, well, chances are the path would look something like slash users slash one, two, three, right? Or slash users slash two, three, four, where that number that comes after it, whatever it might be, is the user's ID that we wanna load data for. Now, in order for our server framework to function correctly with these URL parameters, what we're gonna to need to do is provide some sort of special syntax that we'll be able to use inside our route definitions to basically tell our server-side framework that that section of the URL, right? So if it's users slash ID, right? That this section of the URL could really have any value, right? It doesn't have to match anything specifically like the other portions of the URL do. All right, now in order to do this, you probably could use regular expressions, but in order to keep things a little bit more readable and uh, a little bit more fun to code out, what we're gonna do instead is use more of a code-based approach in order to split apart the path of these routes and handle these URL parameters correctly. So first of all, let's decide on the special syntax that we want for our URL parameters. And, you know, since many other frameworks use this colon thing, right? So colon ID, if you want this to be the ID portion of the URL. Since that's what most of these other frameworks are doing, that's what we'll do as well. Although, as you'll see, this could really be anything we want it to be, right? It could be, uh, you know, a little asterisk character. It could be parentheses around this name. It could really be anything we want. So in order to make this work, what we're gonna need to do is go into our server framework and take a look at this part here where we're finding the matching route based on the method and the path, right? Currently, all that we're doing is checking to see whether the method is equal and whether the path is exactly equal to the path of the request that we just received. And the second part here is what we're actually gonna have to change in order for this to work with URL parameters, right? 
So basically what we're gonna have to do is check to see whether the current route that we're looking at is a URL parameter route, right? We'll be able to tell whether that's the case or not by checking to see whether the path contains the colon character. And if it does, we're gonna need to take a different approach. Otherwise, we should be able to still use the same approach that we had here. So let's just add that second case here. We'll say if route.path.contains and we're just gonna to want to check to see whether that contains the colon character, all right? So if it does, we're gonna to need to implement some special logic here, which we'll do in a second. Otherwise, we'll be able to just have the logic that we had before. All right, and we'll be able to just compare the route path to the request path directly like we were doing. Cool, so if the route path does contain this colon character, then what we're gonna to need to do is basically split apart our URL, all right? So uh, let's say that we have slash users slash ID and just uh, to be thorough here, we'll say slash to do's. All right, so this would theoretically be the path for a route for, for loading all of a specific user's to do's in you know a to-do list application, let's say by the user's ID. So in this case, what we're gonna need to do is basically split apart the path into segments, right? So we'll need to say path.split uh, by the slash character, and that will split it into users, and then colon ID, and then to do's. All right, so once we have that path split apart into these strings, what we're gonna need to do is check to see whether any of those strings contain the colon character, right? And we'll already know that at least one of those strings does, since uh, we have this condition up here. So what we're gonna to need to do is find the strings that do contain that colon character and see what their matching value is in the path name. So in other words, if we've defined a URL, and here, let's go down to uh, a blank screen here. In other words, if we've defined a route with the URL of slash users slash ID slash to do's, and let's just make this even more fun by adding another one, we'll say slash to do ID, right? This would theoretically be the endpoint for, for loading a specific to do of a specific user. All right. So if that's the path that we've defined for our route and we receive a request on slash users slash one, two, three slash to do's slash ABC, right? If that's the to do ID, then what we would need to do is parse both the ID and the to do ID URL parameters and store that somehow, probably in a JavaScript object that would look something like this. We'd say ID one, two, three, and to do ID ABC. And once we'd done that, we could then pass this object to the routes handler. Where we would have access to the values of those URL parameters now, okay? So that's basically what we're gonna need to do here. And as we already saw, this is going to involve splitting up our routes path finding which segments have the colons in them and what the actual name of the URL parameter is, right? So ID or to do ID, and then finding the corresponding values in the actual request path name. So this is gonna be a little bit of complex logic. So don't worry too much if uh, you find the logic a little bit confusing, but what we're gonna do, first of all, as I said, we're gonna need to split apart the route path into multiple sections by the slash character. So we'll say something like let path segments equals route dot path dot. And then we're actually gonna want to remove the initial slash character from our routes. So we'll say dot slice one. All right, that will give us everything except for the first character. And then we'll say dot split by the slash character. Okay. So now that we have those path segments, what we're gonna need to do next is find out which of those path segments start with a colon character. All right, and all that this is going to involve is looping through our path segments. So we'll say for let segment of path segments. All right, and basically what we're gonna have here is an object that will add all of the URL parameter segments onto. So we'll say let URL params, and this is gonna start off as an empty object like so. And then for each segment, 
And the way that we do that in JavaScript is just by adding square brackets here and saying let index and segment of path segments dot entries. Okay. And once we've done that, we're going to check to see whether the segment starts with a colon character. So, so we'll say if segment dot starts with colon, then in that case, that is a URL parameter. And what we'll want to do is add this segment's name onto this object as a key, right? So if we're currently looking at the segment ID, we're going to want to add just this last part here as the key of the object, right? So we'll say ID like so, and we're going to want to find the corresponding value in the request path name and add that as the value. So, you know, if that happens to be one, two, three, we're going to want to add that to the object like that. So what this is going to look like is we're just going to say, if the segment starts with that, we'll say URL params. And in square brackets here, we're going to say segment dot slice one, right? We're removing the initial colon from the beginning because we just want the name that comes after it. And then we're going to set that equal to the corresponding segment in our actual path name. And first of all, we'll need to get the uh, path name segments up here, right? That, right. That's the actual path name from the request. All right. So we'll just call that request segments. So we'll say let request segments equals, and then we'll say path name dot slice one. Okay. To take off the slash, just like we did with our path segments. And then we'll say split slash. All right. All right. So these two lines are pretty much the same. All right. So now that we have the request segments, we're just going to say URL params equals request segments. And we're going to set that equal to the current index that we're on here, right? That's what we needed this index for in the first place. So we'll say request segments and that's going to be index. Cool. So once we've accumulated all of our URL parameters, uh, after this for loop, we're, we're going to need to return something. And that something is basically just going to be whether or not the route is equal or not. So first of all, we'll need to check the method by saying return route dot method is equal to method. So that's the same as we had before. And then what we're going to need to do is check to see whether all of the non URL parameter segments match between the uh, route definition and the current request. And actually it occurs to me that I did most of this stuff here in the wrong place. This all needs to go down here somewhere, right? Uh, once we've found the matching route, we'll just paste that right here for the time being and come back to it a little later. And then what we're going to need to do is basically check to see whether the path segments and the request segments are equal to each other. And that's going to be pretty straightforward. We're just going to define a Boolean variable here. We'll say let segments match and that will start off as true. And basically what we're going to do is if we find a segment that doesn't start with this colon here, so we'll say if not segment dot starts with colon, then what we're going to want to do is set segments match to whether or not the current path segment here is equal to the current request segment. So we'll say segments match equals segment is equal to request segments index. All right. So uh, we'll type out index there in the square brackets, and then we can simply return that as well. So we'll say return route dot method equals method and segments match. And as a matter of fact, if segments match is ever false, we're going to want it to stay that way. So we'll just say segments match and segment equals blah, blah, blah. All right. All right. So that'll make sure it stays false once it's been set to false. And that should be all we need to do. So now heading down here to where we actually are parsing the path and request segments. Remember that we moved that down here because this is the right place for it. All that we need to do now is now that we've calculated the URL parameters, we're going to pass that to the on request function on the matching route. And actually we were calling that up here. Let's just move this down beneath all of our logic that we just added there. And we're going to pass that as another property in this object that we're passing as an argument. So we'll say query body and URL params, and that should be all we need to do. So let's go into hello route now, and it's really no longer a hello route, but let's change this method to get 
and we'll set the path to users slash ID slash to do's slash to do ID. All right, just to test and make sure that everything works. And what we'll do here is log out request info dot URL params to see if that matches our expectations, right? What we're expecting is for this to be an object with the names of the URL parameters that we gave in our path definition and the values that correspond to those URL parameter segments that were actually in the request URL. So ID one, two, three, and uh, to do ID, and that would be, uh, I don't know, ABC or something like that. Okay, so that's what we're expecting. And hopefully this should work. So let's try running our code. Our server should be running. And we're going to send a get request to this by saying localhost 8080 slash users slash 123 slash to do's slash ABC and click send. And uh oh, it looks like we got an error. And that is because route.path.contains, that should be route.path.includes. I still make that mistake sometimes because I can never remember whether it's array.contain or array.includes. So let's go up to here and there we go, route.path.contains. And this should be includes. All right, so let's try this again. We're gonna send this request. And nope, it looks like we got another error. Uh, route is not defined. And and that's because when we define it down here, this should be matching route, all right? So matching route.path. All right, let's try this one more time and see if we get an error. Nope, it looks like everything worked. We get hello from the cool server framework. And sure enough, if we go back and take a look in our terminal, we'll see that we get the correct URL parameters object passed to our hello route handler. So feel free to give yourself a pat on the back here. It's it's definitely been a fun journey building this cool server framework and feel free to just play around with this framework that we've built so far and see if you can add different functionality to it, right? Right, see if you can add functionality for doing things like uploading files or for working with data other than JSON data. Okay, so I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.